Advanced Data Analytics is one of the hottest job profiles in the industry. Now, the potential of data analytics is tapping new possibilities and lucrative career opportunities in the current industry. The average salary of a data analyst in India ranges from 25 to 30 lakhs per annum based on experience. And in the United States of America, the salary of a data analyst can be as high as $250,000 per annum. Now, the current evaluation of data analytics technology is $31 billion and it is projected to rise all the way above $240 plus billion with an estimated CAGR growth of 41% by the year 2030. The fact through data analytics is one of the most promising careers in the current industry. Today, we present you the data analytics full course. We will begin the fundamentals of data analytics and walk you through the advanced data analytics and tools used in this process. We will be briefing you with a detailed introduction to data analytics that covers the sources of data, the tools involved and the procedures. Post that, we will dive deep into understanding the fundamental differences between data scientists, data engineers and data analysts, as they all have similar roles and responsibilities. And proceeding with the course, we will teach you the data analytics with Python and R. Next, we will learn the time series analytics with them and build data analytic projects on the same, which will help you put together all your learnings. Up ahead, we will get into big data analytics. Proceeding, we will walk you through data visualization tools like Power BI and Tableau and build data analytics and visualization projects on the same. These projects will serve you as the finest portfolios for your future interviews. Speaking of interviews, we have got you covered along with the most frequently asked data analytics interview questions to help you crack the toughest interviews. But before we begin, if you're an aspiring data analyst looking for online training and certifications from prestigious universities and in collaboration with leading experts, then search no more. Simply Learn's professional certificate program in data analytics from Purdue University in collaboration with IBM should be a right choice. For more details, use the course link in the description box below. And with that in mind, over to our training expert. I will run you through the top six data analytics job roles. So before I dive deep into the various job roles, let's quickly understand how important a career in data analytics is and what the future holds for professionals in this domain. Let's take a look at the growth of data. So back in the early 2000s, there was relatively less data generated, but with a rapid rise in technologies and with the increase in the number of various social media platforms and multinational companies across the globe, the generation of data has increased by leaps and bounds. Did you know that according to the IDC, the total volume of data is expected to reach 175 zettabytes in 2025? Now that's a lot of data. Let's take a look at how organizations leverage all of this data. As you know, there are zillions of companies across the world. These companies generate loads of data on a daily basis. When I say data here, it simply refers to business information, customer data, customer feedback, product innovations, sales reports and profit loss reports to name a few. Companies utilize all of this data in a wise way. They use all of this information to make crucial decisions that can either hamper or boost their businesses. You might have heard of the term data is the new oil. Well, it definitely is, but only if organizations analyze all the available data very well, then this oil is definitely valuable. And for that, we have data analytics. Organizations take the help of data analytics to convert the available raw data into meaningful insights. So what is data analytics? Technically, you can say it is a process wherein data is collected from various sources, then cleaned, which involves removing irrelevant information, and then finally transformed into some meaningful information that can be interpreted by humans. Various technologies, tools, and frameworks are used in the analysis process. As you might have heard of the term, data never sleeps. Well, it surely doesn't. Every millisecond, some or the other data is generated, and this is a constant process. This process is only going to increase in the near future with the advent of newer technologies. The data analytics domain holds paramount importance in every sector. Companies want to leverage on all the generated big data and boost their businesses. They need professionals who can play with data and convert them into crucial insights. Organizations are constantly on the lookout for such candidates and this opportunity will only increase as data is only going to grow every second. So if you want to start your career in this field or if you want to switch your job role into a role in the data analytics domain, then we have a set of job profiles that you can look at.
We will look into six job roles in the data analytics field and learn what each job role is all about, the responsibilities of a professional working in that particular role, the skills required to get that particular job, the average annual salary of a professional working in that role, and finally, the company's hiring for that role. So let's start off. First, we have the job role of a data analyst. A data analyst is a person who collects, processes, and performs statistical analysis of large data sets. Every business generates and collects data, be it marketing research, sales figures, logistics, or transportation costs. A data analyst will take this data and figure out a variety of measures, such as how to price new materials, how to reduce transportation costs, or how to deal with issues that cost the company money. They deal with data handling, data modeling, and reporting. Now, talking about their responsibilities, data analysts recognize and understand the organization's goal. They collaborate with different team members, such as programmers, business analysts, engineers, and data scientists to identify opportunities for solving business problems. Data analysts write complex SQL queries, scripts, and store procedures to gather and extract information from multiple databases. They filter and clean data using different modern tools and techniques and make it ready for analysis. They also perform data mining from primary and secondary data sources. Data analysts identify, analyze, and interpret trends in complex data sets. This is done using statistical tools such as R and SAS. Another key responsibility of a data analyst is to create summary reports and build various data visualizations for decision making and presenting it to the stakeholders. Next, let us discuss the important skills that you need to know to become a data analyst. Firstly, you should have a bachelor's degree in computer science or information technology. A master's degree in computer applications or statistics is also preferable. You must have a good understanding of programming languages like R, Python, JavaScript, and also understand SQL. In addition to that, it is beneficial if you have hands-on experience with statistical and data analytics tools such as SAS Miner, Microsoft Excel, and SSAS. Basic understanding of machine learning and its algorithms would be an advantage. Acquaint yourself with descriptive, predictive, prescriptive, and inferential statistics. Most importantly, you need to have a good working knowledge of various data visualization software along with presentation skills. This will help you pitch in your ideas and viewpoints to the clients and stakeholders better. Now, talking about their salaries, a data analyst earns nearly 5 lakhs 23,000 rupees per annum in India, while in the United States, they earn around $62,453 per annum. Let's now look at a few of the companies hiring data analysts. So as you can see, we have the American e-commerce giant Amazon, then we have Microsoft, the American online payment company PayPal, then we have Walmart, Bloomberg, and Capital One. So that was all about data analyst. The next job role is of a business analyst. Business analysts help guide businesses in improving products, services, and software through data-driven solutions. They are responsible for bridging the gap between IT and business using data analytics to evaluate processes, determine requirements, and deliver data-driven recommendations and reports to executives and stakeholders. Business analysts are responsible for creating new models that support business decisions and come up with initiatives and strategies to optimize costs. Now, let us look at the various responsibilities of a business analyst. Business analysts have a good understanding of the requirements for business. Their vital role is to work in accordance with relevant project stakeholders to understand their requirements and translate them into details which the developers can understand. They frequently interact with developers and come up with a plan to design the layout of a software application. They also run meetings with stakeholders and other authorities. They engage with business leaders and users to understand how data-driven changes to products, services, software, and hardware can improve efficiencies and add value. They ensure that the project is running smoothly as per the requirements and the design planned. 
through user acceptance and validation testing. They make sure all the features are being incorporated into the application. BAs rely on different software to write documentation and design visualization to explain all the findings. It is extremely critical for any BA to effectively document the findings where each requirement of the client is mentioned in detail. Now let us look at the skills required for a BA. A bachelor's degree in the field of science, engineering or statistics or any related domain will suffice. Knowledge of programming languages such as Python and Java is beneficial. You should be really good at writing complex SQL queries and you should also have knowledge of various business process models. Along with knowledge of programming languages, ideas about statistical analysis and predictive modeling is necessary. Decision-making, strong analytical and problem-solving skills are necessary to solve software and business issues. You also need to have excellent presentation and communication skills, both oral and written. Moving on to their salary, a business analyst is expected to earn around 7 lakh rupees per annum in India. In the US, they earn nearly $68,346 per annum. IQEA, Dell, Philips, Honeywell, the famous American messaging platform WhatsApp, the UK-based company Ernest & Young are few of the companies hiring for business analysts. Up next, we have the job role of a database administrator. A database administrator is a specialized computer systems administrator who maintains a successful database environment by directing or performing all related activities to keep the organization's data secure. They are responsible for storing, organizing, and retrieving data from several databases and data warehouses. Their top responsibility is to maintain data integrity. This means that database administrator will ensure that the data is secure from unauthorized access. Moving on to their responsibilities. A database administrator develops, designs, and maintains a database to ensure that the data in it is properly stored, organized, and managed well. They maintain data integrity by avoiding unauthorized access and they keep databases up to date. They run tests and modify the existing databases to ensure that they operate reliably. They also inform end users of changes in databases and train them to utilize systems. They need to cooperate with programmers, data analysts and the IT staffs to ensure smooth running and maintenance of databases. Database administrators are responsible for taking system backups in case of power outages and other disasters. So they should have an efficient disaster recovery plan. Now let's have a look at their skills. To become a database administrator, you should have a bachelor's degree in computer science or information technology. Knowledge of programming languages such as Python, Java and Scala is important. You need to carry at least 3 to 5 years of experience in data management. You need to have an understanding of different databases such as Oracle DB, MongoDB, MySQL Server and PostgreSQL. Also, they should have an idea about database design and writing SQL queries. Finally, you need to have a good understanding of operating systems such as Windows, Mac OS and Linux along with storage technologies. Talking about their salary, a database administrator in India can earn up to 4,97,000 rupees per annum. In the US, they earn around $78,000 per annum. Let's have a look at the companies hiring for database administrators. So as you see, here we have BookMyShow, Oracle, the American MNC Intel, Amazon, Robert Half, and the New York Times to name a few. Fourth in the list of job roles, we have data engineer. A data engineer is someone who is involved in preparing data for analytical and operational uses. A data engineer transforms data into useful format for analysis. They build and test scalable big data ecosystems for businesses. A data engineer is an intermediary between a data analyst and a data scientist. Now let's jump into their responsibilities. Data engineers develop, test and maintain architectures. They are responsible for managing, optimizing and monitoring data retrieval, storage and distribution throughout the organization. 
They discover opportunities for data acquisition, find trends in data sets, and develop algorithms to help make raw data more useful to the enterprise. Data engineers build large data warehouses using ETL for storing and retrieving data. They also recommend ways to improve data quality and efficiency along with building algorithms to help give easier access to raw data. Data engineers often work with big data and submit their reports to data scientists for analysis purpose. They need to recommend and sometimes implement ways to improve data reliability, efficiency and quality. Moving on to the skills of a data engineer. A data engineer should hold a bachelor's degree in computer science or information technology. They should have good hands-on experience with Python, R and Java. Also, data engineers should be well-versed with big data technologies such as Hadoop, Apache Spark, Scala, Cassandra, and MongoDB. Data warehousing and ETL experience are essential to this position along with in-depth knowledge of SQL and other database solutions. Basic knowledge of statistical analysis will be an advantage along with idea about operating systems. Here is what a data engineer can earn. So in India, a data engineer can earn up to 8 lakhs 85,000 rupees per annum, while they can earn around $103,000 a year in the USA. We have Capgemini, Shutterstock, the American provider of stock photography, Spotify, Accenture, Genpack, and Facebook hiring data engineers. The next exciting job role is of a data scientist. A data scientist is a professional who uses statistical methods, data analysis techniques, machine learning and related concepts in order to understand and analyze data to draw business conclusions. They make sense to messy and unstructured data and bring value out of it. They employ techniques and theories drawn from many fields within the context of mathematics, statistics, computer science and information science. A data scientist understands the challenges in business and comes up with the best solutions using modern tools and techniques to analyze, visualize, and build prediction models to make business decisions. Let us now look at their responsibilities in the industries. Data scientists clean, process, and manipulate data using several data analytics tools. They perform ad hoc data mining, collect large sets of structured and unstructured data from disparate sources. They design and evaluate advanced statistical models to work on big data. They also create automated anomaly detection systems and keep constant track of their performance. Data scientists interpret the analysis of big data to discover solutions and opportunities. A data scientist takes input from data analysts and engineers to formulate the results. They use visualization packages and tools to create reports and dashboards for relevant stakeholders. They also adopt new business models and approaches. Apart from this, they regularly build predictive models and machine learning algorithms. Now moving on to the skills of a data scientist. A bachelor's degree in computer science or information technology will be fine. But a master's degree in the field of data science will hold a major advantage. You also need to have a good experience in the analytics domain. You should be proficient in programming languages such as Python, Java and C++. Knowledge of Perl will also be an advantage. Familiarity with Apache Hive, Pig and Apache Spark is necessary along with the knowledge of Hadoop. In addition to knowing programming languages, you also need to know SQL, machine learning and deep learning. Data visualization and BI skills are necessary for creating reports and dashboards. You should also be able to communicate and present information and ideas properly. Now talking about their salary, a data scientist in India can expect an annual salary of 10 lakhs 47,000 rupees per year. Meanwhile, in the US, they can earn up to $113,000 per annum. That's a lot of money. From the many companies hiring for data scientists, here we have a few companies named. They are, yet again, Amazon, Citibank, Apple, Google, the Japanese electronic commerce and online retailing company Rakuten, and Facebook. And finally, we have machine learning engineer. 
Machine learning engineers are professionals who develop intelligent machines that can learn from vast amounts of data and apply knowledge without human intervention. They use different algorithms and statistical modeling to make sense of data. They design and develop machine learning and deep learning algorithms. Their main goal is to create self-running software. Let's have a look at the responsibilities of a machine learning engineer. Machine learning engineers research, design and develop machine learning systems. They use exceptional mathematical skills in order to perform faster computations and work with algorithms to create sophisticated models. They perform A-B testing and use data modeling to fine-tune the results. They use data modeling and evaluation strategy to find hidden patterns and predict unseen instances. Machine learning engineers work closely with data engineers to build data pipelines and interact with stakeholders to get a clarity on the requirements. Most importantly, they analyze complex data sets to verify data quality, perform model tests and experiments, choose to implement the right machine learning algorithm and select the right training data sets. Moving on to their skills. A machine learning engineer should have a degree in computer science and information technology. They should have an advanced degree in computer science or maths. In addition to this, they should also have experience in the same domain. They should be proficient in programming languages such as Python, R, C++ and Java. Knowledge of statistics, probability and linear algebra is necessary as all the machine learning algorithms have been derived from mathematics. Also, having an idea of signal processing would be beneficial. Machine learning engineers need to have a good understanding of data manipulation and machine learning libraries such as NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-learn, etc. They should have good oral and written communication skills. Let us now have a look at their salary structure. A machine learning engineer earns 8 lakh rupees per annum in India while in the US, they can earn around $114,000 a year. Now that's a whopping amount, isn't it? Let's have a look at the companies hiring machine learning engineers. So as you see, we have Amazon, Microsoft, Oracle, Salesforce, Rapido, and Accenture to name a few. That was all about the job role of a machine learning engineer. Now that we have seen the different job roles in the field of data analytics, let's also go ahead and see how an ideal resume of a data analyst should look like. Seen on your screens is a sample resume of a data analyst. You can grab some ideas from this and incorporate them in your resume. Nowadays, it's quite common to have a professional photograph of yours on the resume. You can go ahead and have that, then your name in bold, followed by your contact details like email ID and phone number. Then moving on, you would have to write a summary, briefly explain your current job role and what you're looking for in the future. Having a LinkedIn profile link works well these days. Employers can just go ahead and look at your profile and gauge you well. Make sure to have an active LinkedIn profile. In addition to LinkedIn profile, it's also good to have a GitHub profile link which can show your coding or other technical skills. If it's impressive enough, then a lot of times the rest of your resume is just secondary. As I mentioned, this is a resume of a data analyst. So as you can see in the summary here, we have just spoken about the basic responsibilities of a data analyst. Moving on to the experience part. You have to write the job title and below that you can mention the company and the tenure accordingly. Here, you would have to give a brief description of achievements in the organization, any relevant accomplishments related to the job you're applying for, the tools and the various technologies you have worked with. So in the sample, you can see we have spoken about data visualization using R and Tableau. Next, we have spoken about how the candidate has worked with other teams for a better business outcome. Most of the data analysts use SQL and Excel to handle data for reporting and database maintenance and we have mentioned that here as well. Do make sure that you always specify the tools you use. Then you can also mention if you have worked on improving data delivery. For example, here we have spoken about developing and optimizing SQL queries, data aggregations and ETL to improve data delivery. Finally, you can speak a bit about your reporting skills and if needed, elaborate on it. 
usually professionals would have worked in a similar domain before becoming a data analyst. Here, we have taken the role of a statistical assistant as the first job, since it's easier for a candidate with this job role to shift into the data analytics field. Nevertheless, y'all can still mention your prior experience here, be it in any domain. Under the responsibilities for this job role, we have given basics such as coding data prior to computer entry, compiling statistics from various reports, computing and analyzing data, and finally some visualization and reporting. Moving to the education, here you can mention the name of your degree and the university name. If you have a post-graduation, well and good, you can list both the degrees here. Also, if you have any certifications, you can mention them here under the education category. Now moving to the skills, depending on your skills and your choice, you can either shift this part to the beginning of the resume or have it here. As you see on your screens, this is just a different way of displaying your skill sets. You can have all the five stars colored if you are excellent in that particular tool or language. As you see, it's crystal clear as to what the candidate's strong areas are. You can have various categories like shown. For example, under software development, you can list the languages that you know and how proficient you are in those particular languages. It's clear that the candidate knows Python better than JavaScript here. So the employer gets a clear idea about the skills you possess and the depth of it. Similarly, you can mention the databases as well. The few mentioned here are more or less a requirement to become a data analyst. At least, SQL is a must. Not to forget, data visualization is also very important when it comes to the job role of a data analyst. Mention the tools you know here and similarly give yourself a rating out of 5. 5 stars shaded being the highest. Here we have mentioned Tableau and Excel which are more than sufficient to become a data analyst. Moving to the non-technical skills, you can mention the languages you know here. Here we have taken English and German. In addition to the languages, you can also feel free to mention the extracurricular activities that you are good at. So this is how an ideal resume of a data analyst should look like. You can alter it according to your achievements, skills and experience. In a world where there is data generation every millisecond, the role of a data analyst holds paramount importance. This video will help you understand what a data analyst does and the various skills required to back this position. Before understanding the job role of a data analyst, let's understand the meaning of the term data analytics. So what does the term analyze mean? It merely means to scrutinize something to derive meaningful conclusions from it. Well, data analytics also works similarly. It is the process by which useful insights are extracted from raw data by studying and examining it carefully. These insights can be related to business information, market trends, product innovations and profit loss report to name a few. Here's an interesting comparison. I'm sure all of you have played with jigsaw puzzles at some point in time. For that, first you would have to gather all the pieces together and then fit them accordingly to bring out a beautiful picture, isn't it? We can simply relate the process of data analytics to how you make a jigsaw puzzle. As you can see here, data refers to the raw data which can be structured, semi-structured or unstructured in nature. The process of data analytics incorporates collecting data from various sources, cleaning it and then finally transforming it into something meaningful, which can be interpreted by humans. This information can be visually presented in the form of graphs and charts which provide precise results of the analysis. Various technologies, tools and frameworks are used in the analysis process. Organizations take the help of data analytics to convert the available raw data into meaningful insights. Hence, there is a high requirement for professionals who can play with data and help organizations with crucial decision making. There are many job roles in the field of data analytics. If you have watched our previous video on data analytics career, you would have seen a few of these roles. Out of all the job roles, an important role is that of a data analyst. 
An interesting thing about this job role is that it can be taken up by freshers as well. It can embark on your career in the field of data analytics. It is a lucrative career as the field of data analytics is only going to continue to blossom in the years to come. So let's see who exactly a data analyst is. A data analyst is a person who collects, processes and performs analysis on large data sets. Here, the statistical analysis is done on various data sets. Every business generates and collects data, be it marketing research, sales figures, customer feedback, logistics or transportation costs. A data analyst will take all of this data and figure out various measures such as how to price new materials, how to reduce transportation costs, how to provide better customer experience, or how to deal with issues that cost the company money. Data analysts also deal with data handling, data modeling, and data reporting. A data analyst has a number of duties to perform. Let's have a look at their responsibilities now. First and foremost, a data analyst is required to recognize and understand the organization's goal. This helps in streamlining and planning the analysis process accordingly. Data analysts assess the available resources, understand the business problem and gather the right data. This step is done by collaborating with different team members such as programmers, business analysts and data scientists. Data analysts need to use queries to gather information from a database. They write complex SQL queries and scripts to gather and extract information from several databases and data warehouses. They are responsible for data mining as well. Here, data is mined from various sources and then organized in order to obtain a new information from it. This is a vital role of a data analyst, as they have to extract data from various sources in order to work on it. With this data, they can build models that can reduce the complexity and increase the efficiency of the whole system. Another crucial step in data analysis is data cleaning and data wrangling. Usually, the data you can collect is often messy and has a lot of missing values, so it's important to clean this data to make it ready for analysis. Data analysts use a number of statistical and analytical tools, including programming languages for performing analysis and logical examination of data. Using different libraries and packages, data analysts discover trends and patterns from complex data sets. This will help them find more unseen insights from the data to make business predictions. Another important role of a data analyst is to prepare summary reports for the leadership team so that they can make timely decisions. For this, data analysts use multiple data visualization tools. Some of these tools are discussed as part of skills required, which we will see later. Finally, data analysts interact with the development team, business and management team, as well as with data scientists to ensure proper implementation of business requirements and to figure out opportunities for better process improvement. Now let us look at the various skills required to become a data analyst. So the first skill is more of a prerequisite. You should hold a degree in any relevant field, be it engineering, computer science, information technology, electrical or mechanical engineering. You can also be a graduate in statistics or economics. Also, you should have domain knowledge in the field you are currently working in or the role you're applying for. The next important skill is that you should have good hands-on experience with programming languages such as R, Python and JavaScript. This would help you write programs to solve complex problems. Then, you should have a good experience working with databases and data analysis tools such as writing SQL queries and procedures, knowledge of Microsoft Excel, IBM SPSS and MATLAB to analyze trends, forecast data and plan to drive accurate insights. You must have a strong understanding of statistics and machine learning algorithms. These include concepts such as hypothesis testing, probability distributions, regression analysis, and various classification and clustering techniques. And finally, a data analyst should be able to create different reports with the help of charts and graphs using several data visualization tools such as Tableau and Power BI. They must have good presentation skills as well. This will help them convey their ideas to clients and stakeholders better. 
Now that we have looked at the various skills required to become a data analyst, let's now see the average annual salary that a data analyst earns. Here we can have a look at the salary ranges of both in US and in India. So a data analyst in the United States can earn a minimum salary of $43,000 to a maximum of $85,000 per year. In India, you can earn anywhere between 1,98,000 rupees to 9,24,000 rupees per annum. The data analyst role is in very high demand with companies looking for professionals who can handle their data effectively and efficiently. So let's look at the different companies hiring for the data analyst role. As you see, here we have the American e-commerce giant Amazon, the American multinational technology company Microsoft, Capital One, which is one of the largest banking companies in the US. Then we have the popular retail company Walmart. Then we have PayPal. Next, we have the internet and search engine giant Google, social media firms Facebook and Twitter, as well as Apple and Bloomberg. With that, let me now tell you how Simply Learn can help you learn data analytics and guide you to become a data analyst. So, in a new tab, I'll search for simplylearn.com. Then here on the search bar, I look for data analyst. Let me now click on the first link, which is data analyst. I'll open this in another tab. As you can see on your screens, this is the data analyst master's program and it is in collaboration with IBM. On the right hand side, you can see the different courses that will be covered as a part of the program. You will learn introduction to data analytics, business analytics with Excel, then you have Tableau followed by Power BI. Later on in the course, you will learn programming basics and data analytics with Python, then R programming. And finally, you will get to work on a capstone project. This is a kind of certificate you would receive after completing the course. It will have your name along with IBM and Simply Learn logo. These are some of the tools that will be covered in this program. You will learn Excel, then NumPy, Panda, SciPy, IBM Watson, Power BI, Tableau, Python, and R. The course advisor for this program is Ronald Van Loon. Below, you can see the entire course curriculum and the different courses that you will learn in this program. Also, there are a few electives that you can choose in this course. There's data science in real life, programming refresher, industry master class, data analytics, and there is SQL training as well. In today's digital world, data is being generated by companies and individuals every second. So the role of a data analyst holds supreme importance. So if you're looking for a career in data analytics, this video will help you learn what a data analyst does and the various skills you need to possess to become a data analyst in 2022. Before we get started, make sure you subscribe to the Simply Learn channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from us. Let's look at the agenda for this video. First, we will understand who a data analyst is. Then we will understand the top 10 data analyst skills for 2022. Moving on, we will look at the salary of a data analyst. And finally, we will look at the companies hiring data analysts. So now let's understand who is a data analyst. A data analyst is a professional who collects business data from various sources, interprets it, and uses various statistical tools and techniques to extract insights and useful information from it. They acquire data from primary or secondary data sources and maintain databases. They also recognize and understand the organization's goal and collaborate with different team members such as programmers, business analysts and data scientists to build an effective solution to a business problem. Now, with this basic understanding of who a data analyst is, let's learn the top 10 data analyst skills for 2022. At number 1, we have Structured Query Language or SQL. SQL is a top skill that every data analyst should have. Data analysts use SQL commands and functions to store, process, analyze, and manipulate structured data using relational and NoSQL databases. 
They also build data models and write complex SQL queries and scripts to gather and extract information from several databases and data warehouses. Some of the popular databases a data analyst should be familiar with are Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and IBM DB2. The second important skill for a data analyst is Microsoft Excel. Microsoft Excel is one of the most popular and oldest spreadsheet applications for creating reports, performing calculations, and analyzing data. Data analysts need to know how to handle tabular data in Excel, so they should be aware of features like sorting, filtering, conditional formatting, pivot tables, what-if analysis, and functions such as sumifs and countifs. The third crucial data analyst skill for 2022 is data cleaning and wrangling. Usually, the data collected by analysts from various heterogeneous sources is often messy and contains a lot of missing values. So, it is always crucial to clean the data and remove noise, missing or erroneous elements. It is also important to format data using tools and methods before using it for analysis. They are responsible for data mining as well. The data mined from various sources are organized in order to obtain new information from it. Some of the tools you need to know for data cleaning and wrangling are Excel Power Query and OpenRefine. The fourth skill on our list is Mathematics and Statistics. Data analysts often work on data for higher dimensions that are greater than 3. In order to interpret such data, they need to be good at linear algebra and calculus. They also build predictive models and statistical models such as linear regression, logistic regression, naive base, and k-means clustering. In order to understand the working of these algorithms, they must have knowledge about statistics and probability. Coming to the fifth important skill for a data analyst in 2022, we have programming. Data analysts need to master at least one programming language, preferably Python or R. In order to work with complex business problems, analysts need to write scripts and user-defined functions to automate tedious tasks. Python and R language provide a collection of different libraries and packages such as NumPy, Pandas, Dplyr, Matplotlib, ggplot, which data analysts can use to discover trends and patterns from complex data sets. After this, we have data visualization as our sixth skill. Another data analyst job role is to visualize large volumes of data and prepare summary reports and dashboards for the leadership team and clients so that they can make timely business decisions. To do this, data analysts use various data visualization tools such as Power BI, Tableau, and ClickView. Using these tools, data analysts can integrate various data sets, apply joint conditions, sort, and filter data, as well create different visualizations using charts and graphs. The seventh skill for a data analyst is industry knowledge. Data analysts should have good knowledge and understanding of the industry or domain they are working in. For example, if you're working in a healthcare domain, you need to know how healthcare analytics can be applied to improve patient care. You should have knowledge about the challenges faced in healthcare and how you can leverage data and analytics to solve the issues. Only if you have strong industry knowledge can you try to improve the business. The eighth skill that is important for a data analyst in 2022 is problem solving. A business deals with several problems on a daily basis. Data analysts should be ready to face those challenges. Data analysts are expected to use their problem-solving skills, work with the team, troubleshoot what went wrong, and provide an effective solution via data analysis. A data analyst with good problem-solving skills can help a business identify current and potential issues and determine a viable solution based on the data it collects. The ninth skill on our list is analytical thinking. Data analysts need analytical thinking ability to break down a complex problem into simple components and resolve these components one by one. It is a must-have skill for data analysts. Analytical thinking includes deciding the parameters that need to be considered for defining data sets, analyzing them from different perspectives, and determining variable dependencies. Coming to the 10th skill among the top 10 skills for a data analyst in 2022, we have communication. Data analysts don't just interact with computers and programs. 
They also interact with team members, stakeholders and data suppliers. So, good communication skills are essential. Data analysts also present their findings in front of an audience who might not be familiar with the analytical methods and processes. So, they need to clearly translate their findings and insights into non-technical terms. So, those were the top 10 skills a data analyst needs to possess in 2022. Do you think we missed out on any skills? Then please put your answers in the comment section below. Now, let's look at the salary of a data analyst. According to Glassdoor, the average annual salary for a data analyst in the United States is $69,517, while in India, you can earn nearly 7 lakh rupees per annum. Finally, let's look at the top companies that are hiring data analysts in 2022. Here, we have the consultancy and big four giant Deloitte and the pharmaceutical company Cerner Corporation. Then we have the tech giant IBM, retail company Walmart and the e-commerce leader Amazon. Before I start off with the top 10 data analysis tools, I'd like to talk a bit about data analysis. So have you ever wondered why data analysis is important? There are zillions of companies across the world. All these companies generate a lot of data. They literally work with this generated data. These companies depend on data to make crucial decisions which can impact their businesses. Data in its raw format has to be converted into meaningful information which can then be used by organizations. This is done by analyzing the generated data and for this we have data analysis. So what is data analysis? Data analysis is not just a single step but a set of processes. It is the process of collecting data then cleaning it. When I say cleaning, it simply means removing the irrelevant data. And then this data is transformed into meaningful information. We can simply relate this process to how you make a jigsaw puzzle. Just like how you gather all the pieces together and fit them accordingly to bring out a beautiful picture. Data analysis also works on almost the same grounds. To achieve the goals of data analysis, we use a number of data analysis tools. Companies rely on these tools to gather and transform their data into meaningful insights. So which tool should you choose to analyze your data? Which tool should you learn if you want to make a career in this field? We will answer that in this session. After extensive research, we have come up with these top 10 data analysis tools. Here, we will look at the features of each of these tools and the companies using them. So let's start off. At number 10, we have Microsoft Excel. All of us would have used Microsoft Excel at some point, right? It is easy to use and one of the best tools for data analysis. Developed by Microsoft, Excel is basically a spreadsheet program. Using Excel, you can create grids of numbers, text and formulae. It is one of the widely used tools, be it in a small or large setup. The interface of Microsoft Excel looks like this. Let's now move on to the features of Excel. Firstly, Excel works with almost every other piece of software in Office. We can easily add Excel spreadsheets to Word documents and PowerPoint presentations to create more visually appealing reports or presentations. The Windows version of Excel supports programming through Microsoft's Visual Basic for Applications, VBA. Programming with VBA allows spreadsheet manipulation that is difficult with standard spreadsheet techniques. In addition to this, the user can automate tasks such as formatting or data organization in VBA. One of the biggest benefits of Excel is its ability to organize large amounts of data into orderly logical spreadsheets and charts. By doing so, it's a lot easier to analyze data, especially while creating graphs and other visual data representations. The visualization can be generated from specified group of cells. Those were few of the features of Microsoft Excel. Let's now have a look at the companies using it. Most of the organizations today use Excel. Few of them that use it for analysis are the UK-based company Ernest & Young. Then we have Urban Pro, Wipro and Amazon. Moving on to our next data analysis tool, at number 9, we have RapidMiner. A data science software platform, RapidMiner provides an integrated environment for data preparation, 
analysis, machine learning and deep learning. It is used in almost every business and commercial sector. RapidMiner also supports all the steps of the machine learning process. Seen on your screens is the interface of RapidMiner. Moving on to the features of RapidMiner. Firstly, it offers the ability to drag and drop. It is very convenient to just drag drop some columns as you are exploring a data set and working on some analysis. RapidMiner allows the usage of any data and it also gives an opportunity to create models which are used as a basis for decision making and formulation of strategies. It has data exploration features such as graphs, descriptive statistics and visualization which allows users to get valuable insights. It also has more than 1,500 operators for every data transformation and analysis task. Let's now have a look at the companies using RapidMiner. We have the Caribbean airline Leeward Islands Air Transport. Next, we have the United Health Group, the American online payment company PayPal, and the Austrian telecom company Mobilecom. So that was all about RapidMiner. Now let's see which tool we have at number 8. We have Talent at number 8. Talent is an open source software platform which offers data integration and management. It specializes in big data integration. Talent is available both in open source and premium versions. It is one of the best tools for cloud computing and big data integration. The interface of Talent is as seen on your screens. Moving on to the features of Talent. Firstly, automation is one of the great boons Talent offers. It even maintains the tasks for the users. This helps with quick deployment and development. It also offers open source tools. Talent lets you download these tools for free. The development costs reduce significantly as the processes gradually speed up. Talent provides a unified platform. It allows you to integrate with many databases, SaaS and other technologies. With the help of the data integration platform, you can build flat files, relational databases and cloud apps 10 times faster. Those were the features of Talon. The companies using Talon are Air France, L'Oreal, Capgemini, and the American multinational pizza restaurant chain Domino's. Next on the list at 7, we have Nime. Constance Information Miner on Nime is a free and open source data analytics, reporting, and integration platform. It can integrate various components for machine learning and data mining through its modular data pipelining concept. NIME has been used in pharmaceutical research and other areas like CRM customer data analysis, business intelligence, text mining and financial data analysis. Here is how the interface of NIME application looks like. Now coming to the NIME features. Nine provides an interactive graphical user interface to create visual workflows using the drag and drop feature. Use of JDBC allows assembly of nodes blending different data sources, including pre-processing such as ETL, that is extraction transformation loading, for modeling, data analysis, and visualization with minimal programming. It supports multi-threaded in-memory data processing. Nine allows users to visually create data flows, selectively execute some or all analysis steps, and later inspect the results, models, and interactive views. Nine Server automates workflow execution and supports team-based collaboration. Nine integrates various other open source projects such as machine learning algorithms from Becca, H2O, Keras, Spark, and our project. Nine allows analysis of 300 million custom addresses, 20 million cell images, and 10 million molecular structures. Some of the companies hiring for Nime are United Health Group, ASML, Fractal Analytics, Atos, and Lego Group. Let's now move on to the next tool. We have SaaS at number 6. SaaS facilitates analysis, reporting, and predictive modeling with the help of powerful visualizations and dashboards. In SaaS, data is extracted and categorized which helps in identifying and analyzing data patterns. As you can see on your screens, this is how the interface looks like. Moving on to the features of SaaS. 
Using SAS, better analysis of data is achieved by using automatic code generation and SAS SQL. SAS allows you to access through Microsoft Office by letting you create reports using it and by distributing them through it. SAS helps with an easy understanding of complex data and allows you to create interactive dashboards and reports. Let's now have a look at the companies using SAS. We have companies like Genpact, IQVIA, Accenture, and IBM to name a few. That was all about SAS. So for all those who joined in late, let me just quickly repeat our list. At number 10, we have Microsoft Excel. Then at number 9, we have RapidMiner. At number 8, we have Talent. At number 7, we have 9. And at number 6, we have SAS. So far, do you all agree with this list? Let us know in the comment section below. Let's now move on to the next five tools in our list. So at number five, we have both R and Python. Yes, we have two of them in the fifth position. R is a programming language which is used for analysis as well. It has traditionally been used in academics and research. Python is a high-level programming language which has a Python data analysis library. It is used for everything starting from importing data from Excel spreadsheets to processing them for analysis. This is the interface of R. Next up is the interface of the Python Jupyter Notebook. Let's now move on to the features of both R and Python. When it comes to the availability of R and Python, it is very easy. Both R and Python are completely free, hence it can be used without any license. R used to compute everything in memory and hence the computations were limited, but now it has changed. Both R and Python have options for parallel computations and good data handling capabilities. As mentioned earlier, as both R and Python are open in nature, all the latest features are available without any delay. Moving on to the companies using R, we have Uber, Google, Facebook, to name a few. Python is used by many companies. Again, to name a few, we have Amazon, Google, and the American photo and video sharing social networking service, Instagram. That was all about R and Python. At number four, we have Apache Spark. Apache Spark is an open source engine developed specifically for handling large-scale data processing and analytics. Spark offers the ability to access data in a variety of sources including Hadoop Distributed File System HDFS, OpenStack Swift, Amazon S3 and Cassandra. It allows you to store and process data in real-time across various clusters of computers using simple programming constructs. Apache Spark is designed to accelerate analytics on Hadoop while providing a complete suite of complementary tools that include a fully featured machine learning library, a graph processing engine, and stream processing. So this is how the interface of Apache Spark looks like. Now let's look at the important features of Apache Spark. Spark stores data in the RAM, hence it can access the data quickly and accelerate the speed of analytics. Spark helps to run an application in a Hadoop cluster up to 100 times faster in memory and 10 times faster when running on disk. It supports multiple languages and allows the developers to write applications in Java, Scala, R or Python. Spark comes up with 80 high-level operators for interactive querying. Spark code for batch processing, join stream against historical data or run ad hoc queries on stream state. Analytics can be performed better as Spark has a rich set of SQL queries, machine learning algorithms, complex analytics, etc. Apache Spark provides fault tolerance through Spark RDD. Spark resilient distributed data sets are designed to handle the failure of any worker node in the cluster. Thus, it ensures that the loss of data reduces to zero. Conviva, Netflix, IQVIA, Lockheed Martin, and eBay are some of the companies that use Apache Spark on a daily basis. At number three, we have another important growing data analysis tool that is ClickView. 
ClickView software is a product of Click for business intelligence and data visualization. ClickView is a business discovery platform that provides self-service BI for all business users and organizations. With ClickView, you can analyze data and use your data discoveries to support decision making. ClickView is a leading business intelligence and analytics platform in Gartner Magic Quadrant. On the screen, you can see how the interface of ClickView looks like. Now talking about its features. ClickView provides interactive guided analytics with in-memory storage technology. During the process of data discovery and interpretation of collected data, the ClickView software helps the user by suggesting possible interpretations. ClickView uses a new patent in-memory architecture for data storage. All the data from the different sources is loaded in the RAM of the system and it is ready to be retrieved from there. It has the capability of efficient social and mobile data discovery. Social data discovery offers to share individual data insights within groups or out of it. A user can add annotations as an addition to someone else's insights on a particular data report. ClickView supports mobile data discovery within an HTML5 enabled touch feature which lets the user search the data and conduct data discovery interactively and explore other server-based applications. ClickView performs OLAP and ETL features to perform analytical operations, extract data from multiple sources, transform it for usage and load it to a data warehouse. The companies that can help you start your career in ClickView are Mercedes-Benz, Capgemini, Citibank, Cognizant and Accenture to name a few. At number 2, we have Power BI. Power BI is a business analytics solution that lets you visualize your data and share insights across your organization or embed them in your app or website. It can connect to hundreds of data sources and bring your data to life with live dashboards and reports. Power BI is the collective name for a combination of cloud-based apps and services that help organizations collate, manage and analyze data from a variety of sources through a user-friendly interface. Power BI is built on the foundation of Microsoft Excel and has several components such as Windows Desktop application called Power BI Desktop and online software as a service called Power BI Service, mobile Power BI apps available on Windows phones and tablets, as well as for iOS and Android devices. Here is how the Power BI interface looks like. As you can see, there is a visually interactive sales report with different charts and graphs. Moving on to the features of Power BI, it has an easy drag and drop functionality with features that make data visually appealing. You can create reports without having the knowledge of any programming language. Power BI helps users see not only what's happened in the past and what's happening in the present, but also what might happen in the future. It offers a wide range of detailed and attractive visualizations to create reports and dashboards. You can select several charts and graphs from the visualization pane. Power BI has machine learning capabilities with which it can spot patterns in data and use those patterns to make informed predictions and run what-if scenarios. Power BI supports multiple data sources such as Excel, Tech CSV, Oracle, SQL Server PDF and XML files. The platform integrates with other popular business management tools like SharePoint, Office 365 and Dynamics 365 as well as other non-Microsoft products like Spark, Hadoop, Google Analytics, SAP, Salesforce and MailChimp. Some of the companies using Power BI are Adobe, AXA, Carlsberg, Capgemini and Nestle. Moving on to the next tool. So any guesses as to what we have at number one? You can comment in the chat section below. Finally, on the top of the pyramid, we have Tableau. Gartner's Magic Quadrant of 2020 classified Tableau as a leader in business intelligence and data analysis. Tableau Interactive Data Visualization Software Company was founded in Jan 2003 in Mountain View, California. Tableau is a data visualization software that is used for data science and business intelligence. 
it can create a wide range of different visualization to interactively present the data and showcase insights. The important products of Tableau are Tableau Desktop, Tableau Public, Tableau Server, Tableau Online, and Tableau Reader. This is how the interface of Tableau Desktop looks like. Now, coming to the features of Tableau. Data analysis is very fast with Tableau and the visualizations created are in the form of dashboards and worksheets. Tableau delivers interactive dashboards that support insights on the fly. It can translate queries to visualizations and import all ranges and sizes of data. Writing simple SQL queries can help join multiple data sets and then build reports out of it. You can create transparent filters, parameters, and highlighters. Tableau allows you to ask questions, spot trends, and identify opportunities. With the help of Tableau Online, you can connect with cloud databases, Amazon Redshift, and Google BigQuery. The companies using Tableau are Deloitte, Adobe, Cisco, LinkedIn, and the American e-commerce giant Amazon, to name a few. And there you go. Those are the top 10 data analysis tools. Let's now have a question and answer session. Please feel free to post your queries in the comment section and we'll respond in the chat. Before the question and answer session, let's recap quickly. In the meanwhile, y'all can post your questions in the comment section below. So at number 10, we have Microsoft Excel. Then at number 9, we have RapidMiner. At number 8, we have Talent. At number 7, we have Nine. At number 6, we have SAS. R and Python at number 5. Apache Spark at number 4. Click View at number 3. Power BI at number 2. And finally, we have Tableau topping the list at number 1. We'll understand the differences between a business analyst and a data analyst in terms of their job description, the responsibilities for each of these roles, and the various skills they possess. You will get an idea about the salary structure of a business analyst and that of a data analyst, and we will also look at the companies hiring for these roles. Finally, towards the end of this video, I'll tell you how Simply Learn can help you with your career as a business analyst and as a data analyst. First, let's understand the job description of a business analyst. Business analyst is a professional who bridges the gap between the IT and the business teams in an organization. They use data analytics and modern technologies to assess processes and deliver data-driven solutions. They understand and solve a business problem and validate business requirements. A business analyst generates reports for executives and stakeholders. They are part of the business operation and work closely with the technology team to improve the quality of the services being delivered. They also assist in the integration and testing of new solutions. Now let's talk about the job description of a data analyst. With the rapid increase in data generation today, the term data analyst has found its prominence. A data analyst collects, processes and performs analysis of large data sets. Every business generates data in several formats. This data can be in the form of customer information and feedback, log files, transaction data, marketing research, and so on. It is the duty of a data analyst to transform these business data into valuable insights. Some of the problems that can be addressed are how to improve a business, how to provide good customer experience, what would be the ideal price for a new product, how to reduce transportation costs, and so on. Data analysts deal with data handling, data modeling, and reporting. With this brief understanding of the job description for a business analyst and a data analyst, let's now shift our focus towards the various responsibilities of a business analyst. A business analyst identifies the business goals, understands the problems faced by an organization, and comes up with a cost-effective solution to tackle the issues. They thoroughly understand the requirements from the clients and assign the right resources. BAs communicate and work closely with the development team to design the solution for a problem. They ensure that the development team doesn't spend their time understanding the stakeholders' requirements and often give iterative feedback on the solution being developed. They check and validate if the project is running fine with the help of user acceptance testing. 
They also verify if the solution being worked on is in line with the requirements and ensure that the final product satisfies the user expectations. BAs assess the functional and non-functional requirements. A business analyst documents the project findings and results. They present the project conclusions to the stakeholders and clients along with delivering maintenance reports and building visualizations to make decisions. Now, let's take a look at the responsibilities of a data analyst. First and foremost, a data analyst must identify and understand the organization's goal and requirements. This helps to plan and streamline the analysis process. Data analysts collect data from various heterogeneous sources. They assess the available resources, comprehend the business problem, and gather the right data for analysis. They work closely with different team members like programmers, business analysts, and data scientists. Data filtering and data wrangling are vital jobs of a data analyst. The data collected is often noisy and it contains missing values. Hence, it is crucial to clean the collected data and remove invalid values to make it ready for analysis. They use a variety of analytical, statistical and business intelligence tools to spot trends and patterns in complex data sets, discover hidden insights and prepare summary reports for the leadership team. They also use programming languages for data mining and data manipulation. Now it's time for us to understand the difference between a business analyst and a data analyst based on the skill set they possess. First, let's look at the skills that can help you become a BA. A business analyst should have a graduation degree in any relevant field such as business, accounting, information systems, human resources or engineering. You can apply for entry-level business analyst positions or with professional experience. Excel is a powerful analytics and reporting tool for working with data. BAs use Excel to perform various calculations, data analysis, plan an editorial calendar, and calculate customer discounts to derive meaningful insights and take decisions. BAs use SQL to retrieve, manipulate, and analyze data stored in relational databases. Critical thinking skills are important to understand customers' business needs. It allows them to distinguish between requirements that add value to the business and those that should be given a lower priority. BAs should find different ways to address each challenge. Data visualization is a key skill for BAs to build interactive dashboards and reports to convey the outcomes of a project. Knowledge of Tableau, Power BI and ClickView is required to make different types of reports depending on the business requirements. Business analysts should have a good hands-on programming experience to solve complex tasks and perform faster analysis of data. Hence, knowledge of programming languages such as R and Python is a prerequisite. Finally, they should have good presentation skills. They should also be confident about their findings and conclusions and communicate it in front of the stakeholders and clients. Let's now understand the skills that a data analyst should possess. You must have a bachelor's degree in any relevant field or be a graduate in statistics, economics or science. You're eligible to become a data analyst being a fresher or as an experienced professional. You should have domain knowledge in the field you are working in. Once again, knowledge of Excel is another basic requirement for a data analyst. Data analysts often work with structured data, so they should be proficient in writing SQL queries using data manipulation and data definition commands. They should know how to create stored procedures. Another crucial skill for a data analyst is to have hands-on experience with programming languages such as Python, R, SAS, and JavaScript. You can analyze and visualize large data sets and create predictive models for making business decisions. Data analysts create data visualizations using libraries such as Matplotlib, Seaborn, ggplot, and Plotly. This helps them to perform exploratory data analysis. Knowledge of Tableau and Power BI is required to create different business reports with the help of graphs and charts. Data analysts should have knowledge of machine learning algorithms to build sophisticated models and make future predictions. So they should know about linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, k-mean clustering, and other supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms. Finally, data analysts should also possess good communication and presentation skills. Now, let's discuss the salary structure for both of these job roles. According to Payscale, a business analyst in the United States earns an average salary of $69,000, while in India, you can earn nearly 6 lakh rupees per annum. Now, talking about the salary of a data analyst, according to Payscale, in the US, a data analyst earns an average salary of $60,710 per annum. 
and in India, you can earn around 4 lakhs 24,000 rupees per annum. Let's now move on and look at the different companies hiring for business analyst roles. Here we have Oracle, the search engine giant Google, the American MNC Cognizant, and e commerce company Amazon. In addition to that, we have Ernest & Young, technology giant IBM, Dell, and Cisco hiring business analysts. Talking about the companies hiring for data analysts, we have Twitter, Google, the social media leader Facebook, and Amazon. We also have the American oil company Shell, the electric vehicle company Tesla, Apple, and the American credit reporting agency Equifax. Now, choosing the right field, that is, to become a business analyst or a data analyst, could be a challenging task. The key points that you have to keep in mind before making a decision is First, review your background and see what qualifications you have. Check what skills you possess and the domain knowledge you have. Then, gauge your interest to see what suits you best. And finally, consider your long-term goals and see the job roles that will help you grow in your career in the long run. Now, let me tell you how Simply Learn can help you grow your career as a business analyst and a data analyst. Simply Learn offers a postgraduate program in business analysis that is in collaboration with Purdue University. The endorsed education provider is IIBA. Some of the skills that will be covered in this course are strategy analysis, wireframing, solution evaluation, dashboarding, data visualization, agile scrum methodology, scrum artifacts, statistical analysis using Excel and SQL database. Some of the tools covered in this course are Microsoft Excel, Tableau, Power BI, Jira, PostgreSQL, Planbox, and others. Some of the key features of this business analysis program are you will receive Purdue Postgraduate Program Certification, master classes from Purdue faculty, you can enroll in Simply Learn's Job Assist where you will get IM Jobs Pro membership for six months and obtain 35 IIBA PD CDUs and 25 PMI PDUs. You will get 170 plus hours of blended learning along with capstone projects in three domains. To become a data analyst, you can enroll in the postgraduate program in data analytics offered by Simply Learn. This program is in collaboration with Purdue University and IBM. The skills that will be covered as a part of the course are statistical analysis using Excel, data analysis in Python and R, data visualization using Tableau and Power BI, linear and logistic regression modules, clustering using k-means, supervised learning, and others. The tools that you will learn are NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Excel, and others. Some of the key features of this course are, you will get Purdue Postgraduate Program Certification, industry-recognized IBM certificates, enrollment in Simply Learn's Job Assist and Master Classes from Purdue faculty. You have 180 plus hours of blended learning, 14 plus hands-on projects on integrated labs and capstone projects in three domains. So please go ahead and enroll for these programs if you want to grow your career as a business analyst or a data analyst. Data analyst versus data engineer versus data scientist. Which one to choose? This is one of the most popular questions asked by learners looking for a career in data and analytics. I'm sure you too would have come across these job roles in the ever-growing data science landscape. Though they all deal with data, these jobs are not the same. There are significant differences between what a data analyst, data engineer and a data scientist does. We will look at these job roles and the differences in detail. First, let's look at some data analytics and data science trends. The analytics and data science market is thriving. Data analytics, data engineering and data science are the key trends in today's accelerating market. As per Statista.com, the global big data analytics market revenue will grow at a CAGR of 30% with revenue reaching over 68 billion US dollars by 2025. According to Technavio, the enterprise data management market is expected to increase by 64.08 billion US dollars by 2025. As per marketsandmarkets.com, the big data market size is projected to grow from 162.6 billion US dollars in 2021 to 273.4 billion US dollars in 2026. Now another report from Research Drive says that the data science platform market is estimated to reach 
224.3 billion US dollars by 2026. So with so much data available and companies making huge investments to drive business insights, the job opportunities for data analysts, data engineers and data scientists are going to increase in 2022 and over the coming years. Now, let's learn the major differences between data analyst versus data engineer versus data scientist. So, who are they? A data analyst analyzes and interprets vast volumes of data in order to extract meaningful information out of it. They find solutions to a business problem and make critical business decisions. The insights provided by data analysts are important to companies that want to understand the needs of their end customers. Now, talking about who a data engineer is, a data engineer, on the other hand, builds infrastructure and scalable pipelines to manage the flow of data and prepare it for analysis. So basically, they optimize the systems that enable data analysts and data scientists to perform their job efficiently. Data scientists are professionals who analyze and visualize existing data and use algorithms to build predictive models for making future decisions. They also engage with business leaders to understand their needs and present complex findings. With that, let's look at the primary roles and responsibilities of these three job roles. Data analysts are responsible to collect, clean, store and process data. They discover hidden patterns from data by performing exploratory data analysis and visualize data by creating charts and graphs. Acquiring data from primary and secondary sources is one of their key tasks. They build reports and dashboards and also maintain databases. Now talking about the roles and responsibilities of a data engineer. A data engineer performs data acquisition. They design, build and test data as well to develop and maintain data architecture. Data engineers are tasked with testing, integrating, managing and optimizing data from a variety of sources. So they integrate data into existing data pipelines, prepare data for modeling and perform various ETL operations. Now talking about the roles and responsibilities of a data scientist. So data scientists develop machine learning models to identify trends in data for making decisions. They develop hypotheses and use the knowledge of statistics, data visualization and machine learning to forecast the future for the business. Data scientists visualize data and use storytelling techniques and also write programs to automate data collection and processing. Now move on to the skills possessed by data analysts, data engineers and data scientists. To become a data analyst, you need to have good hands-on experience with writing SQL queries. You should have excellent Microsoft Excel skills for analyzing data. Data analysts are also good at programming and they need to know how to visualize data, solve business problems and possess domain knowledge. Data engineers should have a solid understanding of SQL, MongoDB and programming. They need to have a good command of data architecture, scripting, data warehousing and ETL. Data engineers are also good at Hadoop based analytics. Now talking about the skills for a data scientist. So a data scientist should have experience with programming in Python and R. They should have a very good understanding of mathematics and statistics as well. Data scientists need to possess analytical thinking and data visualization skills as well. Machine learning, deep learning and decision making are other critical skills every data scientist should have. Now we look at the salaries of a data scientist, a data analyst as well as a data engineer. So a data analyst in the United States earns over $70,000 per annum, while in India, a data analyst can earn nearly 7,25,000 rupees per annum. A data engineer in the United States can earn over $112,500 per year, and in India, you can earn over 9 lakh rupees per annum. Now talking about the salary of a data scientist, a data scientist in the United States earns over $117,000 per annum and in India, a data scientist can earn over 11 lakh rupees per annum. 
Now coming to the final section of this video, we'll look at the top companies hiring for data analysts, data engineers and data scientists. So we have the first company as Google, then we have Tesla, next we have the e-commerce giant Amazon, the internet giant Facebook or the social media giant Facebook, we have the tech giant Oracle, we also have Verizon and Airbnb. So these are some of the top companies that hire for the three roles. What is data analytics? Data analytics is a process of exploring and analyzing large data sets to make predictions and help data-driven decision making. Now, the definition of large data sets keeps changing, and so this can range really from just about anything to anything. Um, but usually in today's world, we're talking significantly larger amounts of data that you can't just glance at and try to figure it out yourself. And the two steps are analyze the data and then make decisions based on the data. Applications of data analytics. Now, the sky's the limit on this. In today's world, almost every business act of life, your music on your Spotify, are driven by data analytics. But some of the big players, when you go in there job hunting, are going to be your fraud analysis. Uh, if you want to go make a lot of money and you're good at it and you like dealing with numbers, uh, go join the banks and track down the criminals who are stealing money. It's a lot of, you know, it's a big thing to, to protect uh, credit cards, protect uh, sales purchases, bad checks, any of those things when you can track them down is huge. Healthcare, exploding. Uh, there is everything from trying to find cures for uh, the COVID virus or any of the viruses out there uh, using your cell phone to diagnose different ailments. Uh, that way you don't have to go in and see the doctor. You can actually just go in there and take a picture of the funky growth on your arm. Hopefully it's not too big. <laughs> and then they send it in there and the data analyst goes in there and looks at it and says, oh, this is what this is. This is a professional you need to go see or don't need to see. And that's just one aspect of healthcare. Uh, the databases uh, being generated by healthcare and getting the right doctors and helping the doctors analyze whether something is uh, benign or malignant, if it's cancerous. All those things are now part of the ongoing healthcare growth in data analytics. Inventory management. Think one of those huge warehouses where they're shipping out all the goods. How do you inventory that in such a way so that uh, you maximize the stuff that's being purchased the most near the entrance and all the other stuff towards the back or even pre-ship it? Uh, so it's huge to be able to inventory the manager inventory and pretty soon they'll just have a drone come in there and start picking up some of those boxes and move them around also. Delivery logistics. Again, this goes from uh, getting from point A to point B. Uh, you can combine it with our inventory, so you pre-ship stuff if you know a certain area is more likely to purchase it. How do you get it, the delivery to the most destinations the quickest in the short amount of time? And then they even pre-stack the trucks going out, and that's all done with data analytics. How do we stack all that stuff so it comes out in the right order? Targeted marketing, huge industry. Any kind of marketing, whether you're generating uh, the right content for the marketing, who are you targeting with that marketing, researching the people, what they want, so you know what products to market out there, all those things are huge. And these are just a few examples. You can probably go way beyond this from tracking forest fires to astrology and studying the stars. All of this is part of data analytics now and plays a huge role in all these different areas. Uh, city planning is another one. You know, you can see a nice organized city like this one where you can get in and out of the neighborhoods if you're a fire truck. <laughs> uh, police officers need to be able to get in and out. You want your tourists to be able to come in, yet you still want the place to look nice and you have the right commercial development, the right industrial development, light enough residents for people to stay. All those things are part of your city planning again huge in data analytics. So sky's the limit on what you use it for. Let's take a look at types of data analytics. And this can be broken up in so many ways, uh, but we're going to start with looking at the most basic questions that you're going to be asking in data analytics. And the first one is you want descriptive analytics. What has happened? Hindsight. Uh, how many cells per call ratio coming out of the call center? If we have uh, 500 tourists in a forest and you have a certain temperature, how many fires were started? How many times did the police have to show up to certain houses? Um, all that's descriptive. The next one is predictive. Predictive analytics is what will happen next. We want to predict. 
Uh, this is great if you have an ice cream store and you want to predict how many people to work at the ice cream store on a certain day based on the temperature coming up in the time of the year. And then one of the biggest growing and most important parts of the industry is now prescriptive analytics. And you can think of that as uh, combining the first two. We have descriptive and we have predictive. And then you get prescriptive analytics. How can we make it happen? Foresight. What can we change to make this work better? In all the industries we looked at before, we can start asking questions, uh, especially in city development. There's a good one. If we want to have our city generate more income, and we want that income to be commercial-based, uh, what kind of commercial buildings do we need to build in that area that are going to bring people over? Do we need huge warehouse sales, Costco sales buildings? Or do we need little mom pod joints that are going to bring in uh, people from the country to come shop there? Or do you want an industrial setup? What do you need to bring that in industry in there? Is there a car industry available in that area? Uh, if it's not a car industry, what other industries are in that area? All those things are prescriptive. We're guessing. We're guessing what can we do to fix it? What can we do to fix crime in area with education? What kind of education are we going to use to help people understand what's going on so that we lower the rate of crime and we help our communities grow better? That's all prescriptive. It's all guessing. We want foresight into how can we make it happen? How can we make this better? And we really can't not go into enough detail on these three because a lot of people stumble on this when they come in and are doing analytics, whether you're the manager shareholder or the uh, data scientist coming in, you really need to understand the descriptive analytics where you're studying the total units of furniture sold and the profit that was made in the past. Uh, here we go into predictive analytics, predicting the total units that would sell and the profit we can expect in the future, gear up for how many employees we need, how much money we're going to make, and prescriptive analytics, finding ways to improve the sales and the profit so we can uh, sell maybe a different kind of furniture. Uh, we're going to guess at what the area is looking for and how that marketing is going to change. Data analytics process steps. So let's take a look at some of the basic processing and what that looks like when you're working with this data. So there's five basic steps. Uh, the five steps of processing, and, and this changes, and then there's a lot of things that go on when they talk about um, agile programming. The whole concept of agile is you take some kind of framework like this, and then you build on it, depending on what your business needs. So the first step is data collection. And usually with a large company, you might have somebody who uh, is responsible for the database management. Uh, you might have another one where they're pulling APIs and they're pulling data off of uh, maybe the Census Bureau, uh, maybe something very, very um, specific, uh, domain specific. So if you're analyzing cancerous growths and how to understand them, then the data collection is going to be those measurements they take from the MRI. Or it might be even the MRI images. They've used those also. Uh, so there's a lot of things with data collection and how to control that and make sure it has uh, what you need and is clean and you don't have misinformation coming in. Uh, once you have the data collected, there's a data preparation. Uh, so stage two is we take that data and we format it into something we can use. Probably one of the biggest formats that you see is when you're processing text. How do you process text? Well, you use what they call a uh, one-hot encoder, and each word re is represented uh, by a, a yes-no kind of setup. So it'd be like a long array of bits. Um, that's one way to prepare it. And so, you know, bit number one is the. Bit number two is has, or whatever it is. Other preparations might be if you're using neural networks, you might be um, taking integers or uh, float numbers and converting them to a value between 0 and 1. That way you don't have one of them creating a bias in there. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that go into data preparation. That is 80% of data science. So when we talk about the data analytics, which is a little bit more on the math side, and they usually say, talk about a data scientist kind of being the overall preparer of this stuff, you're going to spend 80% of your data preparation. Data exploration uh, that's the fun part. This is where you're exploring things. Uh, and it is maybe 10 to 15% of what you do with the data you spend with the data exploration. It is probably uh, the most important step because this is where you got to start asking questions. Uh, if you ask your questions wrong, you're going to get some wrong information. 
If you're working with a company and they want to know the marketing values, then you really got to focus on, hey, how do we generate money for this company? Or fraud, how do we lower the fraud rate while still generating a profit? Four, data modeling. This is where we start actually getting into the data code, uh, which model to use that predicts what's going to happen. Uh, and then result interpretation. We want to be able to interpret those results. You usually see that in your matplot library where you create nice, beautiful images so that it shows up on their dashboard for the marketing manager or for the uh, CEO so they can take a quick look and say, hey, I can see what's going on there. You want to reduce it to something they can easily read. Uh, they don't want to hear the scientific terms. They want to see something they can use. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we start looking at some of this in a demo. Since this is data analysis with Python, we got to ask the question, why Python for data analytics? I mean, there's C++, there's Java, there's .NET from Microsoft. Why do people go to Python for it? So the number of reasons. One, it's easy to learn with simple syntax. Uh, you don't have a very high typeset like you do in Java and other coding. So it allows you to kind of be a little lazy in your programming. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't be set that way and that you don't have to be careful. It just makes, means you can spin up a code much quicker in Python. The same amount of code to do something in Python a lot of times is one, two, or three, or four lines, where when I did the same thing, say, in Java, I found myself with 10, 12, 13, 20 lines, depending on what it was. It's very scalable and flexible. Uh, so there's our flexibility because you can do a lot with it and you can easily scale it up. You can go from something on your machine to using uh, PySpark under the Spark environment and spread that across hundreds, if not thousands of servers across terabytes of data or petabytes of data. So it's very scalable. There's a huge collection of libraries. This one's always interesting because Java has a huge collection of libraries. C has a huge collection of libraries. .NET does, and they're always in competition to get those libraries out. Uh, Scala for your Spark. All those have huge collections of libraries. This is always changing, uh, but because Python's open source, you almost always have easy to access libraries that anybody can use. You don't have to go check your licensing and have special licensing like you do in some packages. Graphics and visualization, they have a really powerful package for that, so it makes it easy to create nice displays for people to read. And community support. Because Python is open source, it has a huge community that supports it. You can do a quick Google and probably find a solution for almost anything you're working on. Python libraries. Let's bring it together. We have data analytics and we have Python. So when we're talking data analytics, we're talking Python libraries for data analytics. And the big five players are NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlibrary, SciPy, which is going to be in the background, so we're not going to talk too much about the scientific formulas in SciPy, and Scikit. So NumPy supports n-dimensional arrays, provides numerical computing tools useful for linear algebra and Fourier transform. Um, and you can think of this as just a grid of numbers. Um, and you can even have uh, a grid inside a grid or data. It's not even numbers because you can also put uh, words and characters and just about anything into that array. But you can think of a grid, and then you can have a grid inside a grid, and you end up with a nice three-dimensional array. If you want to talk three-dimensional array, you can think of images. You have your three channels of color, four if you have an alpha, and then you have your x, y coordinates for the image we're looking at. So you can go x, y, and then what are the three channels to generate that color? And NumPy isn't restricted to three dimensions. You could imagine uh, watching a movie. Well, now you have your movie clips, and they each have their x number of frames, and each of those frames have x number of x, y coordinates for the pictures in each frame, and then you have your three dimensions for the colors. So NumPy is just a great way to work with n-dimensional arrays. Now closely with NumPy is Pandas. Uh, useful for handling missing data, perform mathematical operations, provides functions to manipulate data. Pandas is becoming huge because it is basically a data frame and if you're working with big data and you're working in Spark or any of the other major packages out there, you realize that the data frame is very central to a lot of that. And you can look at it as a Excel spreadsheet. You have your columns, you have your rows or indexes, and uh, you can do all kinds of different manipulations of the data within. 
uh, including filling in missing data, which is a big thing when you're dealing with uh, large pools or lakes of data where they might be collected differently from different uh, locations. And matplotlibrary. We did kick over the SciPy, which is a lot of mathematical computations, which usually runs in the background of the of NumPy and Pandas, um, although you do use them, they're useful for a lot of other things in there. But the matplot library, that's the final part. That's what you want to show people. And this is your plotting library in Python. Several toolkits extend matplot library functionality. There's like a hundred different toolkits to extend matplot library which range from uh, how to properly display star constellations from astronomy. There's a very specific one built just for that, all the way to some uh, very generic ones. We'll actually add Seaborn in when we do the labs in a minute. Several toolkits extend Metplot library functionality, and it creates interactive visualization. Uh, so there's all kinds of cool things you can do as far as just displaying graphs, and there's even some that you can create interactive graphs. We won't do the interactive grasp, but you'll see, you'll get a, a pretty good grasp of some of the different things you can do in matplotlibrary. Let's jump over to the demo, which is my favorite. Roll up our sleeves, get our hands in on what we're doing. Now, there's a lot of options when we're dealing with Python. Uh, you can use PyCharm is a really popular one. Uh, and you'll see this all over the place. Um, so it's one of the main ones that's out there, and there's a lot of other ones. I used to use NetBeans, which has kind of lost favor. Uh, don't even have it installed on my new computer. But the most popular one right now for data science. Now, PyCharm is really popular for Python general development. For data science, we usually go to Jupyter uh, Notebook or Anaconda. And we're going to jump into Anaconda because that's my favorite one to go to because it has a lot of external tools for us. We're not going to dig into those, but we will pop in there so you can see what it looks like. So... With Anaconda, we have our Jupyter Lab, we have our um, notebook. These are identical. Jupyter Lab is an upgrade to the notebooks with multiple tabs. That's all it is. And we'll be using the notebook. And you can see that PyCharm is so popular with um, Python that we even have it highlighted here in Anaconda as part of the setup. Uh, Jupyter Notebook can also be a standalone. Uh, so we're actually going to be running Jupyter Notebook. And then you have your different environments. Um, I have, we're going to be under main pi 3.6, there's a root one, and I usually label it pi 3.6. The reason is, is currently as of writing this, TensorFlow only works in 3.6 and not in 3.7 or 3.8 for doing neural networks. But you can actually have multiple environments, which is nice. They're, they separate the kernels, so it helps protect your computer when you're doing development. And this is just a great way to do a display or a demo, especially if you're looking for that job. Pull up your laptop, open it up. Or if you're doing a meeting, get it broadcast up to the big screen so that the uh, CEO can see what you're looking at. And when we launch the notebook, uh, it actually opens up a file browser in whatever uh, web browser you have. This happens to be Chrome. And then you can just go under New. There's a lot of different options depending on what you have installed. Uh, Python 3. And this just creates an untitled uh, version of this. And you can see here I'm actually in a Simply Learn folder for other work I've done for Simply Learn. Uh, and that's where I save all my stuff and I can browse through other folders, making it real easy to jump from one project to another. And under here, we'll go ahead and change the name of this and we'll go ahead and uh, rename it Data Analytics. Data Analytics. Just so I can remember what I was doing. Which is probably about 50 of the folders in here, right, or files in here right now. <laughs> Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in there and take a look at some of these different uh, tools that we were looking at. And as we go through the demo, let's start with the uh, NumPy, uh, the least visually exciting. And I'm going to zoom in here so you can see what we're doing. And the first thing we want to do is import NumPy. And we'll import it as NP. That is the most common NumPy terminology. And let's go ahead and change the view so we also have the line numbers. Um, I don't know why. We probably won't need them, but I like it for easy reference. Uh, and then we'll create a one-dimensional array. We'll just call this array1. And it equals np.array. And you put your array information in here. In this case, we'll spell it out. Uh, you can actually do like a range and other ways. There's lots of ways to generate these arrays. But we'll just do a one, two, three. So three integers. And if we print our array one we can go ahead and run this 
and you can see right here it prints one, two, three. You can see why this is a really nice interface to show other people what you're doing uh, with the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so this is the basic. We've created an array. This is a one-dimensional array, and then the array is one, two, three. One of the nice things about the Jupyter Notebook is whatever ran in this first setup is still running. It's still in the kernel. So it still has the numpy imported as np, and it still has our variable um, arr1 for array1 equal to np array of 1, 2, 3. So when we go to the next cell, we can check the type of the array. We're just going to print. We say, hey, what's, what, what, what is this um, setup in here? And we want type. Um, and then we want, what is the type of array 1? And let's go ahead and run that. And it says class numpy nd array. So it's its own class. That's all we're doing is, is checking to see what that class is. And if you look at the uh, array class, uh, the, probably the biggest thing you do, <laughs> I don't know how many times I find myself uh, doing this uh, because I forget what I'm working on and I forget I'm working with a three-dimensional or four-dimensional array. Uh, and I have to reformat somehow so it works with whatever other things I have. And so we do the array shape. Uh, the array shape is just three because it has three members and it's a one-dimensional array. That's all that is. And with the numpy array, we can easily access, um, let's stick with the print statement. If you actually put a variable in Jupyter Notebook and it's the last one in the cell, it will be the same as a print statement. So if I do this, where array one of two, it's the same as doing print array of two. That's, those are identical statements in our Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we'll go ahead and stick with the print on this one. And it's three. So there's our print space two. And we have zero, one, two. Two equals three. We can easily change that. So we have array one of place two equals five. And then if we print our array one, uh, you can see right down here when it comes out, it's one, two, and five. And there I left the print statement off because it's the last variable in the list. Um, it'll always print the variable if you just put it in like that. That's a Jupyter Notebook thing. Don't do that in PyCharm. I've forgotten before doing a demo. <laughs> and we talked about multiple dimensions, so we'll do an array, um, two-dimensional array. And this is, again, a numpy array. And in the numpy array, we need um, our first dimension. We'll do one, two, three. And our second dimension, uh, three, four, five. And you can see right here that when we hit the, uh, we'll do this, we'll just do array two. And we can run that, and there's our array two, one, two, three, three, four, five. We can also do array two of uh, one. And then we can do, let's do zero. It doesn't really matter which one. Actually, let's do th uh, two. There we go. And if I run this, it'll print out 5, because uh, here we are. This is 0, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 is on our 0 row. 3, 4, 5 is on our 1 row. Now we start with 0. And then the 2, 0, 1, 2 goes to the 5. And then maybe we forgot what we were working with. So we'll go do array 2 dot shape. And if we do array 2 of shape, uh, we'll go and run that. We'll see we have two rows, and each row has three elements. Uh, Two-dimensional array, two, three. If you looked up here when we did it before, it just had three comma nothing. When you have a single entity, it always saves it as a tuple with a blank space. Uh, but you can see right here we have two comma three. And if you remember from up here, we just did this array two of, uh, let's go, what is it, one comma two. We run that, we get the five. You can also count backwards. This is kind of fun. And you'll see I just kind of switched something on you because you can also do one comma two to get to the same spot. Um, now two is the last one, zero, one, two. It's the last one in there. We can count backwards and do minus one. And if we run this, we get the same answer. Whether we count it as, uh, let's go back up here. Whether we count this as zero, one, two, or we count backwards as minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. And you can see that if I change this minus 1 to a minus 2 and run that, 
I get 4, which is going backwards, minus 1, minus 2. So there's a lot of different ways to reference what we're working on inside the NumPy array. It's really a cool tool. It's got a lot of things you can do with it. And we talked about the fact that it can also hold things that are not values, and we'll call this array s for strings equals uh, np.array. Put our uh, setup in there, our brackets, and let's go China, um, India, USA, uh, Mexico, it doesn't matter, we can make whatever we want on here. And if we print that out, we run this, you can see that we get a, our numpy array, China, India, USA, Mexico. It even gives us our D type of a U6. And a lot of times when you're uh, messing with data, we'll call this array R for range, just to kind of keep it uniform, np.a range. So this is a command inside NumPy to create a range of numbers. And if you're testing data, maybe you want, uh, maybe you have equal time increments um, that are spaced a certain point apart. But in this case, we're just going to do integers. And we're going to do uh, uh, a setup from 0, 20, skipping every other one. And we'll print it out and see what that looks like. And you can see here we have 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Like you expect it, it skips every one. And just a quick note, there's no 20 on here. Uh, why? Well, this starts at 0 and counts up to 20. So if you're used to another language where it explicitly says uh, less than or less than equal to 20, like for x equals 0, um, x plus plus, uh, x is less than 20. That's what this is. It just assumes x is less than 20 on here. And if we want to create a very uniform uh, set, you know, 0, 2, 4, 6, what happens if I want to create numbers uh, from 0 to 10, but I need 20 increments in there? Uh, we can do that with line space. So we can create um, an R, uh, we'll call this L equals, I don't think we'll actually use any of this again, so I don't know why I'm creating unique um, identifiers for it. Uh, but we'll do np uh, lin space, and we're going to do 0 to 10, or 0 to 9. Uh, remember, it doesn't, it goes up to 10. And then we want to, let's say we have 20 different um, increments in there. So we're creating a, we have a data set and we know it's over a certain time period and we need to divide that time period by 20 and it happens to just have 10 pieces in it. Um, and here we go, you can see right here we have 20, or it has 20 pieces in it but it's over 10 years and we got to divide it in the middle. And you can see it does, it goes 0 0.52. Remember, yeah there's our 10 on the end so it goes up to 10. Uh, and then we can also do random. There's np.random. If you're doing neural networks, uh, usually you start it by seeding it with random numbers. And we'll just do np.random, and we'll just call this array. We'll stop giving it unique numbers. We'll print that one out and run it. And you can see we have random numbers. They are 0 to 1. So you'll see that all these numbers are under 1. And you can easily alter that by multiplying them out or something like that if you want to do like 0 to 100. Um, you can also round them up if it's integer 0 to 100. There's all kinds of things you can do, but it generates a random float between 0 and 1. And you have a couple options. You could reshape that, um, or you can just generate them uh, in whatever shape you want. And so we can see here, uh, we did 3 and 4, and so you can see uh, 3 rows by 4 variables. Same thing as doing a reshape of 12 variables to 3 and 4. And if you're going to do that, you might need an empty data set. Um, I have had this come up many times, <laughs> where I need to start off with 0, and I don't know, you know, because I'm going to be adding stuff in there, or it might be 0 and 1, where 1 is, uh, if you're removing the background of an image, you might want the background is 0, and then you figure out where the image is, and you set all those boxes to 1, and you create a mask. So creating masks over images is really big, and doing that with uh, a numpy array of zero. And we can also uh, give it a space. And we'll just do this all in one shot this time. 
And we'll do the same thing like we did before, zeros, and in this case we'll do uh, 2 comma 3. And so when we run this, forgot the asterisk around it. I knew I was forgetting something. <laughs> there we go. So when we run this, uh, you can see here we have uh, our 10 zeros in a row, and maybe this is a mask for an image, and so it has uh, two rows of three digits in it. So it's a very small image, a um, little tiny pixel. And maybe you're looking to do something the opposite way. Uh, instead of uh, creating a mask of zeros and filling in with ones, uh, maybe you want to create a mask of ones and fill them in with uh, zeros. And we'll just do, just like we did before, we'll do 3 comma 4. And when we run this, you'll see it's all ones. And we could even do this even, uh, we'll do it this way. Let's do... 10, 10 by 10 icon, and then you have your three colors. And you can, so it creates quite a large array there for doing pictures and stuff like that when you add that third dimension in. Um, if we take that off, it's a little bit easier to see. Um, we'll do 10 again. And you can easily see how we have 10 rows of 10 ones. And you can also do something uh, like create an array, and we'll do 0, 1, 2. And then in this array, um, we actually print it right out. We want an, a repeat. And so you can actually do a repeat of the array, and maybe you need this array. Um, let's repeat it three times. So there's our repeat of an array, repeat three times. And if we run this, you'll see we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. And whenever I think of a repeat, I don't really think of repeating being the first digit three times, the second digit. I really always think of it as um, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. It catches me every time. Uh, but the actual code for that one is going to be tile. Uh, and again, if we do a range 3 and we run this, you can see how you can generate one, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And if you're dealing with um, an identity matrix, um, we can do that also if you're big on you're doing your matrices. And we'll just uh, identity. I guess we'll go ahead and spell it out today. Matrix. And the command we're looking for is um, I, E-Y-E. And we'll do three, and then we'll just go ahead and print this out. There we go. There's our identity matrix. And it comes out by a three by three array, because there's our matrix. Uh, and then it puts the ones down the middle and for doing your different matrix math. And we can manipulate that a little bit too. Um, we talk about uh, matrices. We might not want uh, ones across the middle, in which case we now have uh, the diagonal. So we can do an np dot diagonal, and we do a diagonal. Uh, let's put in the diagonal one, two, three, four, five. And when we run this, again, this generates a value, and by just putting that value in, there's the same as putting print around it, or putting array equals and then print array. And you can see it generates a diagonal one, two, three, four, five, and there's your uh, your beginning of your matrix array for working with uh, matrices. And we can actually go in reverse. Uh, let's create an array equals uh, remember our random random dot random, and we'll do a five by five array. Uh, oops, there we go. Five by five, and just so you can see what that looks like. Helps if I type, don't mistype the numbers, which in this case I just need to take out the brackets. <laughs> and there you go, you have your, your 5 by 5 array set up in there. And we can now, because we're working with uh, matrices, we might want to do this in reverse and extract the diagonals, which would be the 0.79, the 0.678, and so on. And we simply type in np.diagonal, and we put our array in there. Um, and this will, of course, print it out because it returns it as a variable. And you can see here, here's our diagonal going across from our matrix.
And we did talk about shape earlier. If you remember, you can do um, uh, print the shape out. You can also do the dimensions. Uh, so in dimensions, very similar to shape. It comes out and just has two dimensions. We can also look at the size. So if we do uh, size on here, we can run that. And you can see it has a size of 25, two dimensions, and of course, five by five. And that was from the shape from earlier that we looked at. Uh, there's our five by five shape. And if you remember earlier, we did random. Well, you can also do uh, random. I talked a little bit about manipulating zero to one and how you can get different answers. You can also do straight for the integer part. And we'll do minus uh, 10 to 10, 4. And so we're going to generate random integers between minus 10 to 10. Uh, we're going to generate four of those. And so when we run that, we have 7, minus 3, minus 6, minus 3. They're all between minus 10 and 10, and there's four of them. And now we jump into some of the functionality of arrays, uh, which is really great, because this is where they come in. Here's your array, and you can add 10 to it. And if I run this, um, there it takes my original array from up here with the integers and adds 10 to all of those values. So now we have, oh, this is the decimal. That's right. This is a random decimal I had stored in array. <laughs> um, but this takes a random decimal, the random numbers I had from 0 to 1 and adds 10 to them. And we can just as easily do uh, minus 10. Uh, we could even do times 2. And we could do divide by 2. And it would, it'll take that uh, random number we generated and cut it in half. So now all these numbers are under 0.5. Uh, another way you can change the numbers to what you need on there. And as you dig deeper into NumPy, we can also do exponential. So as an exponential function, uh, which would generate some interesting numbers off of the random. So we're taking them to the power. I don't even remember what the original numbers in the... Um, array work because we did the random numbers up there. And here's our original numbers. And if you build an exponential on there, uh, this is where you get e to the x on this. And just like you can do e to the x, you can also do the log. So if you're doing logarithmic functions that reinforce learning, you might be doing uh, some kind of log setup on there and you can see the logarithmic of these different array numbers. And if you're working with uh, log base 2, you can do, you can just change it in there, np log 2. You have to look it up, because this is not log 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, it is log and log 2. Uh, so just a quick note, that's not a variable going in. That is an actual command. There's a number of them in there, and you'll have to go look and see uh, what the documentation is. But you can also do log 10. So here's log value 10. Uh, some other really cool functions you can do with this is your sign. So we can take a sign value of all of our different uh, values in there. And if you have sine, you of course have cosine. We can run that. Uh, so here's the cosine of those. And if you're doing activations in your NumPy array and you're doing a tangent activation, uh, there's your tangent for that. And the tangent activation is actually uh, from uh, neural networks. That's one of the ways you can activate it because it forms a nice curve between uh, from whether you're generating a 1 to negative 1 uh, with some discrepancy in the middle. Just jumping a little bit in there into neural networks. And then we get into, let me just put the array back out there so that we can see it uh, while we're doing this. As we're getting into this you can also sum the values. So we have np sum and you can do a summation of all the values in this array. And you'll see that if you added all these together, they'd equal 12.519, so on. I don't know what the whole setup is in there. Uh, but you can see right here the, the summation of this. One of the things you can also do is by axes. So we could do axes equals 0. And if we run the summation of the axes equals 0, and you can think of that uh, in NumPy as the rows. So that would be... Uh, or you can think of that in NumPy as being the columns. We're summing these columns going across. And you can also change this to 1, and now we're summing the rows. 
And so that is the summation of this row and so forth and so forth going down. And maybe you don't need to um, know the summation. Maybe what you're looking for is the minimum. Uh, so here's our minimal. You know, you're looking for, and this comes up a lot because you have like your errors. We want to find the minimal error inside of this array. And just like um, the other one, we can do axes equals zero. And you can see here 0 0.0645 is the smallest number in this first column is 0 0.0645 and so on. And if you have a minimum, well, you might also want to know the max. Maybe we're looking for the maximum profit. And here we go. You can see maximum 0.79 is the maximum on this first column. And just like we did before, you can change this to a 1 on axes. You can take the axes out of here and just find the max value for the whole array. And the max value in here was 0.8344, so on, so on. And since we're talking data analytics, uh, we want to go ahead and look at the mean. Uh, pretty much the same as the average. This is the mean across the whole thing. And just like we did before, we could also do axes equals zero. And then you'll see this is the mean of this axis and so on. And we have mean. We might want to know the median. And there's our median, our most common numbers. Uh, if we have median, we might want to know the standard deviation. Or if we have the average, a lot of times you do the means and the standard deviation. Um, we can run that, and there's our standard deviations along the axes. We can also do it across the whole array. Uh, if we're going to do standard deviations, there's also uh, variance, which is your VAR. And there's our variance across the different levels. And so if we looked at that, we looked at variance, we looked at standard deviation, the median, and the means. There's more, but those are the most common ones used with data analytics um, and then going through your data and figuring out uh, uh, what you're going to present to the shareholders. And some other things we can do is we can actually take slices. Uh, you'll hear that terminology, and a slice might be um, like we have a 5x5 five five array, but maybe we don't want the whole array. Maybe we want uh, from 1 on, we don't want the 0 in there, so we got up to 4. And maybe on the second part, we just want 2 to row 3. And see, so this notation right here says 1 to the end. And if we run this, you can see how that generates uh, a single row to the end, and then row 2 and 3. Now remember, it doesn't include 3. That's why we only get the one column. So if you wanted 2 and 3, you would need to go ahead and go 2 to 4. So it goes up to 4. We could also do this in reverse, just like we learned earlier, we can go minus one, whoops. And when we go to minus one, it's the same thing because we have zero, one, two, three, four. This is the same thing as two to four. It goes two to the last one. Also very common with arrays is you're gonna wanna sort them. So we still have our array up here that we randomly generated and we might want to, um, sort it and we'll go and throw an axis back in there uh, axis equals one if we run this you can see from the axis that it sorts it uh, the point two being the lowest value to the highest value by the row we can also change this of course to axis zero if you're sorting it by columns so maybe your values are based on columns and then of course you can do the whole array and we can sort that don't usually do that, but you know, I guess sometimes you might that might come up. And so you can see right here we have a nice sorted array. Uh, something now, let's just go ahead and reprint our array so we can look at it again. Starting to get too many boxes up there. Uh, something else you can do with an array is we can take and transpose it. This comes up more than you would think. When you transpose it, you'll see that um, the rows and the column are transposed. So where 0 0.79, 0 0.57, 0 0.064 is the column. Now we've switched it and we have 0 0.79, 0 0.42 as the index. You can see this really more dramatic if we take a slice. And we'll just do a slice of the first couple. And then we'll just do all the other, um, the full rows. And if we run this, 
you can see how it comes up a little bit different. And we'll just do the same slice up here so you can see how those two look next to each other. There we go. There's our slice run. Uh, and so you can see the slice comes up and it has uh, one, two, three, four, five columns. Now we have one, two, three, four, five rows and three columns versus three rows. And the original version, when they first started putting this um, together, uh, was a function. So the original version was transpose, and this still works. You can still see it generates the same value as just a capital T. So many times we flip this data because we'll have an XY value or we'll have an image or something like that, and it's being read one way into the next process, and the next one needs it the opposite. Uh, so this actually happens a lot. You need to know how to transpose the data really quick. And we can go ahead, oh, let's just take, um, here's our transpose. We'll just stick with the transpose on here. And instead of uh, doing it this way, we might need to do something called flattening. Why would you flatten your data? Uh, if this is an array going into a neural network, you might want to send it in as one set of values instead of two rows. And you can see here is all the values as a single array. It just flattens it down into one array. So we covered our scientific uh, means, transpose, uh, median, um, some different variations on here. Some of the other things we want to do is what happens if we want to append to our array. Uh, so let's create a new array. I'm getting tired of looking at the same set of uh, random numbers we generated earlier. Um, and so we'll go ahead and create a new array here, something a little simpler so it's easier to see what we're doing. And four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, that's good enough. We'll just do four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and if we print this array, there it is, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we might want to append something to the array. So we have our array, we need to extend it. You got to be very careful about appending things to your array. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is runtime. Because of the way the NumPy array is set up, a lot of times you build your data and then push it into the NumPy array instead of continually adding on to the array. Um, and then it also usually it automatically generates a copy for protecting your data. So there's a lot of reasons to be careful about appending this way. Uh, but you can certainly do it. And we can just take our array. We're going to create a new array, array 1. And if we print array 1 and we append 8 to it, you'll see 4, 5, 6, 7. And then there's our 8 appended on to the end. And if you want to append something to an array, um, you'd probably also want to, whoops, <laughs> array one. Let's try that again. There we go. Now we have the eight appended onto the end. Um, so you can see four, five, six, seven, eight, and then we appended another eight on there. And if you're going to append something, you might want to um, go ahead and insert. Instead of appending, it might be you need to keep a certain order. And we can do the same thing. We can do our array. Um, and we're going to pin or um, insert <laughs> at the beginning. And let's go ahead and insert uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. And we go ahead and print our array two. We run it, and you can see one, two, three appen is inserted at the beginning. Uh, insert's a lot more powerful in that you can put it anywhere in the array. We can move it to the one spot. And there we go, one, two, three. Uh, we can do a minus one. Just for fun, and you'll see it comes up uh, one, two, three, and we're counting backwards by one. I imagine you can do a minus zero and run this, and it turns out that minus zero puts it back at the beginning because that's why it registers a zero, just takes a minus sign off. And just like we add numbers on, we might want to delete numbers. And so uh, let's do an np.delete. Well, let's, let's keep it a little bit, make it a little easy here um, to watch. We'll go ahead and create an array 3, and we'll do np delete. We were just working with array uh, 2, and what we want to do is delete 0 space. Uh, so if you look at this, here's our array 2. Our array 2 starts with 1, and when we delete the space on here and print that out, uh, we deleted the 1 right out of there. And we can also do something like this, where we can do it as a slice. And we can do, let's do 1, 3. And if we run 1, 3, you'll see we've deleted the 1 space and the 3 space out, which deleted our 2 and 4.
Now keep in mind when you're messing with um, adding lines and deleting lines, uh, you have to be really careful because there's a time element involved um, as far as where the data is coming from and it's really easy to delete the wrong data and corrupt what you're working on or to insert stuff where you don't want it. Um, so there's always a warning when we talk about manipulating NumPy arrays. And just like anything else we're doing, uh, we'll create an array C, which equals, we'll just do our, um, our NumPy array that we just created, our NumPy array 3, and we can do copy. So you can make a copy of it. Uh, maybe you want to protect your original data, or maybe you're making a mask, and so you copy the array, and then the new array make all these alterations and change it from values to 0 to 1 to mask over the first one. And of course, we, if we do um, array C, since it equals a copy of uh, array 3, it's the same thing. 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8. And now we're getting into uh, combine and split arrays. I end up doing a lot of this. And I don't know how many times I end up fiddling with this and having a mess. Uh, so, <laughs> but, but you do it a lot. You know, you combine your arrays, you split them. You might need one set of data for one thing, another set of data for the other. So let's go ahead and create two arrays, array one, array two. And I want you to note, and the terminology we're going to look for is concatenate. And what that means is we're going to take, um, we'll call this array cat. I like array cat. There we go. Um, our array cat, our concatenated array. We're taking array one and two, and it's very important to really pay attention to your axes and your counts. I can't merge two arrays that have, like the, if their axes are messed up and I'm merging on axis zero, it's going to give me an error and I'll have to reshape them. So you got to make sure that whatever you're concatenating together works. And what that means, as you can see here, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight along the zero axes. These each are four values, um, so it's a two by four value. And if we go ahead and switch this to one, you can see how that's, that flips it a little bit. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's interesting that we chose that one. If I did something like this, where this is now, there we go, and we concatenate it, um, run this, and it gives me an answer okay because I have two by two, and I'm using axes one. But if I switch this to axis 0, where now it's got 3 and 5, it gives me an error. So you got to be really careful on that to make sure that your, whatever axes you are putting together, that they match. Um, so like I said, this one, oops, axis 1. Axis 1 has two entities, and since we're going on axis 1, or by row, you can see that it lets it uh, merge it right onto the end there. And you could imagine this, if this was a... Uh, x, y plot of value or the x value going in and the predicted y value coming out and then you have another prediction and you want to combine them, this works really easy for that. And we'll go back and let's just put this back to where we had it. Oops, I forgot how many changes I made. There we go. Um, we'll just put it, oops, I messed up in my concatenation order here. Da, 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 da. There we go. Okay, so you can see that we went through the different concatenation. Axes is really important when you're doing your concatenation values on here. And we'll switch this back to one just because I like the looks of that better. There we go. Two rows. Now, there are other commands in here. Um, so we can do uh, cat v equals npv v stack. This is nothing more than your concatenation, uh, but instead we don't have to put the axes in there because uh, V stands for vertical. And so if we print out cat V and we run this, you can see we get the 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and that would be the same as making this axis 0 for vertical stack. And if you're going to have a vertical stack, uh, you can also have an H stack. So if we change this to from V stack to, oops, here we go, H stack, and we'll just change this from cat to cat, and I run this, it's the same as doing axis zero. 
the process is identical in the background. Um, this is like a legacy setup, uh, your V-Stack and your H-Stack. Most people just use concatenate and then put the axes in there because it's much, uh, has a lot more clarity and um, is more, more commonly used nowadays. The last section in NumPy we're going to cover uh, is under, is kind of uh, data exploration. Um, and that'll make a little bit more sense in just a, a moment. They, sometimes they call them set operations. But let's say we have an array, one, two, three, four, five, six, three, whatever it is. Uh, I think so we generate a nice little array here. And what I want to go ahead and do is find the unique values in that array. Uh, so maybe I'm generating what they call a one hot encoder. And so these values then all become, I need to know how long my bit uh, array is going to be. So each word, how many, how many, each word is represented by a number. And then I want to know just how many of those words are in there. If we're doing word count, very popular thing to do. <laughs> um, and you can see here when we do unique, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are our unique values. Uh, some of the things we can do with the unique values is we can also, instead of doing just unique, we can do uniques, our new unique values and counts of each unique value. And this is very similar to what we just did up here where we uh, were doing NP unique, uh, but we're going to add a little bit more into there. And it's just part of the arguments in this. And we want to do return counts equals true. So in, instead of just returning the unique values, uh, we want to know how many of those unique values are in each one. And we'll go ahead and print our uniques and print our counts. When we run that, uh, you can see here we have our unique value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just like we had before. And then there's two of the first of two ones, two twos, two threes, two fours, one five, two sixes, and so on. And you can go through and actually look at that if you want to count them. Um, but a quick way to find out your um, uh, distribution of different values. So you might want to know how often the word the is used versus the word and if each word is represented as a unique number. And along the set variables, we might want to know, um, let me just put a note up here. We're going to start looking at uh, intersection. And we might want to also know differentiation. And uh, neither. <laughs> so when we're, whoops, neighbor. Neither. Um, so what we're looking at now is we want to know, hey, where do these two arrays intersect? And we have one, two, three, four, five, three, four, five, six, seven. We might want to know what is common between the two arrays. Um, and so when we do that, we have um, uh, NP intersect. And it's a 1D array, one dimensional array. And then we need to go ahead and put array uh, one, array two. And if we run this, we can see they intersect at three, four, five. That's what they have common. Uh, and because we're going to go ahead and go through these and look at a couple different options, let's change this from intersect one D. And we'll do the same thing. We'll go ahead and print this. So we might want to know the intersection uh, where they have commonalities. Another uh, unique word is union of 1D. Uh, so instead of uh, intersect, we want to know all the values that are in both of them. So here's our union of 1D. When we run that, you can see we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's all the different values in there. And the last, one of the last words, we have two more to go, uh, is we want to know what the set difference is. Uh, and so that's where the, you'll see, the, if you remember set, we talked about that being the what they call these things. Um, so the set difference of a 1D array, when we run that, you can see that 1 is only in one array and 2 is only in one array. And if we want to know uh, what's in array 1 but not in array 2, we might want to know what is in array 1 but not 2 and what's in 2 but not 1. Uh, and this would be the set X or 1D on here. Uh, so we have the four different options here where we can do an intersection. What do they both have in common? Uh, we can do a union. What are all the unique values in both arrays? 
we can see the difference, what's in array 1, but not array 2, so set diff 1D, and then set X or what is not in 1, but is in 2, and what is in not in 2, but in 1. So we dug a lot in NumPy, because we were talking, um, there's a lot of different little mathematical things going on in NumPy. A lot of this can also be done in Pandas, although usually the heavy lifting is left for NumPy, because that's what it's designed for. Let's go ahead and open up another Python 3 setup in here. And so we want to explore uh, what happens when you want to display this. This is where it starts getting, in my opinion, a little fun because you're actually playing with it and you have something to show people. And we'll go ahead and rename this. We're going to call this uh, Pandas uh, and PyPlot. So Pandas PyPlot, just so we can remember for next time. And we want to go ahead and import the necessary libraries. We're going to import pandas as PD. Now remember, this is a data frame. So we're talking uh, rows and columns. And you'll see how uh, pandas work so nicely uh, when you're actually showing data to people. And then we're going to have NumPy in the background. NumPy works with pandas. Uh, so a lot of times you just import them by default. Seaborn sits on top of the matplot library. Uh, so sometimes we use the Seaborn because it kind of extends. It's one of the hundred packages that extends the matplot library probably the most common used because it has a lot of built-in functionality. Um, almost by default, I usually just put Seaborn in there in case I need it. And of course we have uh, matplot library as pyplot, as plt. And note we have as pd, as np, as sns, as plt. Those are pretty standard. So when you're doing your imports, I would probably keep those just so other people can read your code and it makes sense to them. That's pretty much a standard nowadays. And then we have the strange line here. Uh, it says uh, ambersign matplot library inline. That is for Jupyter Notebook only. So if you're running this in a different package, it'll have a pop-up when it goes to display the matplot library. Um, you can, with the most current version of Jupyter, usually leave that out and it will still display it right on the page as we go. And we'll see what that looks like. And then we're going to go ahead and just uh, do the um, seaborn, the sns.set, and we're going to set the color codes equals true. Let them uh, just keep the default one so we don't have to think about it too much. And we, of course, have to run this. Um, the reason we run this is because these values are all set. If we don't run this and I access one of these um, afterward, it'll, it'll crash. The cool thing about Jupyter uh, Notebooks is if you forgot to import one of these, you forgot to install it, because you do have to install this under your Anaconda setup or whatever setup you're in, you can flip over to Anaconda and run your install for these. Um, and then just come back and run it. You don't have to close anything out. And we'll go ahead and paste this one in here real quick where we have car equals pd dot read underscore csv. And then we have uh, the actual path. This path, of course, will vary depending on what you are working with. Uh, so it's wherever you save the file at. And you can see here I have um, like my OneDrive documents, Simply Learn, Python, Data Analytic, using Python, slash uh, car CSV. It's quite a long file. When we open that up, what we get is we get a CSV file and we have the make, the model, the year, the engine, fuel type, uh, engine horsepower, cylinders, and so on. Um, and this is just a comma separated file. So each row is like a row of data. Think of it as a um, spreadsheet. And then each one is a column of data on here. And as you can see right here, it has the uh, make model. So it has columns for a header on here. Now, your pandas just does an excellent job of automatically pulling a lot of this in. So when you start seeing the pandas on here, you realize that you are already like halfway done with getting your data in. Uh, I just love pandas for that reason. NumPy also has it. You can load a CSV directly into NumPy, um, but we're working with pandas, and this is where it really gets cool, is I can come down here and I can print, uh, you remember our print statement, we can actually get rid of it, and we're just going to do car head, because it's going to print that out. The head is going to print the top values of that data file we just ran in. And so you can see right here, it does a nice printout. It's all nice and inline, because we're in Jupyter Notebook. I can scroll back and forth and look at the different data. Uh, and just like we expected, we have our column. And it brought the header right in. 
One thing to note is the index. It automatically created an index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And we're just looking at the head, so we got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, you can change this. You might want to just look at the top two. We can run that. There's our top two BMWs. Um, another thing we can do is instead of head, we can do tail. And look at the last three values that are in that uh, data file. And uh, you can see right here, it numbered them all the way up to 11,913. Oh my goodness, they put a lot of data in this file. <laughs> I didn't even look to see how big the file was. Uh, so you can really easily get through and view the different data in here. When you're talking about big data, you almost never just print out car. Uh, in fact, let's see what happens when we do. If we run this and we just run the car, it's huge. Uh, in fact, it's so big that the pandas automatically truncates it and just does head plus tail. So you can see the two. Um, so we really don't want to look at the whole thing. I'm going to go back to, let's stick with the head displaying our data. There we go. So there's the head of our data. It gives us a quick look to see what's actually in there. Um, I can zoom out if we want so you can actually get a better view. Although we'll keep it zoomed in so you can see the code I'm working on. And then from the uh, data standpoint, we of course want to look at um, data types. Uh, what's going on with our data? What does it look like? Uh, now this, you know, you show your, when you're talking to your shareholders, they like to see these nice easy to read charts. They look like a spreadsheet. Uh, so it's a nice way of displaying pieces of the chart. When we talk about the data types, now we're getting into the data science side of it. What are we working with? Well, we have uh, make model, we have an integer 64 for the year, uh, engine fuel type is an object. If we go up here, you can see that they're, most of them are, um, like, you know, it's a set manual, rear wheel drive, uh, so they might be very limited number of types in there, uh, and so forth. And you know, it's either going to be a float 64, an integer, or an object is the way it's going to read it on here. And the next thing you're going to know is like your columns. And since it loaded the columns automatically, uh, we have here the make, the model, the year, the engine, the size, all the way up to the MSRP. And um, uh, just out of uh, something you'll see come up a lot is whenever you're in pandas and you type in dot values, it converts it from a pandas uh, list to a numpy array. And that's true of any of these. Uh, so then you end up in a numpy array. So you'll see a little switch in there in the way that the data is actually uh, stored. And that's true of any of these. Uh, in this case, uh, we want car.columns. You have a total list of your car columns. And like any good data um, scientist, we want to start looking at analytical summary of the data set. What's going on with our data? So we can start trying to um, piecemeal it together. So we can do car, uh, describe. And then what we'll do is we'll do include equals all. Uh, so a nice panda command is to describe your data. If you're working with R, this should start looking familiar. Uh, and we come down here and you can see um, count. There's a uh, make, the model, the year, um, how many of each one, uh, how many unique values of each one, uh, the top value of each one, what's most common, the frequency, the mean, um, clearly on some of these it's an object, so it really can't tell you what the um, average is. You know, it'd just be the top one's the average, I guess. Um, the year, what's the average year on there? Um, all this stuff comes down here. Your standard deviation, your minimum value, your maximum value, uh, what's in the lower quarter, 50% mark, where's that line at, and what's in the upper 75%, the top 25% going into the max. Now, this next part is just cool. Uh, this is what we always wanted computers to be back like in the 90s instead of 5,000 lines of code to do this. Maybe not 5,000. All right, I built my own plot uh, library back in 95, and the amount of code for doing a simple plot was, um, I don't know, probably about 100 lines of code. This is being done in one line of code. We have our car, which is our pandas. We generated that. It's our data frame. And we have dot hist for histogram. That is the power of Seaborn. Now it's still going to generate a numpy graph, but Seaborn sits on top 
and then we can do the figure size. This is just um, so it fits nicely on the paper on here. And we do something simple like this, and you can see here where it comes up, and it does say matplot library and does subplots and everything. But we're looking at a histogram of all the different pieces in our database. And we have our engine cylinders. Um, that's always a good one because you can see like they have some that are they had uh, a null on there, so they came out as zero. Um, maybe a couple, maybe one of them had a two-cylinder engine away back when. Four is a common, uh, six a little less common, and then you see the eight-cylinder, uh, twelve-cylinder engines. Boy, that's got to be a speedster or something. Uh, but you can see right here, it just breaks it down. So now you have uh, how many cars with how many whatever it is, cylinders, horsepower, uh, and so on. And it does a nice job displaying it. You can see if you're working with your, uh, um, you're going into your uh, demo, it's really nice just to be able to type that in and boom, there it is. It can see it all the way across. And we might want to zero in uh, and use like a box plot. And this time we'll go ahead and call the um, Seaborn SNS box plot. And we're going to go ahead and do um, vehicle size in versus um, engine horsepower XY plot. And the data comes from the car. So if we run this, we end up with a nice box plot. You see our midsize, compact, and large. You can see the variation. There's our outlier showing up there on the compact. That must be a high-end sports car. A uh, large car might have a couple engines. And again, we have all these outliers and then your deviation on them. Very powerful and quick way to zero in on one small piece of data and display it for people who need to have it reduced to something they can see and look at and understand. And that's our Seaborn box plot or SNS.boxplot. And then if we're going to back out and we want a quick look at um, what they call pair plotting, uh, we can run that and you can see with the Seaborn it just does all the work for you. Uh, it takes it just a moment for it to pull the data in and compile it. And once it does, it creates a nice grid. Um, and this grid, if you look at uh, this one space here, which is, you might not be able to see the small number, it says engine horsepower. This is engine horsepower uh, to the year it was built, and it's just flipped. So everything to the right of the middle diagonal is just uh, the rotation of what's on the left. And as you expect, um, the engine horsepower um, gets bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. So the, the year it was built, the further up in the year, the more likely you are to have a heavy horsepower engine. And you can quickly look at trends with our uh, pair plot coming up. Uh, and look how fast that was. That was it took it a couple, you know, moment to process. Uh, but right away, I get a nice view of all these different um, information, which I can look at visually and, and kind of see how things group and look. Now, if I was doing a meeting, I probably wouldn't show all the data. Um, one of the things I've learned over the years is um, people, myself included, love to show all our work. You know, we were taught in school, show all your work, prove what you know. The CEO doesn't want to see a huge uh, grid of, of graphs, I guarantee it. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and drop um, the stuff that might not be interested in. And we're going to, I'm not really a car person, uh, our guy in the back is, obviously. <laughs> so you have your engine fuel type. We're going to drop that. We're going to drop market category, vehicle style, popularity, number of doors, vehicle size. Um, and we have the axes in here. If you remember from NumPy, we have to include that axis to make it clear what we're working on. That's also true with pandas. And then we'll look at just the, what, it, what it looks like um, from the head. And you can see that we dropped out those categories. And now we have the make, model, year, uh, and so forth. Um, and we took out the engine fuel type, market category, etc. Uh, and this should look familiar to you now. When you start working with pandas, I just love pandas for this reason. Look how easy it is. It just displays it as a nice um, uh, spreadsheet for you. You can just look at it and view it very easily. Uh, it's also the same kind of view you're going to get if you're working in Spark or PySpark, uh, which is Python for Spark across big data. This is the kind of thing that they, they come up with, and this is why pandas is so powerful. And we may look at this and decide we don't like these columns. And so you can go in here and we can actually rename the columns. Simple command car equals car rename. Uh, columns equals engine horsepower equals horsepower. 
this is just your standard Python dictionary. Um, so it just maps them out. And, you know, instead of having like a lengthy, if it, here we had um, engine horsepower, we just want horsepower. We don't need to know it's the engine horsepower. Engine cylinders, we don't need to know that it's for the engine because there's only one thing we're describing if we're talking about cars, and that's cylinders. Uh, and we'll go ahead and just run this. And again, here's our car head, and you can see how that changed. We have model year and horsepower versus model year, engine horsepower, engine cylinders, and just cylinders. Again, we want to keep reducing this so it's more and more readable. The more readable you get it, the better. Um, and of course, we can also adjust the size a little bit so that when it prints out, uh, instead of splitting it on two lines, we get like a single line. We can do that also. That's just your control mouse up or plus sign you use in uh, Chrome. That's a Chrome command. And if you remember from NumPy, we had shape. Well, Pandas works the same way. Uh, we can look at the shape of the data. So we now have um, 11,914 rows and 10 columns. Uh, so you see some similarities because Pandas is built on NumPy. And questions that come up just like you did in NumPy, we might want to know duplicate rows. And so we can do car. And look at this switch here. Um, we're doing a selection. This is a pandas selection with the brackets. But we want to select it based on car.duplicated. So how many duplicates on there? So it's starting to look a little bit different as far as how we access some of the data on here. This can be a logical statement. And we get the number of duplicate rows. We have 989 rows by 10 columns again. And this is one of those troubleshooting things that we end up doing uh, a lot, more than we really feel like we should. Uh, we might go ahead and do like a car count uh, just to see how many rows we're dealing with. And then right after that, we might want to go ahead and say, hey, um, let's drop duplicates. So remember, we did all the duplicates on there. So car equals car dot drop duplicates. And then we can print the head again. We'll just do car head here. And you can see the data on there um, looks the same as before. Uh, and just note that we did car equals car dot duplicates. There are commands in here where you can do where it changes the actual value. And it works on some of them and not on others, depending on what you're doing. But by default, it always returns a copy. So when we do this, we're reassigning it to car. And you can see it's the same header, but we want to go ahead and do count and see how the count changes. Let's go ahead and run this. And you can see here, instead of 11,914, we have 10,925. Uh, so we've removed eh, about 100 cars <laughs> that were duplicated, just slightly under 100 there. And then as we're prepping our data, we might want to know um, car is null. Uh, so it's going to count the values of null, and then we want to sum that up. And when we do that, uh, we do the car is null function dot sum. Uh, we end up with uh, HP, the horsepower 69 have null values and 30 have uh, cylinders have null values. Now, if you don't put the sum at the end, it's just going to return a uh, mask with the true false of is it null or is it not? By uh, in the zero and one. So you're summing up the ones underneath each column. And this, of course, uh, then you have to decide what you're going to do with the uh, <laughs> null values. There's a lot of different options. It might be that you need to put in the average or means. Uh, maybe you want to put in the median value. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to fill it. Usually when you first start out with the data, a lot of them you just drop your null values. And you can see here car.dropNA, which is equal to all. And then we're going to go ahead and count it. And you can see that we've dropped almost another 100 values. So from 10, 9, 25 to 10, 8, 27. Yeah, maybe 75 or so values. Uh, so we've cleaned that this is really a big part of cleaning data. You need to know how to get rid of your null values or at least count them and what to do with them. And of course, if we go back to um, uh, counting our null values, we should now have uh, null null values. There we go. And you'll see there's zero null values. I don't know how many times I've been running a model that doesn't take null values and it crashes and I just sit there and look at it trying to get why did that crash it should have worked uh, it's because I forgot to remove the null values so we've been jumping around a lot we're going to go back to uh, finding outliers and let's go ahead and bring that back into our seaborn and if you remember we did a box plot earlier uh, this time we're going to do a box plot just on the price 
And you can see here um, our price value, and we have the deviation with the two thinner bars on each side of the main value. And then as we get up here, we have all these outliers. Uh, in fact, we have one way out here that's um, probably a really expensive high-end car is what we're looking at. If you were doing um, fraud analysis, you would be jumping on all over these outliers. Why are these deviation from the standard? What are these people doing? Again, this is probably, like I said, a really high-end expensive car out here. That's what we're looking at. And we can also look at the um, box plot for, for the horsepower. We'll put that in down here and run that. And you can see again, here's our horsepower and it just jumps and there's these really odd, huge muscle cars out here that are outliers. And we're gonna jump into making this a little bit more, um, as you start displaying your data or your information to your shareholders, uh, we're gonna look at plotting a histogram for the number of cars per brand. And the first thing we wanna go ahead and do is we have with our car, let me go back over here, here we go. Uh, we have our make value counts, largest plot, um, and we wanna do a kind equals bar, uh, fig size 10.5. And right off the bat, we jump up here and we see Chevrolet, it's going against, what was it, it's um, figure recession, the value counts, and we want the largest value. So here's our value counts in compared to what the different cars are. Chevrolet puts out a lot of different kinds of cars. I didn't realize that they made that many cars <laughs> or different types. And then for readability, uh, let's go ahead and add a title, number of cars by make, number of cars and make. If you had looked at this the first time, you would have been like, well, what the heck am I looking at? Well, we're looking at the number of cars by make. And then you can see here, now we're talking about the type of cars and the different uh, ones were put out. Lotus, I guess, only had a few different kinds of cars over there. Very high-end cars. And then as uh, doing data analytics and as a data scientist, one of the things I am most interested in is the relationship between the variables. Uh, so this is always a place to start. We wanna know what's going on with our variables and how they connect with each other. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and set a figure size because we wanna make sure it fits our graph. Um, we'll just go ahead and set this one, uh, plot figure set to figure size 2010. If you never use the matplot library, which is sitting behind Seaborn, uh, whatever is in the PLT, this is what's loaded. It's like a canvas you're painting on. So the second you load that uh, pie plot as PLT, anything you do to that is affecting everything on it. Uh, and then we want to go ahead, uh, since we're using Seaborn, we'll go ahead and create a variable C for uh, relationships or correspondence and car dot C-O-R-R, -R. that's a correlation in uh, Seaborn on top of Pandas. Again, one line and you get the whole correlation on there. And because we're working with Seaborn, let's put it into a nice heat map. If you're not familiar with heat maps, that means we're just using color as part of our um, uh, setup. So we have a nice visual. And we can see here that the uh, Seaborn connected to the Pandas prints out a nice chart We'll talk a little bit about the color here in a second. It prints out a nice chart. This is a chart I look at. As a data scientist, these are the numbers I want to look at. Uh, and we'll just highlight one of them. Um, here's cylinders versus horsepower. The closer to one, the higher the correlation. So 0.788. Pretty high correlation between the number of cylinders and how heavy the horsepower is. I'm betting if you looked at uh, the year versus uh, horsepower, um, we just look at that one. Here's year and horsepower. 0.314, not as so much, but if you combine them, uh, you don't actually add them. But if you combine them, you'll start to see an increase in horsepower per year and cylinders. You could probably get a correlation there. And just like 0.78 is a positive correlation, uh, you might notice if we look at cylinders and, or let's look at horsepower and mileage. Uh, so if we go here to horsepower to mileage, you get a nice um, negative. We'll do cylinders, that's a bigger number. With cylinders to the miles per gallon, it's a minus 0.6. So it's a negative correlation. The closer to minus one, the more the negative correlation is. And then the chart you would actually show people is a nice heat map. This is all our colors, and it's just those numbers put into a heat map. The darker the color, the higher the correlation. You can see straight down the middle, um, obviously the year correlates directly with the year, horsepower with horsepower, and so on. 
That's why it's a 1. The closer to the 1, the higher the uh, correlation between the two pieces of data. Now, this is uh, a good introduction. Uh, pandas goes way beyond this. Most of the functionality in NumPy, since pandas sits on it, is also in pandas, and then it even has additional features in it. And we use Seaborn pretty extensively sitting on top over our PyPlot. Uh, so keep in mind that our uh, PyPlot has a ton of other features in it that we didn't even touch on in here. Uh, we couldn't, even if you had a sole course in it, uh, there's just so many things hidden in there, depending on what your domain you're working on. Uh, but you can see here, here's our Seaborn, and here's our matplot library. That's all our graphics that we did. And then the Seaborn works really nicely with the pandas. Uh, we really like that. What is time series forecasting? Making scientific projection based on the data with historical timestamps is known as time series forecasting. It entails creating model through historical study, using them to draw a conclusion and guide strategic decision making in the future. The fact that the future result is wholly unknown at the time of the task and can only be anticipated through analysis and evidence-based priors is an essential distinction in forecasting. Give yourself a chance to simply run professional certificate program in AI and machine learning, which comes with completion certificate and in-depth knowledge of AI and machine learning. Check this course detail from the description box below. So here is one question for you guys. I will give you exactly one minute for this. You can comment or you can give your answer in the chat section so I can see if the answers given by you are right or wrong. Okay. So the question is, which type of programming does Python support? I'm repeating again. Which type of programming does Python support? Option A, object oriented programming. Option B, structured programming. Option C, functional programming. And option D, all of the above. So let us know in your answer in the chat section or in the comment section. So I'm starting a timer of one minute. Just type your answer in the comment section or in the chat section. Do let me know your answers, please. So I'm starting the timer of one minute. Which type of programming does Python support? Object oriented, structured programming, functional or all of the above. Do let me know your answers, please. You can comment or you can give your answer in the chat section so I can see if the answers given by you are right or wrong. Which type of programming does Python support? Object oriented, structured, functional or all of the above? 30 seconds remaining. Which type of programming does Python support? Object oriented, structured, function or all of the above? Let us know your answers in the chat section or in the comment section below. 10 seconds more. Which type of programming does Python support? 5 seconds more. So the allotted time is over. We will give a reply to those who gave the correct answer. And for those who didn't give the correct answer, we will give you reply with the correct answer. Okay. Now let's move to our programming part. So we will open command prompt to write a command to open Jupyter Notebook. So here I will write Jupyter Notebook. Press, okay, Jupyter Notebook. Press enter. We take time. It's open. So this is the landing page of Jupyter Notebook and here I will select new Python kernel file. So this is how Jupyter kernel look likes. So here what we will do, we will import some major libraries of Python which will help us in analyzing the data. Okay, import numpy as np. Okay then import pandas as pd then import seaborn as sns the fourth one is from matplotlib port 
pi plot as plt okay then we will import some model libraries so here i will write from stats models dot tsa dot api import exponential smoothing and comma then simple xp smoothing then one more hold we will write here import sorry from sklearn dot linear underscore model import linear regression okay then import warnings warnings then we will write here warnings dot filter warnings it should be ignore yes there will be no error oh it's still loading yeah so numpy numpy is a python library used for working with arrays it also has a function for working with the domain of linear algebra and matrices it is an open source project and you can use it freely. NumPy stands for numerical Python. Second is Panda. Pandas is a software library written for the Python programming language for data manipulation and analysis. In particular, it offers data structure and operations for manipulating numerical data and time series. Then Seaborn. An open source Python library based on Matplotlib is called Seaborn. It is utilized for data exploration and data visualization with data frames and the pandas library seaborn function with ease matplotlib for python and its numerical extension numpy matplotlib is a cross platform data visualization and graphical charting package as a result it presents a strong open source substitute for matplotlib the apis for matplotlib allow programmers to incorporate graphs into gui applications Linear regression, the machine learning method re regression built on linear supervised learning. Analysis regression is done. Regression creates a value for the aim prediction using independent variables as inputs. Its main goal is to investigate the relationship between factors and forecasting. Exponential smoothing. The exponential windows function is a general method for smoothing time series data known as exponential smoothing. It contrasts to the ordinary moving average, which weights previous data quality. Exponential function use weights that decrease exponentially with time. And there is one more simple exponential smoothing. The simple exponential smoothing classes use simple exponential smoothing models to give very simple time series analysis. A weight average of the most recent value and the preceding smooth value constitute the predicted value. The contribution of older value degrade exponentially as a result of the smoothing parameter. Okay, so after importing libraries, let's import data set. For this, we, I will write here df or you can write data frame pd dot read underscore csv. Here I will write monthly underscore csv dot csv okay this is my file name you can download this file from the description box below and for seeing the data i will write here df dot head okay then press enter yeah 
So here PD is for Pandas library. Read is used for reading the data set from the machine. And CSV is used for the type of file which you are using. Okay. Or which you are want to read. And if you want to see the top five rows of your data set, you can use head. And if you want to see the last five rows of your data set, you can use tail instead of head. Okay. This one you can write here tail. So moving forward, let's see how many rows and columns are present in our data set. For that, I have to write df dot shape. Okay. Then press enter. Okay. It will give error. Why? Because this. Yeah. So here you can see 847 rows and two columns, date and price only. So moving forward, let's do some EDA, exploratory data analysis. Okay. For that, I have to write here print data date range of of gold prices available from And here I have to give curly brackets then df dot location loc then colon comma date okay d is capital here so I have to write date then from location zero to Again, same thing df dot loc date to the length of df minus one. Oh, everything seems good. Yeah. Then press enter. Okay. We have date range of gold prices available from this 1950 to 2020. Okay. In our data set. Then here I will write date equals to PD dot date range start from slash one slash nineteen fifty comma and equals to eight slash one slash twenty twenty comma frequency was to median okay then then here I will write date then press enter yeah so here you can see date time index okay from starting till end these dot dots and here I will write df month was to date we have dot drop is date comma axis is one comma in place was to true t should be capital Then df equals to df dot set index and month and df dot head let's enter 
So instead of this date, we have adjusted this month. Okay, for particular value. So moving forward, let's see the graph. Different different graphs. Okay, we have dot plot. Then figure set should be equals to twenty comma eight. Then plot dot title is like gold prices monthly since nineteen fifty and onwards. Okay, title should be this then x label should be plt dot x label will be months then plt dot y labels should be price then i will write here plt dot grid press enter okay title spelling my bad t-i-t-l-e okay then press enter so why label it is sorry yeah so here you can see gold prices monthly since 1950 and onwards okay till from 1950 and from till 2020 Okay, this is the price. Then moving forward, let's see another graph. So I will write here for that round df dot describe comma three. And here you can see the count variable and the average is four sixteen point five five seven standard deviation. That minimum price value is this. 20% this and the maximum value is this okay so <clears throat> so the average gold price in last 70 years is this 416.557 okay only 25% of the time the gold price is above 447 The highest gold price ever touched is this one, 840807. So we will do visual analysis. So here I will write AX equals to PLT dot subplots subplots. Okay. Then figure size equals to 25 comma art okay then sns dot box plot is x equals to df dot index dot year comma y equals to df dot values colon comma zero comma ax equals to ax okay then same plt dot title whole price monthly 1950 same graph will come but in the different format okay let me remove this then plt dot x label 
table must be here plt dot y label ice and plt dot x ticks will be rotation was to okay i will give rotation 90 plt dot grid you can write here instead of grid i can write here directly show so grid is this, this format this box format okay so press enter it's loading yeah so here you can see from 1950 every year is here till 2020 so how the gold prices are decreasing and increasing okay let's see the another graph i will write here from x models models dot graphics dot tsa plots port month plot okay then i will write here figure comma ax equals to then plt dot subplots figure size equals to 22 comma 8 okay then month plot f comma y label equals to gold price comma then ax equals to ax and i will give the title plt dot title so i will copy from here okay. and plt dot X label month and PLT dot Y label the price PLT dot grid. So here you can see gold prices monthly since 1950 like for every month like january february march april so on till december okay we will cover one more graph okay and many many more graphs so so we will go with the next graph for that I will write here let's go comma ax equals to plt dot subplots then figure size equals to 22 comma 8 And same SNS dot box plot x equals to df dot index dot month name. Okay, then y equals to df dot values. comma zero comma ax 
equals to ax okay then plt dot title will put same title so i can copy from it here let's copy from here and paste it here okay and plt dot x label and plt dot y label price and plt dot grid okay plt dot show this time let's not use grid okay okay something pds month name yes you can see for every month this is another type of graph okay box plot graph so why we are creating so much graphs because we are doing eda exploratory data analysis in this we have to see the multiple different and different different types of graph okay so moving forward let's see average gold price per year like trend since 1950 so for that i have to write here df let's go yearly let's go sum was to df dot resample sample then a dot mean df underscore yearly underscore sum dot plot plt dot title and here i will write average gold price yearly since 1950 or you can write onwards from onwards 1950 so here i will write plt dot x label year and plt dot y label ice okay then plt dot grid this time we'll use grid so here you can see the average gold price yearly since 1950 okay this is the chart till 2020 like sometimes up sometimes down okay then we will see now like average gold price per quarter like trends uh, like since 1950 so here i will write df dot not dot df dot quarterly okay underscore sum equals to df dot resample quarter q dot mean Yeah. move this then df underscore quarterly score sum dot plot then the same plt dot title from here Here I will write average good price quarterly. 
quarterly okay since 1950 then plt dot x label label is now here quarter plt dot y label is price Now plt dot show it this time. Okay. Pf underscore quarterly. Okay, quarterly. Yeah. So here you can see the price prediction. Okay, let me set to the grid only. It's not this. Results are not good, so great. Yeah, so here you can see the quarterly prices prediction. Okay, average gold price quarterly prediction. So, like moving forward, we will see now average gold price per decade, like per 10 years. Okay, so from 1950 only. So, here I will write DF underscore decade underscore sum equals to df dot resample every 10 year okay 10 year okay. dot mean we are writing mean because we are like putting out average okay so df underscore decade underscore sum dot plot plt dot title average goal price per decade since 1950 okay since 1950 yeah perfect so here i will get plt dot x label then decade decade is off like every 10 year plt dot y label plt dot grid yeah so here you can see the average gold price per decade like from 1950 to 1960 like this straight then again straight then up then sometimes down then up and down okay every 10 year you can see a 1990 2000 2010 and 2020 so moving forward let's do like analysis in coefficient of variation the coefficient of variation CV is a statical measure of the relative dispersion of data points in a data series around the mean. And in finance, the coefficient of variation allows investors to determine how much volatility or risk is assumed in comparison of the amount, like amount to the return expected from investors. Okay, the lower the ratio of the standard deviation to mean return, the better risk return trade off. Okay, let's like let us look now the CV values for each year in gold prices. So CV means coefficient of variation in prices. Okay. So here I will write DF underscore one equals to DF dot group by DF dot index dot year dot mean dot name dot columns equals to relevant price and mean 
then again df underscore one equals to df underscore one dot range or oh, what we can do instead of range we can write merge df dot group by scope df dot index dot eo oh, in the deviation rename columns equals to ice then the deviation comma left index was to true then comma right index was to true And here df underscore one school equals to df underscore one under division slash df underscore one. Hundred, like dot round figure should be like two after decimal how much like numbers you want to see then df underscore one dot head press enter yeah so here you can see for every year I have mean standard deviation and that's coefficient of variation okay for every year so like moving forward let's see the average gold price per year again so for that figure underscore figure dot comma AX equals to PLT dot subplot figure size fifteen comma ten. Then I will write here df underscore one is like cov underscore dot plot plt dot title average goal price yearly since. 1950 okay then plt dot x label is here or plt dot y label y label coefficient of variation i'm writing cv in percent okay then plt dot show get df underscore invalid syntax okay what i see oec scott ect 
the dot plot okay so df underscore one df underscore one here let syntax okay so here you can see average gold price since 1950 okay this is like percentage CV in percent okay like good you can say the chart so the CV value reached its highest in 1978 like somewhere here like 1980 1978 okay like near to 25% which could have made the asset as a highly risky but in 2020 the CV value is closer to 5% which makes the asset variable via good investment okay so now what we will do we will do time series forecasting okay we will train model we will build model different different model we will train and test split to build time series forecasting model so for that let me do like this first yeah so here I will write train was to df df dot index dot per year okay equals to 2015 and for the testing we will write df df dot index dot year 2015 okay for training we are taking till 2015 for and for the testing we are taking till 2020 from 2015 okay then I will write here how many columns present in train or test so for that I will write print train dot shape print test dot ship press enter 792 rows and one column in train training for training the model and 55 to test the model okay so now let's see the training data and testing data so train is like square brackets so price dot plot then figure size equals to 13 comma 5 and font size should be equals to 15 and test Ice dot plot figure size figure size let me give same thirteen comma five font size should be Okay, then plt dot let me add grid plt dot grid then plt dot legend training data comma test data okay then plt or show i will tell you what the legend is okay
So here you can see the training data in blue and the testing data. Okay, this is known as the legend, this this portion. And yeah, so here you can see month wise. Okay, till 2020 and from 1950. Right, these are the prices. And this is the chart. So moving forward, let's do model formation now. Okay, we will do two models linear uh, linear regression and the nave base one okay so uh, first we are first we will go from linear regression for that i will write train underscore time plus two i plus one one for i in range train test underscore time equals to i plus length like train one for i in range then length should be test okay so for length training time from our length should be tested present okay this is the training and this for the testing 792 rows and here 55 rows in testing so LR underscore LR means linear regression. Let me make it capital. Train equals to we make a copy LR underscore test equals to test copy dot copy. Then LR, okay. So LR, uh, train, time, equals to train time. And LR underscore test time equals to test time. Okay, underscore is this. Yeah. So here I will write LR equals to linear. Regression dot fit to the model was LR train and for the time LR LR underscore train. Price values linear regression is not defined. Okay, my bad. L should be capital. Yeah, so now see the graph. So test underscore prediction score model. One equals to LR dot predict LR underscore test
time lar underscore test first was to test underscore predictions score model one okay let's create the graph figure figure size should be so 14 comma 6 PLT dot plot rain price comma label should be train okay then plot PLT dot plot test ice label equals to test plt dot plot then lr train or tests forecast or label equals to regression on time okay regression on time Then again, plt dot legend plus equals to best plt dot grid. That's it. Okay, you have to write grid. Loading one more error. Price. price okay is price so here you can see regression on time test data is this green one and this training data and the testing data okay let's find the map now so for this We'll write here DEF MAP actual comma prediction then return count P dot mean ABS actual prediction jewel i hundred comma two okay forgot to give the So, for for getting the map, you have to write here map underscore model. Let's go test equals to map test price dot values comma test underscore fiction score model one okay then print yep. 
is percent three dot three f then here I prep percent ape model one underscore test comma percentage Press enter. Next. Okay. Well, is not defined. Map test. Model model one test. Map test. Values the test predictions model one okay here a is small so map here you can see. 29.760 so you are a bit confused like what is MAPE? MAPE is a measure of prediction of accuracy of a forecasting method in a statical model okay is a measure of prediction accuracy of forecasting method in a statical method okay. and now Results equals to PD dot data frame test map in percent map underscore model one comma index equals to regression on time okay then i will print the results okay d should be capital but will pandas has no attribute data frame Model one is not defined. Let's go. Test. Well, it's in there. Perhaps you got a forget a comma. Colon. model one okay here you can see the test map regression on time so let's do with the name now we have to perform the same pattern so what i will do what i, I will write the code and get back to you okay so i'm done with the code uh, so here you can see i have same pattern train and test copy and this is the name forecast on the test data so this is the line and this is the training and this orange one is testing the same we have got map like 19.380 okay so and regression is this the name model so what we will do we will create now final model of ours okay We will forecast final forecasting. We'll do
for that i have to write final model equals to exponential smoothing okay df comma and equals to iterative comma seasonal equals to additive comma fit smoothing level equals to zero point four comma smoothing trend equals to zero point three comma smoothing seasonal equals to zero point six okay press enter exponential exponential so map go final underscore model is equals to map like df size dot values comma final let's go model dot fitted values okay. then print map comma map final underscore model okay so map is 17.24 which is quite good for the final model okay so getting the prediction for the same number of time stamps at the present time in the test data so i will write here predictions predictions equals to final underscore model dot forecast steps equals to length dot test center now we will compute 95 percent of confidence interval for the predicted value so it's a tkf equals to pd dot data frames Then lower CI prediction one point nine six into NP dot standard deviation of final model dot one okay and comma right here prediction Okay, then upper CI prediction plus one point nine six into dot standard deviation the same final model dot to one okay 
then prediction underscore df dot at okay so this is lower ci prediction and the upper ci okay how much it will forecast or now at the end at the final state what we will do we will plot a graph okay forecast graph along with the confidence band so for that x is equals to df dot plot label equals to actual comma figure size 16 comma 9 prediction df dot plot ax equals to this comma label underscore df it's lower ci what i will do instead of this label equals to forecast comma alpha equals to 0 0.5 okay this dot fill between chain underscore df dot index comma prediction underscore df lower underscore ci comma prediction underscore df this ci okay. then color equals to m comma alpha equals to 0.15 okay then axis dot set underscore x label year month okay. axis dot set y label it's plt dot legend should be location equals to best then plt dot grid plt dot show okay this is plt only then press enter okay 16 comma 9 positional argument follows keyword argument right 15 uh -oh. Okay, okay. I have to give you upper CI. Okay. Right, upper CI. So here you can see our final model forecasting. So till twenty twenty it is showing like normal, and after that till twenty thirty. Okay this will be the forecast as per the data okay so here you can see here you can see we have the map is 17.24 okay then here i did the prediction for the testing data and here i've created the data frames these are the data frames lower ci prediction and upper ci and then I have created the and then I have 
created the final graph of the forecasting okay so i hope you guys must have understood like how you can do time series forecasting using machine learning or python like if you have any queries you can ask in the comment section our team will respond you as soon as possible or if you want this full code this full code just comment down for the same and you can download the data set from the description box below and don't forget to check the course link from the description box below in this video we are going to perform a really interesting data analysis using python on the spotify music streaming service platform data set i'll also be asking you a few questions related to spotify during our discussion please make sure to answer them in the comment section of the video so now let's get started spotify is a swedish audio streaming and media services provider founded in april 2006 it is the world's largest music streaming service provider and has over 381 million monthly active users which also includes 172 million paid subscribers the total number of downloads on the spotify app in the android store exceeded 1 billion in may 2021 so millions of people listen to music all day even i am hooked to music as an analyst what's better than exploring and quantifying data about music and drawing valuable insights before i move ahead i have a quiz question for you people the name Spotify comes from a combination of two words. So which are those two words? Please let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. I would like to repeat the question again. The name Spotify comes from a combination of two words. So what are those two words? We would love to hear from you. So please put your answers in the comment section below. Now let's use Python libraries and functions to analyze and visualize our data set. First, I'll show you the two data sets that we'll be using. So here is the first data set that we'll be using for our demo. And then I have my second data set called Spotify features, which is essentially about the genres of the different soundtracks. Now these data sets have been downloaded from kegel.com. Now the links to the data sets have been provided in the description box. Please go ahead and download them. Now let me just go ahead and brief you about the columns that are present in our first data set which is about tracks we have our column a which is id this is the unique id for each of the songs then we have the name column which is essentially the name of the song then we have a column for popularity so the popularity ranges from 0 to 100 then we have duration in milliseconds this is the duration of the track in milliseconds Next, we have a column called explicit. Now, we are not bothered about this column because we are not going to use it in our analysis. Then we have artist. So, the name of the artist who has composed or sung the song. Then we have ID of the artist. Then we have a column for release date, which is basically the date on which the song was released. Then we have a column for danceability. So this describes how suitable a track is for dancing based on a combination of musical elements such as tempo, rhythm stability, beat, strength and overall regularity. The value ranges between 0 and 1. Next we have a column for energy. So the energy is a measure between 0, 0.0 to 1.0 and represents a perceptual measure of intensity and activity. Typically the energetic tracks feel fast, loud and noisy. Higher the value, the more energetic is the song. Then we have a column for key. So key is the pitch. Notes or scale of song that forms the basis of a song. There are 12 keys ranging from 0 to 11. Moving ahead, we have loudness. So the overall loudness of the track in decibels, it ranges from minus 60 to 0 decibels. Then we have mode. So songs can be classified as major and minor. 1.0 represents major or 1 represents major and 0 represents minor. Next we have speechiness. So speechiness recognizes the presence of spoken words in a track. More exclusive speech like the recording example talk show, audiobook or poetry the closer to 1.0 the attribute value. Then we have a column for acousticness. 
So a confidence measure of 0 to 1 of whether the track is acoustic or not. So 1.0 represents high confidence the track is acoustic. Then we have other information about instrumentalness. Then we also have a column for liveness. So liveness detects the presence of an audience in the recording. Then we have a column for valence. So valence is a measure between 0.0, .0 to 1.0 and describes the musical positiveness conveyed by a track or a song. And finally we have the columns for tempo and time signature. Now even in the second data set we have almost the same columns just that we have an additional column that is about the genre of the songs present in the data set. Cool. Now let's head over to our Jupyter notebook and we'll start with our analysis. Okay so one more thing to remember our data has information from 1922 onwards so all the songs from 1922 till 2021. Cool. Okay, so I am on my Jupyter Notebook. So you can see I have a few cells that have already been filled up. So we'll start with our analysis. First of all, let's go ahead and import the necessary libraries. So I'm importing NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib and Seaborn for my analysis and visualization. I'll hit Shift Enter to import the libraries. All right. And in the next cell, I'm going to load my data set using the pandas read underscore csv function. I have my location already put here. Let me show you the location where the data files or the data sets are located. So this is my location under Chrome downloads. I have a folder called Spotify data sets. Okay. So let's import and check the first five rows in the data set. So for that I have used the head function, there you go. So here you can see I have my first five rows of information from the data set and on the top you can see the different columns. You have ID, name, popularity, artist, then we have the release date, danceability, energy, key, loudness, liveliness or liveness, balance, tempo and other information. Cool. Now let's check for null values in the data set. I'll just give a comment as null values. Every time when you download a data set from an open repository, there are chances that the data set would contain null values. So it's better to check them beforehand. So I'm going to use the is null function present in the pandas library. PD I'm using because I had imported pandas as PD. So pd dot is null. Then I'm going to use the variable name df underscore tracks because I imported my data set and stored it in the variable df underscore tracks. So I have my data frame under df underscore tracks variable. And then I'll use the sum function to check the total number of null values present in the data set for each of the columns. If I run it, there you go. So here you can see my name column has 71 missing values or null values and we don't have any null values for the rest of the columns. Okay. Now let's use the info method that will give us the total number of rows and columns in the data set and we'll also check the data types and the memory usage. So I'll say my data frame name that is df underscore tracks dot info. If I run it. You can see here, now if you mark, there are total 5,86,601 names or the names of the songs present in the data set while the rest all have 5,86,672. So clearly there are total 71 song names or soundtracks missing from our data set. And below you can see the data types we have float integer and object and then you can see the memory usage cool now before i move ahead with our next analysis i have another question for you which artist or musician has the most number of followers on spotify i repeat which artist or musician has the most number of followers on spotify please put your answers in the comment section below 
we would be happy to hear from you now let's move ahead and do our first major analysis in this demo we are going to find the 10 least popular songs present in the spotify data set so i'll create a variable called sorted underscore df that will be equal to my data frame name that is df underscore tracks dot i'm going to use the sort underscore values function and say my column name is popularity so i'm going to sort the values based on the popularity and then say ascending equal to true since i want only the least popular songs and then i'm going to say head of 10 which means i want the top 10 least popular songs now let's go ahead and print sorted underscore dia if i run it you can see we have the list of 10 least popular songs on spotify you can see the popularity is zero and you can see the names of the songs some of them are songs which are not in english language and you can see the artist names as well cool now moving ahead let's see some descriptive statistics for the numerical variables that are present in our column so i'll say df underscore tracks dot describe which is the function to get some descriptive statistics and i'm going to use the transpose function after that if i run it there you go so we have the statistics about count mean standard deviation minimum value 25th percentile 50th percentile 75th percentile and the maximum value for these columns like popularity duration in milliseconds then we have energy key loudness mode cool now if you see this popularity column the minimum value is zero and the maximum value is 100 and you can see the 50th percentile is 27 which is essentially the median you have the standard deviation as 18.37 then similarly you can check for the other features as well cool now we'll see the 10 most popular songs which are greater than 90 so we are going to check for the top 10 songs with popularity greater than 90 let me show you how to do it so in this cell i am going to create a new variable called most popular and i'll say df underscore tracks dot this time i'm going to use the query function that is part of pandas library again i'll use the column that is popularity and we'll set the condition popularity should be greater than 90 i'll give a comma and say in place equal to false because i don't want to change my original data frame and then i'll say sort underscore values and i'm going to sort it based on popularity in descending order so i'll say ascending equal to false and then let's take only the top 10 popular songs so i'll say most popular use square brackets use square brackets and we'll then pass the slicing operator and say colon 10 now if i run this there you go so here you can see the 10 most popular songs that is present in our spotify data set so first we have features by justin bieber daniel cesar and Gibbon. then we also have a song name called driver's license astronaut in the ocean save your tears you also have the business streets and heartbreak anniversary so these are the most popular songs that are present in our data set 
based on the popularity you can see peaches has the highest popularity with 100 all right now moving to the next cell so here we are going to set the index to be release date column in the main data frame so i am setting my index using the set underscore index function i have passed in my column name as release date and i am saying in place equal to true which means i want to change it in my original data frame and then i am changing the value to date time format and let's print the head of the data set so you can see here we have successfully changed our index now here you can see instead of 0 1 2 3 we have the release date column and the rest of the columns are intact cool now let's move ahead so suppose you want to check the artist at the 18th row in our data set you can use the index location method for that let me show you how to filter only specific rows of information from the data set I'll use my data frame df underscore tracks and using double square brackets I'll say my column name which is artist and I'll use the index location method and say let's say I want to check the artist who is present in the 18th row in my data set so I'll use iloc18 if I run it the artist name is Victor Boucher cool now let's move ahead we are going to convert the duration in milliseconds to just seconds so if you see our data set we have a column called duration in milliseconds so all our songs are present in milliseconds let's convert them into just seconds so for that i'm using the lambda function and dividing the values in milliseconds by thousand so that they get converted into just seconds i have used in place equal to true so i want to change it in my original data frame let's run it and do the necessary changes all right now we'll print the head of the data set just to check the duration column so i'll say df underscore tracks dot duration dot head if i run it there you go so you can see the values have now been changed to just seconds cool i have the final quiz question for you who has the most monthly listeners on spotify please put your answers in the comment section below we would be glad to hear from you now coming to the next cell so here we are going to create a first visualization that is going to be a correlation map we are going to drop three unwanted columns and those are key mode and explicit and then we are going to apply pearson correlation method now i have set my figure size to 14 comma 6 and then we are using the seaborn heat map function to create our correlation map i have put the variable that is correlation underscore df you can see above we had created this and then i am setting annotation equal to true so this will write the data value in each cell i have set fmt equal to dot 1g so this is a string formatting code to use when adding annotations then i have set my vmin and vmax so these are the values to anchor the color map otherwise they are inferred from the data and other keyword arguments cmap here stands for color map you can just search for sns cmap you will get the documentation so you can choose whichever color palette or the color map you want here i have used inferno and i have set my line widths and line color finally i am giving a title to my correlation map and i have set the x tick labels let's go ahead and run this to get our first visualization if i scroll down there you go we have got a nice correlation map so here on the right side you can see the scale it ranges from minus one to plus one minus one means the variables have 
least or negative correlation while the values which are above 0, 0.0 means that the variables have a positive correlation now here you can see there are values like minus 0 0.7 for energy and acousticness which means if the energy is high the acousticness is really low again for loudness and say speechiness if the song is loud the speechiness is low so there is negative correlation but if you see for energy and loudness there is really high correlation between these two variables you can see the value is 0 0.8 so if the song is loud this implies the song has really high energy and vice versa now if you see for a few other variables there is negative correlation between acousticness and danceability there is negative correlation again between valence and acousticness similarly there is positive correlation between energy and valence which is 0.4 and even for danceability and valence that is positive correlation which is 0.5 cool so from the correlation heat map you can note that acousticness appears to have a strong negative correlation with energy so if you see for acousticness and energy there is a strong negative correlation and there is a moderately strong positive relation between loudness and popularity so if you see for popularity and loudness the color is orange which means it lies in this positive region and there is also a moderately strong positive relation between danceability and valence so if you check for danceability and valence here there is a moderately strong positive correlation all right now let's move ahead we are going to sample our data and take just 0.4% of the total data and will create two regression plots using this data. So let me first sample my data. So I will create a sample data frame using my original data frame which is df underscore tracks and say sample. I am going to use the int function and say 0 0.004 multiplied by the length of my original data frame which is df underscore tracks all right now let's run this and we'll print the length of my sample data frame I run it you can see 0.4 percent of my total data set is 2346 rows cool now we are going to create a regression plot between loudness and energy now in our correlation map we saw there was a positive correlation between loudness and energy which was 0.8 let's plot it in the form of a regression line so i'll use plt dot figure i'll set my figure size equal to let's say 10 comma 6 i'll say sns dot regression plot so i'm using the function called reg plot and i'll use my data as sample underscore df give a comma and say in my y-axis i'll have my column loudness and in the x-axis we'll have energy i'll give a color to my data variable let's say the color is c then i'll set my title to loudness versus energy let's say correlation all right 
let's make sure everything is fine now we'll run and see our result there you go so you can see here clearly there is a very high positive correlation between loudness and energy on the y-axis we have loudness and on the x-axis we have energy and you can see all the data points or the songs are in one direction so if the energy increases the loudness of the song also increases and similarly if the loudness of the song decreases your energy of the song or the track also decreases so there is a very high positive correlation and you can see the regression line here it has gone and is increasing gradually cool now similarly i'll just copy this code and we are going to see another regression plot this time for two different features let's say we have popularity in the y axis so i'll say popularity and then in the x axis we have let's say acousticness i'll change the color to let's say b which stands for blue and will set the title to popularity versus i'll have a cause thickness correlation just scroll down and we'll run it to see the result there you go so i have the different points for the songs and here you can see the regression line is downwards which means if the acousticness of the song increases the popularity decreases and similarly if the popularity increases acousticness decreases you can see the downward trend of the regression line all right now in the next cell we are going to create a new column called year from our release date column and i have changed this to date time format let me just run it cool now after that we are going to create a distribution plot to visualize the total number of songs in each year since 1922 that is available on the spotify streaming app so i have used my seaborn library and dist plot function now one thing to remember you need to update your seaborn library to this version if you haven't done it so use this command pip install dash dash user seaborn and the version so here in the distribution plot we are going to plot a histogram so i have used kind equal to hist which stands for histogram let's run and see the result okay so here you can see i have my distribution plot so the plot tells us that the number of songs for each year in the data set according to their release date have increased in the recent year since music became more accessible to people globally with technological advancements so earlier you can see there were very few songs available in the 1920s later on the number of songs increased rapidly and now you can see we have a lot more songs available for people to listen cool now we are going to see the duration of songs over the years for that again we are going to create a bar plot so i'll first create a variable called total duration equal to df underscore tracks dot i'll use the duration column that we created with seconds and then i'm going to set my figure dimensions so i'll use figure underscore dims for dimensions equal to 18 comma 7 after that i'll have my figure axis defined so i'll use the matplotlib 
subplots function and I'll set the figure size equal to my figure dimensions and then I'll say figure equal to SNS dot I'll use the bar plot function and say my x-axis to be years my y-axis will be total duration or total underscore dr that we created here I'll set my axis equal to ax and then I'll set error width equal to false let's set the title for my plot as title equal to year versus duration and finally I'll say plt dot x ticks I'll rotate it by let's say 90 degrees all right let me just recheck once if everything is fine and then we'll go ahead and run it uh, my axis error width title okay let me just run it we'll see the result in a moment if i scroll down you can see we have the bar plot for the different years and the duration of the songs in seconds in the y-axis so earlier in the 1920s you can see the duration of the songs were less and later it increased around late 1930s and this remained consistent until 2010 where the duration was high but after 2010 you can see the duration of the songs have started decreasing now in the next cell i'm going to create a line plot to analyze the average duration of the songs over the years it is going to be similar to our bar plot just that now we are going to visualize it in terms of a line so i have my code ready you can see here i've used my seaborn library and the line plot function in the x-axis i have years and in the y-axis i have total duration i've set my title to year versus duration and i'm rotating my x labels by 60 degrees let's run it and we'll see the output there you go now if i scroll down you can see we have a nice line plot and on the x-axis you have the years and on the y-axis we have the duration we can see that the songs from 1920s to 1960s have comparatively shorter duration since most of the songs tended to be more singing based rather than instrument based after 1960s you can see the duration of the songs started increasing until i would say 2010 and in the present day the duration of the songs have started declining since the attention span of the average listener is also declining all right now let's move to our second data analysis project which is based on genres of the songs so i am importing my data set using the pandas read underscore csv function i have given my location and here i have my data set name followed by the extension of the type so this is a csv data set let's go ahead and run it okay now let's print the first five rows of the data set i have stored my data set in a data frame called df underscore genre i'll use the head function to get the first five rows of information i'll hit shift enter to run it there you go you can see here i have my genre column artist name track name track id popularity acousticness 
duration in milliseconds again and we have the rest of the other columns that we saw in our first data set just one thing to note here key is present in terms of c d e c minor f minor and not in terms of numbers between 0 to 11 now we'll see the duration of the songs for different genres for that i'm going to create a bar plot so i'll start with setting the title for my plot as duration of the songs in different genres I'll use the Seaborn library and I'll set my color palette to let's say rocket into a comma and say as cmap equal to true. This would be color palette. Now I'll say SNS dot bar plot in the y axis I'll have genre and in the x axis I'll have my duration column which is in milliseconds so duration underscore ms and then I pass my data frame using the data argument. So I'll say data equal to df dot genre. Next, we'll set the x labels. So I'll say plt dot x label. Let's say my x label is duration in milliseconds. And then I'll say plt dot y label as genres now let's go ahead and run this there you go so here you can see we have the different genres on the y-axis and on the x-axis you have the duration in milliseconds and if you see the graph for classical genre and for songs that belong to world genre the duration of the songs are more compared to other genres now if you check for children's music genre the duration is less or the least cool and finally we'll move to our last demo where we'll see the top five genres by popularity. So I'll say SNS dot set underscore style. I'll set my style to dark grid, which will be my background, and then I'll say PLT dot figure. I'll set my figure size to 10 comma 5 then I'll create a variable called famous since I want to take only the most popular songs based on the genre so I have created a variable called famous and I'll pass my data frame name that is df underscore genre and I'll sort the values based on my popularity column so i'll say popularity and i want to sort it in descending order so i'll say ascending equal to false and i'll take the first 10 values i'll tell you the reason why i'm taking the first 10 values and not 5 then I'll say SNS dot bar plot 
and in the y axis i'll have genre in the x axis we'll have popularity and i'll give a comma and using the data argument i'll say my data to be famous which is this variable that we created and then i'll set my title as top 5 genres by popularity all right now the reason why i took head of 10 is because there are a few genres which are repetitive so if you see this we have children's music appearing twice so hence we have taken 10 instead of 5 let me just go ahead and run it there you go so here if i scroll down you can see i have my top 5 genres based on the popularity so we have dance pop rap hip hop and reggaeton so these are the five genres which are most popular based on the data that we have collected from spotify so today we will perform some exploratory data analysis using python libraries to analyze visualize and draw insights from 2021 world happiness data before i begin make sure to subscribe to the simply learn channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update first let's understand what the world happiness report 2021 is all about the International Happiness Day is celebrated every year since 2013 on 20th of March to emphasize the importance of happiness in the daily lives of people. So the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network published the World Happiness Report on 19th of March 2021 that ranks the world's 149 countries on how happy the citizens perceive themselves to be based on various indicators. The happiness study ranks the countries on the basis of questions from the Gallup World Poll the results are then equated with other factors such as GDP, life expectancy, generosity, etc. This year, it focused on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and how people all over the world have managed to survive and prosper. So using this 2021 data, we will answer critical questions such as the top 10 most corrupt countries. We will plot a graph to understand how the happiness score is related to the freedom of making life choices. We'll look at the life expectancy of 10 happiest and 10 least happy nations. So these are a few examples, but we will explore more about the data in detail in our demo session. Let's get started. So first I'll show you the data set we'll be using in this demo. So this data has been collected from Kegel. Let me show you that. So this is the CSV data set that we have downloaded from Kegel.com. So you can see here World Happiness Report 2021. and we will share the dataset link in the description of the video. You can click on the link to download the dataset. Now we have information about 149 countries. You can see it here. Count is 149. Let me go to the top and I'll run through the columns that are there in this dataset. So the first column is the country name. So we have 149 different countries and then we have something called as regional indicator. We can call this as just the region. So you can see we have different regions. I've applied a filter. We have Central and Eastern Europe. Then we have Commonwealth of Independent States. So these include countries such as Russia. Then we have East Asia, Latin America and Caribbean. We also have South Asia, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Western Europe and other regions. I'll just cancel this. And then we have the happiness score column that has been sorted in descending order. So we have Finland, Denmark and Switzerland who are the top three happiest nations. Now if I scroll down, we have countries like Rwanda, Zimbabwe and Afghanistan which are the least three happy countries. Now there are a few columns that we won't be using in our analysis. So we will learn how to exclude those columns and keep only the relevant ones. So columns such as standard error of ladder score, then we have upper whiskers and lower whisker column. So we are going to ignore these columns. We are only concerned about the GDP column, which is this one. Then we have the 
social support or the social status column then we have the health life expectancy freedom to make life choices generosity and perceptions of corruption and there are a few other columns you can see to the right and these columns are not of our interest so we are going to ignore them now let's head over to our Jupyter notebook and we'll start by importing all the necessary libraries for analysis and data visualization okay so I'm on my Jupyter notebook so first step I'll just rename this notebook to let's say happiness report data analysis I'll click on rename all right now we'll start by importing our libraries so first library I'm going to import is numpy as np then I have import pandas as pd then I'll import two data visualization libraries seaborn and matplotlib so I'll say import seaborn as sns and then import matplotlib dot pyplot which is the module name as plt and I'll say percentage matplotlib inline okay now let me just go ahead and run this all right well now let's set the parameters that control the general style of the plots the style parameters control properties like the color of the background and whether a grid is enabled by default or not so for that I'll say SNS dot set underscore style I'll give it as dark grid next I'll say PLT dot RC params which stands for runtime configuration parameters I'm going to set my font size to let's say 15 then I'll say plt dot rc params now I'm going to set the figure size so I'll say figure dot fig size let's say 10 comma 7 next I just copy this paste it here now we are going to set the face color so I'll say figure dot face color I want to set it to peach color so I'm going to pass in my RGB values for peach I'm going to set it in terms of hex code so for peach the value is F F E 5 B and 4 now let me run it okay now it's time to load our data set so for that I'll create a variable called data and I'll use the pandas library followed by the read underscore CSV function because our data set that we saw is a CSV data set which is this one now inside the parenthesis I'll pass in the location of my data file so I have my data here world happiness report 2021 I'll just copy this location and will paste it here and make sure the location is within quotes and you need to change it to either forward slash or double backslash so here I'm using double backslash so let me just include one more backslash and then I'm going to pass in the file name which is 
world hyphen happiness hyphen report hyphen 2021 dot csv which is the extension of the file now let me run it all right now to display the first five rows of information you can use the head function so i'm writing data which is my variable that holds the data frame so data dot head there you go you can see here we have printed the first five rows from the data set you have the country name regional indicator happiness score then we have information about the gdp life expectancy generosity then we have corruption data and these are some of the columns that we are not bothered about so we are going to drop these columns from our analysis now we are going to do that so i'll create a variable called data columns which are of our interest so i am going to take only specific columns i need the country name so i have taken country name make sure the column names are within single quotes so i have my country name next i want the second column which is regional indicator I'll give a comma we also need the happiness score next i need the logged gdp per capita data so i'll take that column i'll say logged gdp per capita give a comma my next column would be social support give a comma here my next column would be health life expectancy so i'll write health life expectancy let's give another comma and we'll take the next column as well which is freedom to make life choices so i'll write that column name freedom to make life choices and finally we'll take the next two columns that is generosity and perceptions of corruption so within single quotes i'll say generosity give a comma and we're going to include the final column which is of our interest that is perceptions of corruption let me have a recheck to ensure that i have put the column names correctly otherwise it will throw an error now let me go ahead and run this cell i'll hit shift enter all right so we have successfully taken the columns that we'll be using for an analysis now i'm going to say data equal to data i'll pass in my new variable that is data underscore columns and i'm going to copy all the data so i'll say dot copy let's run it okay this should be data underscore columns all right now let's rename all these columns we'll make it more simpler and easy to understand so i'll say let's say my new variable is happy underscore df which stands for data frame equal to i'll say data dot we'll use the rename function and using a dictionary we will rename our columns so i have used a curly bracket i'm going to pass in my first column which is country name i'll just paste it here then i'm going to give a colon and again within single quotes i'll say country underscore name so this is going to be my new column name i'll give a comma we'll take the next column which is regional indicator i'll paste it here give a colon and the new column 
would be small r regional underscore indicator now similarly we will do this for all the remaining columns in the data set okay now i have renamed all my columns you can see it here let's run it now we are going to display the head of the data set again so i'll say happy underscore df dot head there you go so we have only those columns that are of our interest so i have the country name regional indicator happiness score gdp social support life expectancy freedom to make life choices then i have generosity and perceptions of corruption cool now we are going to check whether any of the columns have any null values so for that i'll say happy underscore df dot i'm going to use the is null function i'll give another dot and we are going to find the sum for each of the columns you can see from the data we do not have any null values in any of the columns in the data set it is all zero okay now let's get started with our first visualization that is we'll create a plot between happiness score and the gdp for different regions so for that i'll give a comment as plot between happiness and gdp i'll just scroll down cool first i'm going to set the rc parameters so i'll say plt dot rc params within square brackets i'm going to give my figure size so i'll say figure dot fig size equal to let's say my figure size is 15 comma 7 I'll set the title that is plt dot title of my plot to let's say plot between happiness score and GDP. Next I'm going to say SNS dot let's create a scatter plot. So I'll say sns dot scatter plot i'm going to define my x axis and the y axis for the plot let's say in the x axis we have my data frame happy underscore df dot this should be an underscore i'll say a column name as happiness underscore score give a comma and in the y axis we'll have my data frame name that is happy underscore df dot will have the gdp column that is logged underscore gdp underscore per underscore capita let's give a comma and we'll pass in hue for the color let's say for hue i'm going to use the regional column or the regional indicator column so i'll say happy underscore df dot regional underscore indicator and then i'm going to give the size of the dots as let's say 200 then i'll give a semicolon come to the next line i'll say plt dot let me just scroll down now we are going to define the legend so i'll say plt dot legend and in legend we'll have the location let's say i want to put the legend at upper left corner so i'll say loc which is for location equal to upper left give a comma and then say font size of my legend let's say be 10 
make sure this is within quotes then I'm going to pass my x-axis labels and the y-axis labels so I'll say plt dot x label let's say the x label is happiness score and my y label is GDP per capita so I'll say plt dot y label within single quotes I'll say GDP per capita uh, there's an error here this should be plot all right so I have written my code to create a scatter plot let's run it and see the result there is some error here okay this should be regional indicator and not indicatory there's a spelling mistake let's run it again all right so here you can see we have a nice scatter plot on the top you can see we have the title of the plot that is plot between happiness score and GDP on the x-axis we have the happiness score from 0 to 8 and above and on the y-axis you have the GDP per capita and if you see here in this region we have countries from Western Europe which have the highest happiness score and the GDP per capita is also the highest around this region you can see here which is for green and in the legend you can see green is for sub-saharan Africa so all these countries have low happiness score and even the GDP per capita is also low and if you see the countries for Latin America and Caribbean you see a lot of the values lie here so they are all within the range of 5.5 to 7 in happiness score and even the GDP per capita is more than 9 for most of them now even the happiness score is high for the countries that lie in the North America and ANZ region and even that GDP per capita is also the highest I can name a few countries such as Australia New Zealand we have Canada and United States of America which belong to the North America and ANZ region cool now there is one country which you see here this seems to be like an outlier which means that this is the country which has the lowest happiness score and even the GDP per capita is also low but it is not the lowest because you can see here there are a few countries up here from the sub-saharan Africa which have the lowest GDP per capita but the happiness score is higher than this value or this country so we can assume that this country is Afghanistan which has the lowest happiness score as per the 2021 happiness report data cool now we'll plot a pie plot to understand the GDP by region so by this we can know which region has the highest percentage contribution to the world's GDP as per our data so for that I'll create a variable GDP underscore region equal to we'll use our data frame that is happy underscore DF dot I'm going to use the group by function and after that I'm going to use my column that is region so we have named the column as regional underscore indicator so I'm going to group it by this region column and I'm going to sum the values of GDP so I'm going to use the logged underscore GDP underscore per capita column and after that I'm going to use the sum function and let me just print GDP underscore region you can see it here we have the sum of all the countries for different regions and their GDP all total now this data we are going to plot it in the form of a pie plot so I'll say 
gdp underscore region dot plot dot pi we are going to plot it in terms of percentage so i am going to use a parameter called auto pct equal to then i am going to pass in my format so i'll say percentage one dot one f percentage percentage then i'll say plt dot title let's see the title of my pie plot is going to be gdp by region and i'll say plt dot by label which is going to be blank let's run it okay so here you can see we have the peach background at the back because we had assigned a peach face color you can see it here so for the first scatter plot also we had the peach color at the back and now you can see we have sub-saharan africa contributing 20.7 percent to the world's gdp the reason being we have around 34 countries in the sub-saharan africa and we have the western european countries contributing to 16.2 percent of the gdp to check the least we have north america and anz region because we only have four countries america australia canada and new zealand so hence they are contributing only 3.1 percent to the world's gdp okay now moving ahead let's find the total number of countries in each region so for this we are going to use the group by function that is part of the pandas library and we'll count the total number of countries in each region so i'll just give a comment as total countries all right i'll just scroll down so i'll create a variable called total underscore country i'm going to use my data frame that is happy underscore df dot i'm going to use the group by function i'll group the values based on the region column so within single quotes i'll say regional underscore indicator and then i'm going to find the total count of country names so i'm using the column country underscore name and after that i'll just use dot count now let's go ahead and print my variable that is total underscore country all right now let me hit shift enter okay so here you can see all right so for sub-saharan africa there are total 36 countries and not 34 as i mentioned earlier so hence you can see because it has the highest number of countries it is contributing the most to the world's gdp that is 20.7 percent then we have the least number of countries in north america and anz that is only four we have six countries in east asia and then we have 20 countries in latin america and caribbean 12 countries in commonwealth of independent states then we have 17 countries in central and eastern europe cool now i'm going to show you how to create a correlation map so that we can see the relationship that exists between each of the variables that are present in our data set i'll just run through the code and we'll see the output okay so here i have my code written for the correlation map that i want to create so first of all i'm going to compute the correlation matrix so i have used the corr function which stands for correlation and the method i'm going to use is pearson method now here i have a wikipedia page opened for pearson correlation coefficient so this is a nice article where you can understand what the pearson correlation is all about and then i'm going to set up the matplotlib figures so i have used the subplots function and i have given the figure size as 10 comma 5 and after that we are going to draw the heat map with the mask 
So I'm using the heat map function present in the Seaborn library and then I have passed in my variable that is COR which essentially stands for correlation and then I have used mask which is a boolean array or it can be a data frame and it is an optional parameter if it is passed the data will not be shown in cells where the mask is true and the cells with missing values are automatically masked after that I have used the cmap parameter which stands for color map so you can customize the colors in your heat map and I'm going to create a heat map which is in square shape so I have said square equal to true and the axis I am going to pass it as AX which I have defined here so this is the matplotlib axis and it is optional so axis in which you want to draw the plot otherwise you can use the current active axis now let me just go ahead and run this and we'll see the heat map there you go so if I scroll down here we have the correlation matrix and since I had given my C map as blue and here you can see it is mostly blue and we have the scale here now I'll tell you how to read this correlation matrix so wherever the cells are in blue or dark blue color this means that the variables have very high correlation and all these cells where you see light blue color or grayish and white color uh, this indicates that the variables have very low correlation for example there is very low or almost negative correlation between happiness score and perceptions of corruption so obviously if the citizens of a country feel that there is a lot of corruption in the country their happiness score would obviously be less or low and if you see there is also low correlation between happiness score and generosity there is again low correlation between health life expectancy and perceptions of corruption and if you see these places there is really high correlation between the happiness score and GDP per capita and again for social support also there is very high correlation now if you see even for social support and healthy life expectancy there is very high correlation but there is low correlation between making life choices and generosity and there is negative correlation between corruption and freedom of making life choices you can see it is almost white color which means it falls around this region so negative correlation similarly for logged GDP per capita and corruption there is negative correlation all right okay now we are going to visualize a bar plot that will tell us the corruption in different regions so I'll just give a comment corruption in regions let me just scroll down okay so I'll create a variable called corruption which will be equal to my data frame that is happy underscore df now first of all I'm going to use the group by function to group all my regions so I'll say regional underscore indicator which is my column name present in the data set and after this I'm going to find the average of the corruption that is perceptions of corruption so I'm going to pass in my variable name that is perceptions of corruption and I'm going to use the mean function to find the average corruption in each of these regions now let me just go ahead and print my variable that is corruption if I run it you can see here I have the values for the different regions and from here you can see that Central and Eastern Europe has the highest perceptions of corruption as per the questions answered in the poll 
and if you see the table we have western europe and the north america region with the least perceptions of corruption now we are going to visualize this using a bar plot now so first of all i'll set my parameters by giving the figure size i'll say fig size it's rather figure dot fig size i'll just add figure here okay and now let's say i'll assign it as 12 comma 8 now i'll give a title to my plot so i'll say plt dot title and my title of the plot is going to be perception of corruption in various regions all right then i'm going to define my x label so i'll say x label will be regions and we'll set the font size of the x label to let's say 13 or let it be 15 then we are going to set the y label in y label i'll have corruption index as the label name again we are going to set the font size to 15 now i'm going to use x ticks parameter since I want to rotate the axis labels in the x-axis by 30 degrees so I'll say rotation equal to 30 and I'll say HA which stands for horizontal alignment equal to right make sure this right should be within single quotes and finally I'll say PLT dot bar because I'm going to plot a bar graph I'll say corruption dot index comma and then I'll say corruption dot perceptions of corruption which is my column name all right so I have my code ready for the bar plot now let me just go ahead and print the bar plot make sure everything is correct i'll just hit shift enter okay there is one mistake here it says okay this should be x ticks and not x tick let me run it again there you go so if i scroll down on the top you have the title which is perception of corruption in various regions on the x-axis you have the regions label on the y-axis you have the corruption index and if you see this as per our table that we created we have least corruption in north america and anz region then we have the next least corruption in western europe but we have the highest corruption in central and eastern europe as per their citizens perception similarly we have the second and third highest corruption in latin america and caribbean as well as south asia cool now moving ahead i'm going to show you how you can find the life expectancy of the top 10 happiest countries and bottom 10 happy countries so for that i'm going to run you through the code and we'll see the visualization side by side okay so i have my code written in these two cells so first i'm going to find out the top 10 happiest countries and then i'm going to find the bottom 10 happiest countries so for that i'm using the head function and i passed in 10 since i want the top 10 country names and to get the bottom 10 countries as per their happiness score i'm using the tail function so let me just run it so we have saved the result in two variables top underscore 10 and bottom underscore 10 
and to create the bar plots we are using two different codes so here you can see I have set my figure size and axis and then I have my X label as country name after that I am setting my title of the bar plot to top 10 happiest countries life expectancy I've used my X tick labels and I am rotating it by 45 degrees and I have my horizontal alignment as right you can see it here we have used the bar plot function I have the X axis as country name and Y axis as healthy life expectancy column and I have set my axis then I am using the X labels and Y labels as country name and life expectancy and similarly I have my bar plot for the bottom 10 least happy countries life expectancy let's just run it and we'll see the result there you go now if I scroll down you can see we have two different bar plots the first one is for the 10 happiest countries and then we have the bottom 10 least happy countries so if you see on an average the top 10 happiest countries life expectancy is above 70 years so if you are from one of these countries you are expected to live for more than 70 years now if you check the bottom 10 least happy countries you see here Lesotho has less than 50 life expectancy age and most of them are less than 60 years so if you are from one of the top 10 happiest countries you are expected to live 10 years more than these countries that lie in the bottom 10 region cool now moving ahead all right so now we are going to see the plot between freedom to make life choices and the happiness score for this I'm going to use a scatter plot so I'll first define my figure size so I'll say plt dot rc params which stands for parameters I'm going to pass in my figure size so I'll say figure dot fig size equal to let's say 15 comma 7 then using the seaborn library and the scatterplot function we'll pass in the x-axis let's say the x-axis is my data frame name happy underscore df and I'll have the freedom to make life choices in the x-axis So the column name is freedom underscore two underscore make underscore life and choices. I'll give a comma and we'll pass in the y axis. Again, I'm going to use my data frame name dot and I'll have the happiness score. I'm also going to pass in a hue parameter. To differentiate the different regions so I'll say df dot regional underscore indicator and I'll give the size of the dots or the bubbles as let's say 200 now I'll say plt dot legend I'll place the legend at upper left corner so I'm giving the location which is LOC equal to upper left and font size let it be 12 I'll say PLT dot X label as freedom to make life choices and my Y label would be happiness score alright 
now we have the code written for the scatter plot that I want to create let me just run it there you go so here we have the legend for the different regions and we have the different colors for each of these regions and you can see here I have on the x-axis freedom to make life choices and on the y-axis we have the happiness score so you can see it very clearly for the countries that lie in the western Europe region the blue dots the freedom to make life choices is more and so is the happiness score then if you see the values in the green region which is for Middle East and North Africa the freedom to make life choices is lower and hence the happiness score is also low and for all these countries that are part of the sub-saharan Africa some of them have decent score for freedom to make life choices but the happiness score is low again now if you focus on the pink dots which is for the southeast Asian countries the happiness score is comparatively lower but the freedom to make life's choices is more than 0.8 cool and again we have one data point which is lying at the bottom we can assume this is Afghanistan so in Afghanistan the freedom to make life's choices is very low and even the happiness score is really low cool now moving to our next analysis we are going to see the top 10 most corrupt countries so first I am going to sort the perceptions of corruption column and find out the top 10 countries in the list so for that I am going to create a variable called country I will have my data frame name that is happy underscore df dot sort underscore values by I am going to sort by column that is perceptions of corruption dot head and I want to find the top 10 most corrupt countries as per the poll and then I am going to pass in the figure size so I'll say plt dot rc params and then I'm going to set the figure size so I'll say figure dot fig size make sure there is no spelling mistake let's say the figure size is 12 comma 6 I'll pass in the title so I'll say plt dot title let's say the title of my plot is going to be countries with most perception of corruption after that I'll say plt dot x label in the x label I'll have country and I'll set the font size to 13 then I'll say plt dot y label in y label I'll have the corruption index next I'll pass in the font size for the y label again it is going to be 13 now I'll say plt dot x ticks I'm going to rotate it by 30 and I'll say horizontal alignment equal to right and then I'll have my bar function or the bar plot function so I'll say plt dot bar I'm going to pass in country dot 
country underscore name and then we'll have a variable country dot the column name that is perceptions of corruption all right now if i run it you can see here so these are the countries with the least perceptions of corruption so singapore has the lowest corruption index and then we have rwanda denmark finland now if you want to see the countries with the highest perceptions of corruption you need to change this head to tail of 10 since we are sorting it in ascending order so we would want to know the bottom 10 countries if i run it there you go so these are the countries with the most perception of corruption you have slovakia lesotho kosovo there's ukraine afghanistan bulgaria romania and croatia all of these countries have a corruption index of more than 0.85 cool now coming to the final section of this interesting video on happiness report data analysis for 2021 i want to visualize a scatter plot that will tell us how the corruption varies in terms of happiness score so i'll just say a comment as corruption versus happiness okay so first of all i'll set my figure size so i'll say plt dot rc per amps within single quotes i'll give the figure size as 15 comma 7 then i'm going to use the scatter plot function that is part of the seaborn library in the x axis i'll have my column that is corruption or rather we'll have the happiness score in the x axis so i'll say happy underscore df dot column name that is happiness score let me give a comma and in the y-axis we'll have the corruption column so i'll say happy underscore df dot perceptions of corruption and then in hue we'll have the region that is regional underscore indicator so i'll say happy underscore df dot regional indicator and i'm going to give the size of the dots so i'll say s equal to 200 then i'm going to say plt dot legend I'm going to put it at lower left corner this time so I'm giving my location as lower left and the font size of the legend I want is 14 after that I'll just say plt dot x label as corruption and plt dot y label as happiness score now this should rather be the opposite since in the x-axis we have taken happiness score so we'll put the happiness score label in x and I'll have corruption in Y. Alright. So I have my scatter plot code ready. Let me just run it. There you go. So here you can see on the lower left I have the different regions and on the X axis I have the happiness score. On the Y axis I have the corruption index. Now you can see the general trend as per the scatter plot. 
that the countries with greater happiness score have lower corruption index so you can see these countries which are from the western european regions have highest happiness score and their corruption is also really low so all these blue countries you can name a few finland we have sweden we have belgium france netherlands lying in these regions we also have a few countries from north america and enz which are essentially australia then we also have canada us and new zealand okay now if you focus on these green region this region now these are the countries from the sub-saharan africa and most of the countries from these regions have a very low or less than five happiness score but the corruption is also really high you can see here they have almost more than 0.7 in the corruption index now you also have a country here which is from the southeast asia we would like to give you a task it would be really great if you can tell us in the comment section which country is this it has more than six happiness score but the corruption index is really low which is less than 0.2 now if you consider middle east and north african regions the darker green countries here also if you see the happiness score is less than 5 and the corruption index is also high now there are a few countries the commonwealth of independent states for example countries such as Uzbekistan then you also have Kazakhstan we have Russia Armenia belonging to these gray color dots you also have Georgia and Ukraine as part of commonwealth of independent states so here you see the corruption is below 0.6 for these countries and the happiness score is more than 5 all right so with that we have come to the end of this demo session on world happiness report 2021 data analysis using python introduction to r and python let me ask few queries regarding python and r r language is super superficially related to python c c plus plus java Please leave your answer in the comment section below and stay tuned to get the answer. And another question is, which one of the following is a Python file extension? .p, .python, .py and .pyt. Please leave your answer in the comment section below. Coming to Introduction to Python and R. R is a statistical programming language and environment that integrates statistical computing and graphics. R is powerful and stable software. Python. Python can also be called as a general purpose programming language for data analysis and scientific computing. Python can be considered as the best player in machine learning. Python is an expressive language with many built-in functions. Both are open source software and platform independent. And they are platform neutral and also compatible with all major operating systems including Unix, Windows and Mac. Next we will be covering different parameters. We will be covering learning preferability, mathematical fundamentals, speed of both the languages, Visualization and graphics, data handling capacity, demand, community and customer support, employment possibility in both the languages. Let us cover it one by one. First one is learning preferability or ease of learning. Python is renowned for its ease of use. Python's notebooks offer excellent tools for sharing and documentation despite the fact that there are currently no GUIs for them. Programmers find R as difficult language as a beginner. 
This implies that the programmers must devote a significant amount of time to learn and comprehending our coding. Coming to mathematical fundamentals required. Coming to Python, understanding descriptive analysis is very important. In layman's terms, descriptive statistics often refers to the process of explaining using certain representative techniques such as charts, tables, excel files, etc. Python statistics is a built-in library for descriptive statistics. If your data sets are not too big or if you can't rely on importing other libraries, you can use Python. On the other hand, R requires basic statistics. From basic statistics, statistics what I mean is mean, mode and median are the terms used most frequently in basic statistics. It is referred to as measures of central tendency. Probability statistics plays an important role in handling various types of probability distribution. It includes binomial and normal distribution. Next parameter is speed. Python is an interpreted language with dynamic typing. Python always executes slowly because the code is executed line by line. Compared to MATLAB and Python, RS, R language is significantly slower. R packages are substantially slower than those for other languages. Now that we have covered speed, coming to data visualization and data collection in Python. When selecting data analysis tools, speed visualization are crucial and Python has some incredible visualization tool. In Python, to large and varied scatter plots using regression lines, we can use ggplot2 and ggplot tools. Compared to raw values, visualized data is easier to comprehend. Therefore, R has many packages that offers sophisticated graphic features. In R, we can use in R we can use tools like Matplotlib, Seaborn, etc. Data handling capability in both Python and R. The new releases in Python have resolved the issue with the Python packages for data analysis. R is useful for analysis because of the abundance of packages, accessibility of the test and benefit of employing formulas. However, simple data analysis can also be done using it the need to install many packages. Crucial part of parameter that is tools and libraries in Python and R. As a Python developer, one needs to be well versed in the best libraries because Python has a lot of libraries that have many different uses. Libraries like TensorFlow, Scikit-learn, NumPy plays an important role in solving many Python related problems. Libraries perform a wide variety of tasks in R that are very ben beneficial for data science operations. Example for that is Deployer, Bioconductor, etc. Community and Customer Support, support Index offered by Python and R. Compared to R, Python has a larger community. For assistance, we can contact www.python.org. For any queries regarding Python and help, you can support, uh, you, I repeat, you can visit support.realpython.com. For any help and queries, R offers you with R Studio community. R provides assistance through its official website. For queries and community related issues, we can contact www.r-project.org. Next is job opportunities in Python and R. A recent survey from Indeed.com predicts that at least 55,000 Python jobs in the USA with exponential pay rates are available. 
big tech companies like Google, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook requires Python developer to handle massive amount of data. Position provided for a Python developer is software engineer, data analyst, data scientist and many more. Career in R is an excellent job opportunity for you as a beginner. Big tech companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook are using R. Position provided by companies as a R developer is data scientist, data analyst, data visualization analyst, etc. Moving on, let us wrap up an important topic which language to be used between R and Python. There is no right or wrong way to study both Python or R. Both are in demand skills that will enable you to complete almost any data analytics work you come across. It ultimately depends on your background, interest and career objectives that which one is better for you. But compared to R, Python is easy to learn. Let's compare its strength and weaknesses. It is used to handle large amount of data. Python performs non-statistical functions and it is best suitable for programming. However, Python is better when it comes to coding. Whereas R is used in data visualization graphics, R is a widespread language in the statistical community. It is used to accomplish many mathematical tasks. So before concluding the topic, let me answer the query that I have asked regarding R and Python. Do you guys remember the question? The query was, R language is superficially related to which language? So the answer for the question is C language. Next question was, which one of the following is a Python file extension? It was an easy question. Answer for that question is .py. So, firstly, let us understand why data analytics. Can somebody here tell me why data analytics and why is it used in organizations? So, let us understand why data analytics and what is the use of data analytics. As we all know that data is growing exponentially year over year. It is collected and it is also available everywhere. Data is no more just available in structured format, but it is also available in semi-structured and unstructured format. I'm sure you would have come across this term called as sentiment analysis pretty often, right? What does that mean? Can we perform that in data analytics? Yes, right? We use some natural language processing models, try to identify what are the good reviews, what are the bad reviews spoken by the customer, correct? So we try to classify the text based on the good, bad and the neutral. So that is what sentiment analysis is about. So for that, to perform that activity, we have to also do some data analytics. Now that companies have realized the importance of these informations, not just structured but also unstructured data format, the companies have started utilizing these data to take some crucial business decisions which can boost their business and also which can increase the efficiency of the business. So now that the raw data is accessible to the organizations, it becomes very important that the data is also stored well. I'm sure you all have pretty much heard about data warehouse. In the last few decades, the trend was mostly on the data warehouses, the business intelligence tools. So the data warehouse used to collect this data, pre-process the data and also filter the data and make it available in a structured format for further analysis. However, now that is not the scenario. A term coined as data lake is available and many firms are utilizing data lake because it is a central repository which stores the raw data in form of structured and unstructured data. And now let us take a scenario. 
let us choose one of the participants here mark so mark has recently joined an organization as a data analyst or in essence a data scientist the business connects with him and says that mark we have a business problem for you and we expect you to provide us a data analytics solution so mark sits with the stakeholders and he listens very carefully to the business question so the business question says that we have couple of products which are performing really well in the market and we see higher sales and some of the products are just not catching up in the market and we experience lower sales can you help us identify what are the factors driving this higher sales and the lower sales now mark has to think with the data scientist mindset and be prepared to ask them right questions some questions such as do you have the price of all these products available in the database and can i also know what is the duration of data availability and also mark can ask some question such as do you also have some features of these individual products already captured in your database so these are some of the interesting questions that makes sense to the business and the conversation continues which also means that data is not only information data analysis is about unlocking insightful informations from this raw data and hence data analysis plays an important role in discovering insightful information asking questions or answering the right questions and also predicting the future or the unknowns and to perform all these activities we use data analytics so are you all with me so far are we on the same page yes great now the question is what is data analytics so can somebody tell me what is data analytics so let us see what is data analytics we understood why data analytics and the importance of it but to perform any activities there has to be a process right so data analytics is a process to extract meaningful insights from data now let us continue with the scenario of mark so mark now understands the business problem and he has also started asking some relevant questions to the stakeholders and he has also got the answers in return he may start thinking about what could be the suitable solution for this he may have to perform some exploratory data analysis to unlock some hidden patterns to identify some correlation between the variables and to also know which are the key variables in the data set and he may also have to view the market trend which means he may have to see that how the sales has been performing across the years or across the months there might be some insightful information there he may see that the sales has been growing exponentially for some of the products and some may be volatile some may have some seasonality pattern or a cyclical pattern etc and also he may have to focus on the customer preferences why are the customer reviews and do some sentiment analysis so now let us understand what are those life cycles of data analytics we will begin with the discovery phase this is the first phase now that mark has understood the business problem he will also start focusing on identifying the resources that is the data resources some may be internal data resources that is uh, available within the firm could be some transactional data and some external data sources may be via web scraping identifying and capturing some uh, competitor price on the products after gathering all of these uh, right data mark will focus on data preparation which is the next phase 
now mark either individually or along with the team will start focusing on the data preparation which includes data wrangling which means cleansing the data imputing the records if there are any missing values or you know he may also go ahead by removing those records if they are not required and also doing some exploratory data analysis which can include some statistical analysis like looking at the data distributions understanding the summary of this data distribution at individual variable level doing some bivariate analysis and also trying to you know figure out which are the important variables that might be required for the model building phase after performing all of these EDA activities which also include some visualization mark will now sit with his team and try to identify the suitable models the suitable models could be simple statistical techniques or it can also be some machine learning models so let's say that mark and, and his team has identified some five models that can provide the required result and out of these five models they will filter down and they will prioritize only three models now there are only three models that mark and his team have finalized after this they start focusing on model building activity now for model building activity they have a data set already in place so this data set will be split into training data set and test data set it's not only training and test we can also do some validation in between training and test but here let's focus on training and test data set he will separate 75% of the data as training and 25% of the data as test now if your question is that why perform this activity of splitting the training data set and test can't we just go with the one single data set what happens if you just utilize one single data set let us say that you have used the original data set and uh, also executed this data in one of the selected model and you will also observe the accuracy let's say the accuracy return is about 98% 98% is a very good accuracy percentage and you may also be overconfident because of this that may be a case due to overfitting now what will happen when you add some new records into this data set and you rerun it the executed model may not return you the same accuracy what you had seen the accuracy might be 72 percentage now that's not fair right to avoid these overfitting issues we ensure that some new records are tested separately so hence we locate 25% of the data to the test data set and then we predict those records the unknown records which is located in the test data set we predict them and then we test the accuracy of training data set and the test data set and we make a comparison now let us say the accuracy result of training is 98% and the test is 97% in this case we can say that the model is performing really well however while executing the model there are certain things that has to be considered for example inclusion of the parameters tuning the parameter which also will execute the optimal results so this is very important now let's say after performing this model building the time comes to analyze the results that is the next phase now the team will sit and analyze the result and they will notice that out of the three filtered models only two models are returning excellent accuracies they will sit with the business team and they will also explain them 
the result and what are the activities that they have performed to obtain this result some of the stakeholders may be technically savvy some of them may be non technical people so it has to be very important that you also communicate these results accordingly all right now that you have the results you will also gauge them based on the business objective which was developed in phase 1 looking at the results of the two models now the business might select one of the model and say that okay this particular model seems to be returning some right information and it also appears valid to us let's go ahead with this one model so finally the result and the model needs to be operationalized and that is where the team will start documenting the business problems the steps that were taken for executing the models and they will include all the codes and the findings and finally they will implement this model so that uh, the business can view the results and also utilize them for strategic decision making at your firm so are we good so far with the understanding of the life cycle all right great now let us focus on the types of analytics what are the types of analytics can somebody tell me which are the types of analytics you are aware of okay predictive analytics great descriptive analytics good all right good enough now let us focus on this example of google maps so as we look at this particular google map we understand that the blue color route is nothing but the route direction from sacramento to florin and also we see a display of the duration estimated as well the distance to travel from sacramento to florin as well we see another route here that is gray colored this is a substitute route or the connecting route just to avoid the traffic which is in orange within the blue color route so the gray colored route as well shows us the estimated duration to travel as well the distance now let us understand what is descriptive analytics and why do we focus on this particular map example as we understand the route map the estimated duration as well the distance to travel via the blue color route as well the gray color route this is one way of understanding descriptive analytics as in what is happening but there is another way of understanding descriptive analytics that is by focusing on summarized past data and this is a descriptive analytics we see that what had happened in the previous year now let us focus on predictive analytics what is predictive analytics this type of analytics looks into the historical and present data to make predictions of the future what does this mean so google has already suggested the best route which is the blue color route to travel from sacramento to florin and the duration is 18 minutes and distance is 9.7 miles let's assume that google map has already collected historical data of this particular route and based on the available data their model has predicted the best route and also the duration that will be taken to travel from sacramento to florin now let us focus on prescriptive analytics prescriptive analytics describes the solution to a particular problem what was the problem in this case on the predicted best route some predictions on the traffic congestions and that's when google map recommends the substitute routes correct now these substitute routes are also prescribed by google map as a recommendation so prescriptive analytics is nothing but a solution and a recommendation provided for a problem 
So in this case, we have the best root and we also have other substitute roots. So let's quickly summarize. Descriptive analytics is about summarizing the past data or to see what is happening, for example, in the Google Maps scenario. Predictive analytics is about what would happen. And prescriptive analytics is about prescribing the solution, the best solution and the recommended solutions. Now let us refer back to Mark's earlier scenario. Mark along with his team identified the best model. They also did some testing and they got identified the best results and they also finalized on one particular model. Based on that particular model, now the results have to be provided in such a way that they are the best results and also the recommendations, correct? So it may not be just one single solution. It may be a solution with couple of other recommendations as well. So that is exactly what happens in the entire process of data analytics. I hope this has been clear so far. Yes. Okay. And now let us focus on benefits of using R. Why do companies extensively use R for data analysis and why is it chosen? Firstly, R is an open source programming language, which means that there is no license required to work with R. And R does not require you to have a coding experience, which means that a non-technical person in your team can also learn R very easily and start coding or building models in few lines of codes. R can also be used with other programming languages such as Java, C++ and Python. And the integration of R with other programming tools or BI tools is very simple and easy. And various statistical models are readily available in R, which also means that there are plenty of inbuilt libraries and packages already available. And reporting the results of an analysis becomes easier by using these inbuilt packages and for creation of these models in just simple few lines code. With this understanding of the benefits of using R, let us quickly hop on to R Studio and start performing the hands-on exercise for data analysis. For this exercise, we will use a data set named as demographics, which is in a .csv file type. Firstly, let us load the data set to R Studio and we will locate this in a variable named as demo. We also refer to this as a data frame. And now you will notice that a variable is created in an environment section, which is in the bottom right hand side of the R Studio window. And this particular variable comprises of 510 observations or records with eight variables. Let us simply expand this particular data frame and have a quick check on the data structure and understand the data types. This particular data frame includes variables such as age, marital, income, the unit of income is dollar per day, education levels, the car price, car category with several levels, gender and retired status. Now let us view the top six records of this particular data set. For this, let's simply type head of demo. And the result is now visible in the console section. If you're interested to view all the records, then simply type view of demo. And this new window will show you every single record that is being loaded to our studio. You may also simply apply the filters and the filter section here on individual categorical variables. Now that we have loaded the data set and also viewed individual records, let us focus on creating subsets of records by applying filters on individual variables or multiple variables. So firstly, let us apply filter on gender. We will only retrieve the records where gender is equal to female and we will locate these records in a variable named as demo2.
as you notice now in the environment section the second variable is also created that is demo and this now is comprising of 250 observation which means the records are filtered down to only gender female next let us see how to apply a filter on income variable let us only retrieve the records where income is greater than 100 Let's view the result. As we see here, all the records include income greater than 100. Now let us modify this query and we will ensure that the retrieved records includes income greater than 100 and also specific variables are returned. Let's say we only want to have the first variable, third variable and the seventh variable returned as the result. Let's have a quick check. So we only have the first, third and the seventh variable returned. How about we only exclude the variable 6 to 8. For this we include a prefix of minus sign. And now let us see what is the result. We have the variables from first to the fifth variable. However, we don't have sixth, seventh and eighth variable. I hope it's clear so far. Yes. All right. Now let us see how can we apply condition by including both the variables that is gender and income. And then we will filter the record and create a subset of data. Now let's view the result. Income is greater than 100 and the gender is only female. This is one way of creating subsets. However, now let us see how to use the subset command and create the subset. Let's create a subset of records by applying filter on marital status and age. We'll only retrieve records where marital status is equal to married and age is greater than 35. Let's now view the result. So here we have the age greater than 35 and marital status is married. Let's use the same code and this time we will retrieve selected variables. Let's say variables ranging from 1 to 3. Let's have a quick check. So there are three variables age is greater than 35 and marital status is married. Now let us see how to structure the data by sorting the data frame in ascending and in descending order. We will apply this order function on the variable income. Firstly let us see how to order income variable in ascending order. Let's do a quick check and here we have income in ascending order. Now let's see how to modify the same code and view the records with income 
in descending order. So we have now the income in descending order. How about include two variables and sort the variables accordingly? Firstly, we will sort the records by ordering income and age in ascending order. Let's quickly view the result. We have income in ascending and age as well in ascending. Let's now modify this code. This time we will order income in descending and age in ascending. Let us view the result. So the income is in descending and age is in ascending order. So hope this is clear on how to sort the data frame by ascending and descending order per variable or by using multiple variables. With this we will focus on learning statistical analysis. How to perform statistical analysis on individual variable or multiple variable. Let's start by understanding the data distribution of variable income so that we identify what is the minimum value of income. What is the maximum? What is the range? What is median? What is the mean? And we will also focus on the quantile distribution, which is also analyzed in a box plot. What is the minimum value in the variable income? It's 9. And what is the maximum? So we have the maximum value. Now let us see what's the range. So the range shows you the result with minimum and the maximum value. How about the difference of maximum and the minimum? Now let us focus on other summaries of data distribution for this variable income. Let's identify what is the mean value of income. The mean is 78. Let's also understand what is the standard deviation. All right. So the standard deviation is $112. Let us see what is the variance. The variance should be larger than the standard deviation. Now let's say what is the median absolute deviation. As you notice here, the median absolute deviation value is lower than standard deviation. Why do we make this comparison? From this, it is evident that median absolute deviation is robust to outliers and standard deviation is sensitive to outliers and also to the change in the mean value. Now let us understand the quantile distribution. This is the same analysis that is visualized in a box plot ranging from 0% to 100% identifying the individual data points and we can also refer and compare this to the min the max and the median values let us quickly see what is the median value of income as you notice here the median is 45 as well the 50th percent of quantile is 45 which means 0 percent is minimum and 100 percent is the maximum value now, if your question is what is 25% and 75%, this is again used for identifying the range of interquartile. The interquartile range is nothing but the difference of 75% minus the 25%. Let's quickly see what is the IQR of income. The IQR of income is 58. 
Let us do a quick check. 75% of quantile is 86 and 25% of quantile is 28. And the value is 58 which is equal to the IQR result. Now that we have focused on the statistical analysis of the individual variables data distribution, let us focus on the data visualization. In this, we will have a pictorial representation of analysis to identify the outliers to see what is the minimum and where do we see the data densely populated and how is it scattered, etc. We will begin with creating a histogram. Now, histogram can be used for univariate analysis, which means in this scenario, we will consider income variable and we will see how the count of income ranges gets distributed in a histogram. For this, we will have to install a package called as ggplot2 and also call this library ggplot. Let us install the package. Now let us call the library. All right, and we are ready now to begin with visualization. For this, we will use the geometric object histogram on the data demo data frame. Let me expand this window so that the code is visible and also use an aesthetic mapping for variable income. This will be helpful for filling colors or filtrations etc. and only include 30 bins with individual bin size width of 100 which means there will be 100 incomes in individual bins. Let's quickly look at the distribution of this histogram. As you notice there are a couple of outliers. The counts of these income range are very limited. However, we see the densely populated income ranges with higher counts between 0 to 200 dollars per day. This is also a way to identify and segment the customers based on their income ranges. Now let us see how to change the color of this histogram and also the border of the histogram. For this we will include some additional options such as fill fill with blue color and the border color is black. Now as you notice here the executed code provides us the histogram with blue color bars and black color border lines. Now we will focus on creating a facet grid. Facet grid is also an aesthetic mapping object. We will see how to enable the multiple histograms across the marital status and the genders so that we identify how the income is distributed for individual marital status as well the genders. Let's zoom this view and have a look at it. As you notice here, there are some interesting outliers here in the data distribution. Female unmarried drawing higher income and male unmarried and married also drawing higher income as compared to the females. 
Whereas if you notice that the female unmarried is drawing much higher income than the male. This may also be very much related to the age. Now let us see how to create a stacked histogram. When I say a stacked histogram, I mean instead of filling the color, we will fill the gender so that there is a stack within the histogram. So as you notice here, I have made couple of changes. I have included fill equal to gender within the aesthetic mapping. Now let us look at this histogram. As you see here, the gender is filled in the histogram. Hence, we have stacked distribution of female and the male. Now let us focus on creating a bar chart with education versus income, where we can identify the education levels and the income ranges for these education levels. As you notice here, we are going to create a visualization where we have the aggregation in form of mean and the geometric object used here is bar plot. Now let's zoom this view and understand which education level have higher average income. So as we see here, the blue color bar is the post undergraduate degree, which means this education level draws higher average income as compared to other education levels. Now let's create a histogram where we will see car price and the number of cars for individual category. Let's look at this visualization. This visualization provides us some interesting insight. Just by looking at the distribution of the car prices and the counts of the cars at uh, the car category economy and even the luxury. Luxury car category or car price is pretty much distributed whereas economy car category is dense which means that we could also look back into the income and age variables and try to figure out further more insights and then segment the customers for further targeting of these customers. Now what happens if we simply change this bin width to 30? As you observe here, changing the bin width or increasing the bin width will also reduce the number of bins. Now we only have four bins here and the car category is filled. That is what we have enabled within the aesthetic mapping. And we see some more interesting insight. As you look at the standard and the luxury car category, the car prices are pretty much overlapping for the car category, luxury and standard. This could be the starting car price of the luxury brands. Now let us create a clustered bar chart. Let's look at this visualization. 
In this visualization, as you observe, though we have enabled fill equal to gender in the aesthetic mapping, we do not have the view in stack form, but we have the bars one besides the other. It is also because we have enabled a position called as position equal to dodge in the code. Now, what is the insight that we can draw from this visualization? As you see, postgraduate degree with female gender is drawing higher average income as compared to any other education level. Now let us see how to create a box plot for variable income across the genders. So the box plot can be enabled if there is a bivariate analysis to be performed on a continuous variable and a categorical variable or multiple categorical variables with a continuous variable. Now let's look at this visualization. What does this say? We have data distribution of income for individual genders, that is for female and the male. And we also notice outliers here. Anything above this whisker is considered to be outliers. It might make more sense if we also include some coloring for these outliers. Maybe also enable shape. Now we have colored the outliers and it's colored orange. Let's see if we can also enable the shapes. And now we have here the outlier color as well the shape enabled. Now let us see how to enable a violin plot. What is the utility of violin plot? With a box plot, we understand the analysis and the distribution of the data points is to identify the outliers, to know what is the minimum value, what is the max, what is the median, and what are the outliers. But what is the purpose of a violin plot? Let us have a quick check. As you observe, there is some concentration of data points in the bottom of every car category. However, the concentration is higher for standard car category as compared to economy and the luxury. Now, this is an interesting insight that you wouldn't have come across in box plot. The box plot is a very good representation for identifying outliers. However, violin plot will help you focus on the nuances, which is not captured by the box plot. We can also simply combine the box plot and the violin plot together. Simply include this geo object. Let's zoom this. Now you have a representation of box plot and the violin plot, both combined in a single visualization. Interestingly, you notice the outliers as well the concentration in the bottom of this violin plot. So this could be some interesting insights that you draw 
and focus on these data points and understand what exactly is happening there. Now let's focus on the density plot that is density estimate of the histograms rather than just viewing the frequencies. Now we see the frequency in the y-axis across the income distributions. How about enabling the probability as true so that we enable the density instead of the frequency. So now we have the density in the y-axis and in the x-axis we still have the income distribution. This is the way of also adding a line plot, which is a density plot on the histogram. Now, as you observe here, the density plot is not in the same level as the bar. So let us adjust this line. For this, we will include adjust, let's say equal to three. And now let us see how the visualization appears. Now the density plot is on the same level as the bar. Now let us see how to create a cross table for car category and gender. For this let us call the library DESCR. Now let us create the visualization enabling cross table for car category and gender. Let's look at the result in console. As you see here, now we see the counts of the gender for individual car category. The values over here represents that there are 67 females falling within the car category economy and 80 males within the car category economy. And for luxury, we see that the count of female is higher than the male. As well, the proportions. Now, how do you understand what proportions are presented here? We may simply turn off some of the proportions like the t-test, the chi-square, etc. Let us see how to enable that. Now let's look at the result. This looks better. Now that we have the counts, the female counts and the male counts across individual car category, we also see the percentages rather than just looking at the absolute value. So there are 45.6 percentage of female within the car category economy and 54.4 percentage of male within the car category economy. Similarly across rest of the car categories. This kind of cross table or a contingency table is also helpful when you want to analyze the different categorical variables and identify the counts or the proportions. Now let us see how to use a scatter plot of age versus income. Scatter plot is a visualization used for bivariate analysis. When you want to perform some analysis between two continuous variables at a data point level rather than performing the analysis at an aggregated level such as sum or mean. And now we have a scatter plot of age versus the income, age in the x-axis and income in the y-axis. Though we do not see any kind of a positive correlation or a negative correlation, but we still see some interesting insights over here. Some of the data points are pretty much scattered and much away from densely populated data points. I hope the learning has been informative and interesting so far. We have covered the concepts of data analytics, 
as well we have performed some hands-on doing some statistical analysis and also creating interesting visualization so welcome to this session where we will learn on time series analysis using our programming language so this is basically a mini project where we will look at time series data and how we can analyze it visualize it to basically find some important information or gather insights from the data now when you talk about time series analysis time series is basically any data set where your values are measured at different points in time so when you talk about time series data data is usually uniformly spaced at a specific frequency for example hourly weather measurements you have daily counts of website visits monthly sales total and so on so when you talk about time series that can also be irregularly spaced and sporadic for example timestamp data in computer systems event log or history of 911 emergency calls now when we work with time series data for example here i am taking a energy data set we can see how techniques such as time based indexing resampling rolling windows can help us explore variations in electricity demand and renewable energy supply over time now here we will look at some aspects of this data set which i am considering so there is this is open power systems data set and here is the data set i have we can look at the data set now this is in a simple format it has time it basically has values for consumption and then you have data for wind and solar and wind plus solar so in certain cases you have only the date and the consumption but then if we scroll down we will also find data for wind solar wind plus solar and so on so this is a time series data set which we would want to work on sometimes you may also have the data collected which just does not have the time but it may also have time stamp that is it would have say hour minutes and seconds and that can also be worked upon so let's consider this data set and let's work on this project where we will analyze this time series data set now here we can work on this time series data we can basically create some data structures out of it such as data frames we can do some time-based indexing we can visualize the data we can look at the seasonality in the data look at some frequencies and also do some trend detection now when you talk about this data set it has electricity production and consumption which is reported as daily totals in gigawatt hours and here are the columns of the data which i was just showing you so you have data you have consumption you have wind you have solar and wind plus solar so this is the data we have and we will basically explore say electricity consumption and production in germany which has varied over time so some of the questions which we can answer here is when is electricity consumption typically highest and lowest how do wind and solar power production vary with seasons of the year? What are the long-term trends in electricity consumption, solar power and wind power? How do wind and solar power production compare with electricity consumption and how has this ratio changed over time? We can also do wrangling or cleaning of this data or pre-processing of data and create a data frame and then we can visualize this. Now let's see how do we do that. So I will open up my R studio and let's look at the data set. So here is the data set. Now I'm picking it up from my machine. You can also pick it up from GitHub. So all the data sets or similar data sets can be found in my GitHub repository. And here I can look in the data sets. You will find a lot of different data sets here. There are some time series data sets such as power, I can search for power or you have basically coal or you have this OPSD Germany daily data set and there are many other data sets which you can work on now to get the documentation on this project you can also look in my github repository and you can search for repositories and then basically you can look in data science and R and here 
there is a project folder where I have given the documentation, sample data set and also your time series analysis related document. This is also the code which you can directly import in your R studio and you can practice or work on this project. So let's see how does that work. So first thing is we will create a data frame from this data set. Now here if you see I am using header as true so that it understands the heading of each column. I'm also giving row dot names and I'm specifying date. So there is this date column in the data set as I showed you earlier. Let's look at it again. So you have date, consumption, wind, solar, wind plus solar. So you can suggest that date should become the index column which can be useful. So you can do this. Now let's just create this. Let's look at what does this data frame contain. And here, if you see, it shows me some data which has been now as a part of this data frame structure. It starts with consumption, wind, solar, wind plus solar. And if you see, this one is becoming my index column. So I can always do a head and look at part of the data frame using head or tail. So look at the first records. So let's see this. Now that shows me the head data. I can also do a tail and look at the ending values. So if you closely see here, we have wind, solar, wind, dot solar, and that basically has NA values. So there are missing values, but let's look at the tail. And that tells me that there is some data available for wind and solar and wind solar. Now we can always look in a tabular format using view and we can look at the data. So this shows me that there are values in these columns. We see NA values, but if I really scroll down, I can see some values which would be available for wind and solar and wind solar. So I can just use view. Now I can look at the dimensions of this particular object. And that tells me there are 400 uh, 4384 rows and four columns. You can always look at the structure that is check the data type of each column which can be very useful. So if I see here I don't see the date column because date column was considered as an index which can be useful but I also look at my other columns so they are of the num types. So that's the data type for each attribute or each column here. Now we would be interested in looking at this date column. So let's look at the data type of this date column. Now if I try to do this, this will show me that this is null because date as a column does not exist because we created it as an index. So if I look at row names and then I search for my data, show me the index column or row dot names. It tells me these are the values. That's the date column which we are seeing here. Now we can access a specific row by just doing a my data and give the index value or row name value. So let's look at that and that shows me based on this index you are looking at the value. You can obviously search for a different date something like this. You can also pass in a vector and you can give range of values. So that is 0, 1, 2006 to 4 of January and we can look at this one. So it shows me these are the values. So here actually I'm not giving a range, but I'm just selecting multiple values from row dot names. Now we already know that in R you have a summary function. So you can always do a summary and that gives you for each column it gives you minimum, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile and maximum values. So we are looking at consumption, we are looking at wind, solar and wind dot solar. Now this is good but then if I would want to really visualize the data, access the data, do some analysis then it would be good to take all the columns and then we can later decide to change the data type of say date column if we want to use it. So earlier I was using date as row dot names or the name of the rows or index what you call in any other programming language. So here I will just use my data set and I'll say header as true. I'm calling it my data two. Let's look at the data and this one shows me five columns 
wherein my first column is the date, consumption, wind, solar, and so on. Now, looking at the structure, so let's look at the data type. So it tells me that if now I'm interested in looking at the date column from my data to data frame, it tells me it is a factor with 4384 levels, and these are the values. So it is not in a date time format, it's a factor. Now what we can do is we can convert this into a date format. How do we do that? So let's have a variable X and I'm going to use as.date function and I'm going to pass in my date column. So that's assigned to X. Now let's look at the head of X and it shows me the values. We will also see what kind of class it is and we will look at the structure of X. So class already says it is date type and look at the structure so it shows me the format. Now we have converted this column or column related value into X. Now how do I basically extract values out of it or make it a part of data frame? So first I will use, so all once it has been converted in date format, I will go for as.numeric and here I will create a variable called year and I will just do a format on X which is basically of date type and then I'm saying percentage Y. So that will get me the year component out of this. Let's look at the values. That shows me year component. Now, similarly, we can get the month out of this and then basically look at the month values. We can get the day out of it and we can get the day component. Now, if I look at my data two, which we had created earlier, this basically had date, consumption, wind, solar, wind, solar. So what I can do is I can add these extracted columns such as year, month, day to my data frame using a C bind that is column bind and I will assign it to my data too again. So let's do this. And now if you look at head, it shows me date. So that should be date format, consumption. Now this one might not be date format, but we'll see. You have consumption, wind, solar, and we have extracted the year, month, and day, which can help us for group by. We can do some aggregations. We can do a plotting, and we can do various things by these additional columns. Now, let's look at first three rows here. So I'll say one is to three for my data too, and that shows me some data here. You can always do a head and look at the sample of data. So that basically shows me month, day, your columns and then you have your date. Now, what we can do is we would want to visualize this data. We would want to basically understand the consumption. Now, as I said, if we want to visualize the data, say for example, I want this, which is consumption of data over years. And this one is in terms of gigawatts per hour, as we were mentioning here gigawatt hours. So if I would want to create this visual to basically understand the pattern of the data, how do we do it? So we can you create a line plot of full time series of Germany's electricity consumption using the plot method. Now, how do we do that? So here, one of the option is I can straight away use the plot method. I can then say what would be in my X axis, what would be on my Y axis, what would be the type of graph I would want to plot? What is my name on X axis, Y axis? And this is the simplest way. So I'm saying my data two, I'm extracting the year column. And here I'm taking the consumption. So let's create a plot. And here, if you see, we are looking at a plot. We do see some tick times and we see that the data has been divided with every two years. So from 2006 onwards to 2016. But then really this data does not give me, uh, you know, a very useful way of looking at the data or understanding it. Might be what I can do is I can use the same way, but I can give apart from X axis and Y axis, I can say that limits that is x limit is 2006 to 2018 and y limit is from 800 to 1700 so we can do this and let's look at this again this is a plot but it really does not help me in visualizing and understanding the data so what are the better options 
I can go for multiple plots in a window. As of now, we are just sticking to one plot in window. So if you would want to have multiple plots, you can always change the value here and make it two or three. That will say how many rows and how many columns. So as of now, we will just keep it as it is par MF row. Now, if I would want to plot, I can straight away give the column name. So I'm interested in getting the consumption. Now I can just do a plot. I'll say my data two, and I will choose the second column, which is consumption, which we saw here from our data. So consumption was the second column. So I can just do a plot in a straightaway way without mentioning your X axis, Y axis, limits and so on. And if you look at this, this one is giving me a pattern. Now here I am looking at um, X axis, Y axis, which is not really named. We do not have a name to this graph and we are looking at the data. It does show me some kind of pattern, but might be we can make it more meaningful. So I can do it this way where I say my data second column. Let's give access as year X axis Y axis is consumption. Now that has changed the X axis and Y axis. Now I can also give some more details. I can say type should be line. I have the line width. I'm saying color is blue and let's do this. So this looks more meaningful, might be shows a wavering pattern of consumption over years. I can also give a limit of X that is zero to 2018. And that basically shows me the range. Now we can change that and we can be more specific and saying X limit should be 2006 to 2018. And let's look at this. Now this one, once you have given a proper limit, it shows the line graph and it shows what was the consumption in 2006 and over a period till 2018. I can then use any of these options are fine, but it depends on what and whom you are presenting the data or what kind of analysis you're doing. So I can do a plot. I can choose column second X lab, which is X axis, Y axis type is line width giving a X limit Y limit and then I'm giving a title to this which is consumption graph and then basically you are looking at the line graph. Now those are the options which you can do either you could be very specific or you could just give your column which you want to plot or obviously make it more meaningful by giving all the details. Now what we can do is if we would want to look at this data and understand it better rather than just looking at a simple line. I can take the log values. So here I'm saying log of my data to second column. So I'm taking log values of consumption and I'm taking the difference of logs. So I can say difference and then you can basically increase or decrease this by multiplying it by some number. So rest remains the same. I'm changing the color and let's look at this plot and you see this basically is giving me a better pattern which makes meaning here we see the log values so this is you are using a simple plot function in r you can also use ggplot now for that we can install the ggplot package it's already there in my machine so i'll say no i will access this by using the library ggplot2 and now i can use ggplot to plot so the way you specify here, you can say my data two. That's the data frame. I'm saying type as O. And when I'm saying line, I am basically going to use X axis, which is year, Y is consumption. And let's look at this plot. So again, we are back to the one which we were doing earlier. Really does not make any sense. It gives us some data, but then really does not give me enough information. I can. In my aesthetics, I can say X as year, Y as consumption. I can do a grouping and then I can give line and plot. So again, we have some information, but really does not help me right now. Let's look at other example. So I'm just doing the same thing here and I'm looking at line type being dashed. I'm using the GG plots, other methods such as geom line and geom point to give me more information. And if I look at the 
plot, it does give me data. It tells me what are the different values. It gives me some kind of pattern, but I would still prefer the way we were doing with plot. Now we can change the color and obviously add details to it. So what we see is when you use the plot method, which I did earlier, it was choosing pretty good tick locations that is every two years and labels the years for the x axis which was helpful right but with these data points which we were seeing here or say for example this one or say this one or say this one we are looking at some data but then that really is quite crowded and it is hard to read. You can look at the values, but then it really does not give you enough information. So we can go for plot method, but then we will see how we can consider different data. Now, if I would want to plot the solar and wind time series, so let's see how do we do that. So wind column is what I'm interested in. So first thing is, it was always good to find out the minimum and the maximum values in every column. So I'm saying minimum, I'm saying let's put in here my data two, and then let's look at the values. So we are looking at the columns. We know consumption is the second column, wind is the third column, and you have solar as the fourth, and this one is the fifth. So let's say, let's find out the minimum of each of these columns, which we would want to plot. So let's say minimum of data third column, and here I'm also saying remove the NA values because we do not want to consider the NA values. So let's like look at the minimum that shows me 5.7757. What is the maximum value? It is 826. So that also helps me in giving a limit. If I want to plot wind on Y axis, I can give a Y limit from 5 to 850. Consumption wise, let's find out the minimum from second column and maximum. And similarly for solar, find the minimum and maximum and wind plus solar minimum and maximum. So this will be helpful when you would want to plot multiple graphs or give some limits. So that's fine. Now for multiple plots, as I said, instead of having one plot, let's plot consumption and wind and solar and try to see a pattern. So I can say par function and I will say three rows and one column. So now when I start plotting, you will see you will have multiple plots in one single window. So let's see how we do it. So here, let's look at plot one. So this one is consumption as we did earlier. And let's look at the data. So that gives me some data. You can always do a zoom and you can look at the data. You can basically expand this graph or you can reduce this graph to see what kind of pattern we have in consumption. Similarly, we can basically choose date being X axis, my consumption being Y axis, right? So this is being more specific because here we have a range, but it really does not give me enough information. So I will basically give X axis, Y axis. I will give the name that is daily totals. And then I will basically give consumption, color, and Y limit based on my minimum and maximum limits. So let's do this. And now we can look at the data here. So let's see, this data makes a little more meaning because we are looking at the dates. And let me do a zoom. So it shows me all the dates. It shows me the data points. It shows me how the data pattern is changing for consumption. Now, this is for consumption. So what we can do is we can also extract specific data. So if you see here, I have done some testing where I am saying, OK, I would want to get a date specifically. I would want to extract some value. So we are looking at the date column. But if you remember, we did not change the data type. We just change the data type of date column we extracted year month month out of it it would be good if we can convert a column into date time format and put that in our data frame now let's look at the plot two this is mainly for your uh, column 
which should be consumption and wind and solar. So here I see it is solar data and I can plot this one to see how it looks like. And that tells me from 2006 onwards, we have some pattern. I can be more specific where I say I would be giving date and then the column for solar x axis y axis what is the type what is the y limit and what is the color it is always good to specify your x and y axis given name rather than let it automatically pick up now this makes more meaning because it shows me some dates similarly we can do for wind so either you do it just by giving the column or you give your x and y axis so let's look at this one and this shows me the data so we can choose plot three this one we can choose plot two we can choose plot one and we can put all that data in one graph so that's when you are putting in multi plots in one particular graph you can always do a zoom you can always look at the data right and this is usually useful to look at the pattern what kind of pattern we see what data we have and so on now moving forward so we have seen how you are creating these plots all in one window. Let me reset this back to one plot per window and let's basically plot time series in a single year. So what we have seen is that when you look at the plot method, it was quite crowded. Then we looked at solar and wind. And if you compare that, you will see your consumption pattern your solar pattern, your wind pattern. And basically we can see from this particular data, some kind of pattern. So electricity consumption is highest in the winter where we will see what is the consumption. Is it highest in winter or is it in summer? We can see that by breaking a year further into months, we can see that, but we see a pattern which goes for every year or every two years being highest at a particular point of time and then it drops down. So electricity consumption is highest in winter and that might be due to electrical heating and increased lighting usage and lowest in summer. Now, when you look at electricity consumption it appears to split into two clusters, we can always look at the consumption, one with oscillation centered roundly around 1400 gigawatts so you can always look at 1400 gigawatts and you see all the values here which are in that particular consumption another with fewer and more scattered data points centrally roughed around 1150 so if you really expand this you can see you will have a lot of data points at this point now we might guess that these clusters correspond with weekdays and weekends, which we can see if you break that data into yearly, monthly, weekly, and so on. Now, if you look at solar production, that is highest in summer when sunlight is most abundant and lowest in winter. So obviously when you're making or gathering some insights, when you're looking at the data, you are also using your domain knowledge, your business knowledge, your you know, knowledge of business to understand how this goes. If you look at wind power production, that's again highest in winters and drops down in summer. So due to stronger winds and more frequent storms and lowest in summer. So there is some kind of increasing trend in wind power production over years, which we can see here over the years. And all the time series data, what we are looking at is referring or showing us some kind of seasonality that is we are looking at seasonality in which a pattern is repeating again and again at regular times at regular intervals so if you look at consumption solar and wind time series that oscillates between high and low values on a yearly time scale which we can break down and see i'll show you that it corresponds with the seasonal changes in weather over the year so seasonality does not have to correspond with meteorological reasons for example, if you look at retail sales, sales data, uh, that will show you yearly seasonality with increased sales in particular months. So seasonality, when we say, can occur on other time scales. So the plots, what we are seeing here, they are fine. But if you look at those plots, they might show some kind of weekly seasonality also. So in your consumption.
corresponding to weekdays and weekends. So let's plot for one single year. Now, how do I do that? So first is I will look at my data two. That shows me the structure. It shows me date, which is factor, other columns, which are all numerics. Now, like we did earlier, I'll repeat this step where I'm going to convert the date column into date type. Look at head of it, look at class of it, look at the structure of it, right? And then what I want to do is I want to add this as to my data frame. So I will create a variable called mod data and this one will have as data and I'm formatting the value of X, which is date time into month, day and year. So let's do that. And now you look at the mod data, which I created like modified data. So this is the format I have. It is in date type, if you carefully see here. And then I can look at the head of it. So it says me mod data. Now we are, what we did here is when I said my data three. So my data three, we did a C bind and I did a mod data which is going to add this column to my other columns of my data too. So my new data frame is my data three. Let's look at the structure of it. And you see there is this date column. I can delete it. I can remove it. I can let it be right. So that depends on our choice. Might be we want to once our analysis done, we want to remove the mod data, right? So we can keep both of them. Now let's basically extract data for a particular year. Now, how do you do that? So this is some wrangling. So I will say my data four, let's call it my data four, and I will use subset function. So subset will work on my data three, that's the data. And what I'll do is I will do a subset. How do, how is the subset found? So I'll say, take the mod data column, the value should be greater than or equal to 2017 and should be less than 2017 December 31st. So I'm getting data for one year and I'm storing it as my data four. Let's get the head of it. And you see, we are specifically looking at 2017 related data. Now let's do a plotting of this where I will only create a plot for one year. So I'm saying my data four, that's my new data what we got. So here I am going to take the first column, which is mod data. I am going to take the third column, which is consumption. So I'm looking at the date format for one year, consumption values for it, and then rest of the things as we have done earlier. Let's look at the plot and this makes more meaning, right? So when you look at this plot, it tells me Jan to Jan. It shows me some kind of pattern where I have divided the year into months, right? And it is broken down into say two months, so Jan and March and May and July and so on, but we still see a pattern and that gives me good understanding of pattern where I've broken it down into months. So this is where you have taken time series in a single year to investigate further. And this is what we see. Right now we can clearly see there are some weekly oscill oscillations. What one more interesting feature is that at this level of granularity, that is when you're looking at yearly data, there is a drastic decrease in electricity consumption in early January and late December during the holidays. Or probably we can assume that this is holidays. Now I can zoom in further and look at just Jan and Feb data. Let's see how we do that and let's see how we work by zooming in the data further. So to zoom in the data further, let's see how we do it. Now here we have this my data four, which is basically having a subset, right? So let's work on this one. So I will say my data four, which earlier I was taking data three. I was doing a subset and I was giving the date, but this time I will make it more narrower so i'll say my data four i will say subset from my data three and i will choose mod data column which we have modified with the date format i will choose the starting date as 1701 that is jan and then let's go till feb 
and let's create this. Now let's look at the head of this. So it shows me we have the data which is Jan and then you you can basically look at more on this. Now again as I said earlier let's find out the minimum of this from the first column. So that is basically your mod data. So let's look into this one and that basically will give me minimum and maximum. Let's look at the values. So this one tells me Jan 17, January 1 and maximum is your Feb 28th, second month, 2017. So we are actually looking at two months data here. Let's look at the Y minimum. So this is, I will look at column three. Now what is column three? Consumption. So let's look at the minimum value for consumption, maximum value of consumption. Let's look at the values which can be given as our limits. Now this is the minimum and maximum. Now let's do a plotting for this data which has been narrowed down for consumption based on my data. So I'm saying my first column which is mod data and then third column which is consumption. I'm giving some naming convention for, sorry, namings for your x-axis, y-axis, what is my consumption or what is my title here, what is the color and then you see I'm using x limit to give the minimum and maximum limit and y limit. So let's look at this data and if you look at this data, it is specifically for two months and again I can look at the pattern here. What I can also do is I can add some grid here so I can basically look at this data and make more meaning out of it. So it is bi-weekly data you can see. Now I can add a line here using ab line and then I can basically choose what lines I would want to add horizontally. So that basically allows me to dissect the data and look at data in a more meaningful way. I can also add vertical lines. So vertical lines is I'm saying sequence will be minimum, maximum and I'm saying an interval of seven. So let's do this and this basically has added some lines every week and you can see at the end of week it is dropping and then it is starting again. It peaks somewhere in the mid of the week and again it drops down. So this is you're looking at your consumption data. Right now what we can also do is we can create some box plots. So when we looked at zooming in data for Jan and Feb, you can add some data points like this. So consumption is highest on the weekdays as I showed you here and lowest on the weekends. So this is what we are seeing when we are breaking the data or zooming it further for a couple of months. So we have vertical grid lines and we have nicely formatted tick labels that is Jan 1st, Jan 15th, Feb 1st and so on. So we can easily tell which days are weekdays and weekends with use of these grid lines and basically breaking it down. So there are many other ways to actually visualize your time series data depending on what patterns you're trying to explore. You can use scatter plots, you can use heat maps, you can his use histograms and so on. Now, moving further, we would want to explore the seasonality, right? So when you further explore the seasonality of our data, we can use box plots basically to group the data by different time periods and display the distribution for each group. Now, how do we do that? Let's come here and let's see how box plot works. So I can just do a simple box plot and I can choose my consumption column and that gives me just the consumption data, but this really does not give me any meaning. I can look at solar data, I can look at the wind data, and we can also see some outliers here. So we can create box plots, but if we would want to do a box plot, what is box plot? It is basically a visual display of your five number summary. That is, you want to look at your mean, median, you want to look at your 25th percentile, 50 percentile, or 75th percentile so we can use a quantile function use the consumption column and then you basically give a vector which shows you fine number summary so that's your quantile and then let's do a box plot so if you are looking at quantile it tells me what is the minimum what is 25th percentile 50 75th and 100 that's from my consumption column so let's create a box plot for consumption 
let's give it a name as consumption let's give y axis as consumption and a limit for y axis now that's my consumption graph so i can look at yearly data now that will make more meaning rather than just looking at the complete consumption data so how do we do it yearly so we will say consumption and then i will say the year column so it is consumption but grouped based on year so here i can give x axis y axis and i can give y limit so let's create this and this makes more meaning we can give some coloring scheme here but now i'm looking at 2006 2007 8 9 and so on and we can look at the data what is the range right it gives me five percentile or sorry five number summary of the data per year and it basically allows me to look at the seasonality of this similarly we can create box plot by just giving consumption yearly grouped and here i'm giving the title as consumption y axis x axis and y limit wherein I can also use LAS. So this is one more feature which you can do. And that basically will give me the tick points. If you compare this one to the previous graph. So when I created this previous graph, I had 2006, 2008, and I had from 600 to 1800. And if I go for the next one, I am basically seeing more useful information. Now let's look at monthly data. So I would want to group it based on months and let's create that. So this gives me the monthly data where I'm looking at months and I could select a particular year or I can just do a grouping based on months. So I can have multiple plots to see a difference here. So let's do this. Now let's create a box plot for consumption, which is monthly data and let's give it a color let's look at the wind data which is again grouped monthly and let's look at the solar data which is grouped monthly now if i zoom in it basically gives me the seasonality of the data for your wind for your consumption for your solar so what we are doing is we are creating these box plots which are giving us values now what i can also do is I could look at the day wise also, but before we look into this, how do I infer some information from these box plots which are being created? So this is what we have done where we are looking at the data for month and these box plots give me year seasonality, which we were seeing in earlier plots, but give some additional insights. So if I look at the data here, it tells me the electricity consumption is generally higher in winter now this is based on months so we can see consumption is higher in winters and lower in summer so we can obviously look at our plot we can see where it is lower where it is higher and then we can look at the median and lower two quartiles are lower in december and january compared to november and february so that is you look at the quartiles and you will see that the median and lower two quartiles are lower in December and January. Here Jan and December. So you can look at from my plot. Now this is giving you some idea on seasonality. Now that might be due to business being closed over holidays. Now this one we were also seeing when we looked at time series for 2017 only and box plot basically confirms that there is this consistent pattern throughout the years. Now when you look at your solar and wind power production both will give you a year seasonality what we are seeing here and if basically I look at the data so it depends on what parameters you are choosing but if you look at solar it will reflect the effect of occasional extreme wind speeds associated with storms and other transient and since we are grouping it based on months we can see this pattern is quite evident every year now what we can do is we can group the data day wise so here let me again reset this to one plot per graph now i'll say box plot 
I'll say consumption, which is group based on day. Now we know that there is a day column and let's give a while limit and let's look at the data. So this is where I'm grouping the data day wise. So you look at 31 days and you look at the box plot. So this is where you are plotting it on a daily basis. So you can look at the data. You can break it down to a particular week. So here I have given a day and I have chosen all the 31 days, but I can break it down to a week and I can look at the data. So if we look at the data per week or per day, we can basically infer that electricity consumption where I'm doing a consumption group by day is higher on weekdays than on weekends. So time series with strong seasonality can often be represented with models that can decompose signal into seasonality and long trend. Now this is an easy way. Now how do we look at the frequency of the data? That could be interesting to see. So let me uh, look at say the yearly data which we were seeing here. Now let's go further and here we have looked at data. So what we will do is we look at the frequency. Now when you look at the frequency, when you talk about frequency in your data, so we have the modified date column which gives me a frequency and if we really look into the data that will tell me that the data is on a daily basis. So for that, let's look at my data three again, which gives me data and you can just see all the data's data or dates are in sequence. So your 22, 23, 24, 25, 26 and so on. I can look at, I can access a dplyr package that is basically allowing me to work in a better way. Now I can look at the summary of this and for all my columns, I'm seeing what is the minimum five number summary date and consumption. So date does not show me anything because this is not in a date format. It is just a factor, but other things have the five number summary. So we are looking at wind plus solar. We are looking at year and month and day and all these columns. Now what we will do is we will want to find out the sum of each column. How many entries does it have? And we will say the value should any value should not be considered. So let's look at this one. So it tells me for my particular columns. So let me run this again. And that shows me for each column how many values you have. And these counts do not include the NA values. Now, similarly, I can find out specifically for consumption. I can find out is there any NA value? So I'm saying is dot NA and let's find out if there is any NA value or missing value in consumption. It says zero. Okay, that's good. If you look in wind, it tells me there are 1463 entries which are NA. Similarly, solar. Similarly, wind dot solar or wind plus solar. So it gives me a count of NA values that is missing values and also values which are not missing. So to understand frequency, what we can do is we can find out the minimum on the date. That is the first column and I'm saying RM NA dot RM is true. That is get rid of NA values and find out the minimum. And let's look at the minimum value. This is the minimum from my modified date. Now, if I would want to get the frequency, I can basically use sequence function. So I can say from X minimum, that is the minimum value. I want to look at the frequency that is day wise. And let's just look at five entries and see if there is a day by day frequency. So let's look at the value of this. And obviously it tells me there is day wise frequency. So that allows me to look at the frequency, look at the type of it. It is an integer class is a date. So similarly, we can say from X minimum, we can basically look at the frequency month wise and I can again look at five records. So that shows me monthly data, right? So I can extract the data for frequency. Similarly, yearly data. 
and that's also very useful now we can select data which has any values for wind so how do i do it i would want to find out the wind column and i want to find out where the values are in a so i will create a variable and here i will say my data 3 and then i give a conditional where i say is na in the column so let's do this now once i've done this once i've done this i have said that my selected wind data from my data 3 where we said na values and i will give the names to this so name should be in my data 3 i'm interested in mod data consumption wind and solar so these are the four columns i'm interested in let's look at first 10 records here or first 10 rows so that tells me these are the values where wind has na or missing values i can always do a view and that gives me the complete data so it basically shows me 1463 entries and here it shows me all na values so you can look at all the way to the end and it shows me wind has na solar does have some value here in the last row but then also if you see the numbers have a difference so you have 1461 and then you have 2174 so there is a difference so there is some data in between where wind has some values so we have found out na values now what we will do is we will select data which does not have any values so i will call it cell selected wind 2 i'll again use my data 3 i will say which but now i'm saying not na from this column and i will select the data for the columns so i'm interested in looking at 10 records and this shows me not any value so no more missing values so if i really look at this data as i saw earlier which has na and if i look at these values which are not any for the wind column so looking at these two results we will know that in year 2011 wind column has some missing values so let's focus on year 2011 so how do i do that let's call it a different variable i'll say my data 3 i will say here when i say which where we were saying na here i will say the year should have a value of 2011 and i want all these columns let's look at the data here and this is showing me 2011 but we are not seeing all the values so there are some values but then there are some missing values also for 2011 based on whatever analysis we have done so let's look at the class of this it is basically a data frame do a view and this one will help me in finding out where are the na values so if you just scroll down looking at all the data let's search if wind column has a na or a missing value and i will see if there is any missing value in which column or which row it is for the wind column so we have all the values which are existing i could select and search for one specific value and i'll show you how we can do that so here let's scroll all the way down so it's like you're exploring your data and seeing is wind column having na or missing value for a particular row and let's scroll here and here you see there is a missing value for one particular row so 13th december 2011 has wind value 15 december has wind value but your 14th december does not have right similarly we can search so there was only one entry which was missing now that could be for some reason might be it was not calculated might be it was not tabulated so we have a missing value and that can affect my plotting that can affect my analysis so let's look at the number of rows in this which will tell me how many rows we have for 2011 so it tells me 365 so that is basically the number of days in a year now we will find out if there were any values so we earlier checked total number of any values per column that is in your row number 265 to 269 we can see here 265 to 269 so this is where we were seeing 
Are there any NA values, right? So let's go back here. And we want to find out the number of NA values for a particular year. How do I do it? So I can just do a sum. I will say is NA. Now I'm interested in my data three wind column and I'm saying my year has to be 2011, but I'm finding out the NA values. So let's do this and it tells me one and that's right. That's what we saw when we did a view. Let's see how many non NA values you have and that is 364. So that basically satisfies my logic. So it's 364 plus one missing. So there are 365. Let's look at the structure of this. It tells me you have modified date and date format. You have consumption, wind and solar. Now let's create a variable selected wind four. I will say wind three, that is which was having all my NA and non NA values for 2011. I will say, let's find out the NA value because I'm interested in finding out that particular row. So I'm saying, find out where the value is NA and I want all the columns. Let's look at this one. And this is my specific row which has a NA value. Now, we know that data follows a daywise frequency, which we have clearly seen. Now let's select data which has NA and non NA values. So let's say, let's call it test one. I will use win three, which has NA and non NA values. But now I will say, I want the modified date, which should be greater than 12, 12, 2001. Now remember we had, when we were doing a view, we saw that one particular day or what we see here, 14th of December, there is no date. So I will select a subset of data, which includes this NA and non NA. That is might be I can take 13th of December and 15th of December. So let's start from 12, 12. So the date should be greater than 12, 12. That means 13th and it should be less than 16. So that is 15th and the columns, right? So now we have some data. Let's look at this. So I have a I've selected a subset of data. I could have done this using subset also. So I have any and non any values. Now, why are we doing this? So sometimes you might have some data for a particular column and you may want to find out if there are any missing values might be you want to fill them up or replace them with something. So that is usually useful when you are doing a trend detection. So say, for example, you have data for every month and might be in one one of the months you have missed or might be you have data for every year collected monthly and then in one of the years for a couple of months, you don't have the data like I can say 2016. I have data for all 12 months, 2017, all 12 months, 2018 might be I don't have data for March and June 2019. I don't have data for same months so I can forward fill or backward fill them using the previous year's same month data. So we can do that. So here I have test data where I've extracted a subset of data. I can look at the class of this. It is a data frame structure of this. It has the columns. Now let's use the library and function and use the tidy R package. And what we will do is we will fill it up. So I will use test one. I will fill the wind column, which has a missing value. Now, once you do this, if you notice, it has done a forward fill. So it has taken the previous value and it has just filled up that. So you can fill up the data using different directions, such as up and down, left and right, and so on. So we can take care of missing values in our frequency data, which allows us to basically analyze the data in a better way. Now, here we will want to also look at some more data. So this is to deal with frequencies of fill column, wherein you can take care of missing values forward filled. So filling values can be done in different directions, as I said, and you may want to first convert your time series to specified frequency if your data does not have a frequency, but we had. Now, if you do not have a frequency, might be you can convert it into a frequency such as weekly, daily, monthly, as I showed you. And then basically you can 
do a forward fill for the values. So for example, if I have my data, I can break it down into weekly and then look at the values. And if there are any values missing for weekly data, I can use a forward fill. So that can take care of my frequency data. Then let's look at the trends of the data, which is the last part of this project. So basically, let's look at the trend. So when you say trend, what does that mean? So in time series data, you always have some kind of trend. So that will exhibit some slow gradual variability in addition to higher frequency variability such as seasonality and noise. Now to visualize these trends, what we do is we use what we call as rolling means. So we know how our data is spread over year or month or day. But how about looking at a rolling average and see what is the difference? So a rolling mean will tend to smooth a time series by averaging out the variations and frequencies. So this can be higher than the window size. So there is something called as windowing where you can choose a set of time frame. You can also average out any seasonality on a time scale equal to window size. So this will allow you to look at lower frequency variation in the data. So when we are looking at electricity consumption time series, we already saw there is a weekly pattern. There is a yearly seasonality, which we saw using box plots. So we can also look at the rolling means of the time scales. How do we do that? So for this, you can use some package like zoo, and then you can basically use a rolling mean using the zoo package. And you can say what is the frequency with which you want to calculate the rolling mean. Now, how do we do this? Let's look at this data. So here I'm going to my look at my data three, which we have been using so far. Now let's call it a three day test. You can give it any name. I'm going to use my data three. I'm using the pipe in function. Now I will use dplyr and I will arrange the data in descending in year. Now you can always break it down step by step and you can see the result of this. So I'm going to arrange this data in descending order of year. So obviously my last one 2017 or 2018 will be on the top. You want to group the data by year. So it depends on how many years we have. We'll see. So you can group the data by year. Now this data is then used to basically mutate. So mutate function is going to allow me to use this rolling mean. So I'll call it as says 0, 03 day. So I'm going to calculate a rolling mean every three days for my consumption column. And basically let's ungroup this. So let's see how this works. Sorry. Yeah, let's look at this. And here when I'm doing a three day test, let's look at the result of this and then I'll explain this. So if you see here, we have the test three day column. Now this has the rolling average. Now what does that mean? So first value here, what we see is 1367 is the average consumption in 2017 from the first date with the data point on either side of it. That is, you can look at this date. So 1130, then you look at you are looking at the value 1367 here. So you look at 1130, 1441, 1530. If I take a mean of these, so for example, if I would just do this part, and that is giving me mean, okay, because I have a comment. So let's basically add anything as comment, and then let's do this. So it saves me 1367. That's what we are seeing here, right? So you're getting a rolling average every three days. Similarly, if you want every five days, it takes the five values and it gets the mid value, right? So you can always find out the mean rolling mean for a particular frequency. Now, let's do that for seven days. That is weekly data and yearly data. That is 365 days. So how do I do it? Same logic. My data test. Now I'm using my data three. I'm arranging it in a descending order. I'm grouping by year. So when you do a group by year, so earlier when we did a grouping by and when we looked at the data, it was telling me how many rows we had, right? So let's do a grouping by year 
and let's say test 07 so that's a rolling average every seven days and i'm also saying take care of the na values similarly i'm getting rolling average every 365 days might be you can do quarterly might be you can do half yearly and let's do this so let's create this my data test and let's look at the result of this so i will use my data test i will say arrange based on modified date now we know there is a column called modified date i want to just look at 2017 data so i'm doing a filter right and then i will choose what are the columns i'm interested in so i will look at the 7 and 365 day and let's look at say first seven records so let's do this and that basically gives me the consumption value modified date year and my rolling seven day average or the seven day mean which is for first seven days and then 365 you will not see the data here but if i do a view on this i can basically see the values so you can always select a particular column to see the values these are the values for every seven day rolling average this is for 365 days every 365 days so you see all the values are missing but every 365 entry you will have basically some data now let's do a plotting of this and basically visualize this data which we are seeing rolling average so let me first do a plotting one plot per graph and let's do a plotting i will take consumption data x-axis y-axis color and give a title to this so let's create this and that's my consumption data which is spread over a period of time and that's fair enough but now let's add some more plot to this so i will add the seven day rolling average to this so for second plot to be added in the same one in r you can use points so i will say points i will choose seven data column type is line width x limit y limit and color so let's do this and that's my pattern seven day rolling average which basically gives me some kind of trend similarly i can add one more here and this time i will choose the 365 day and look at the pattern lines so now you see some dots here well you could do it in a different way so i can just add legend to this and i can say legend will be a where in x axis and y axis so i'm saying it will be 2500 and y is 1800 so my legend will come in somewhere here i'm saying my legend will have consumption test and this one i can give some names i can give what is the color i can say what kind of legend it explains what is for each color and then basically a vector so let's add a legend to this and i've added a legend now you can do a zoom and look at the data and here i see that uh, my x-axis is fine but y-axis is going a little out of my plotting area so i can actually change that so here i have 1800 how about making it 1600 and let's look at this one so we can basically uh, go for this one and start again here plot and points and line and then add a legend right and you can basically place your legend anywhere in the plot so this basically is giving me the trend what i'm looking at my rolling average so similarly you can look at the trend for wind and solar data so what we are seeing here is when you look at trend this is one more way of looking at it you can always create plots in different ways so seven day rolling mean has smoothed out all weekly seasonality which we were seeing here in my graph where you look at every seven day preserving the yearly seasonality so seven day will tell that electricity consumption is typically higher in winter and lower in summer so better is you break it down uh, yearly so here if you look at every year you can see when is winter when is summer what is the seasonality what your trend what you're seeing here and if there is a decrease or increase uh, for few weeks every winter 
So similarly, if you look at 365, now as you said, as I said, rolling average basically uh, reduces the variation. So if I look at 365 rolling mean, we can see long term trend in electricity consumption is pretty flat. Now that's what we are seeing. It's kind of pretty flat. There is not much variation over years if you really join these dots. So we can basically see some highs and lows and that gives me a trend. Now this is how you can do a trend detection and similarly we can do plotting for wind and solar. So this is a small project which I demonstrated using R. Now all this code which you have here in the form of a project.r file you can find here in my github page this is the document which explains some things feel free to download this and you can add details to it this is the sample data set which you can also find in my repository in the data sets folder so continue learning and continue practicing r everyone knows there is an enormous amount of data generated every second it has become crucial to analyze those data as they can be very useful. Everyone is aware of the importance of big data analytics from big retail markets to education, from the banking sector to clothing brands. It is everywhere. How do you handle them? How do you process them at all? The answer to all these questions is big data analytics. Hi, this is Sahana from Simply Learn. Today we will learn interesting terms about big data analytics which has become a buzzword everywhere around. Before we start, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. So let's go through the topics to be covered in today's video. Let's start by getting introduced to what is big data analytics. Next, we will learn about importance of big data analytics. Next, types of big data analytics followed by life cycle of big data analytics, tools and advantages of big data analytics and finally we will go through use cases of big data analytics. First we must understand what do you mean by big data analytics. Big data analytics is the technique to analyze valuable data sets having any format like structured, unstructured or semi-structured. For example, music industries like Spotify. The company has nearly 96 million users that generate tremendous amount of data every day. Using this information, the application generates suggested songs through smart recommendation techniques based on likes, shares, search history and many more. Playlists are created automatically and many more automated processes can happen. What enables this is the techniques, tools and frameworks that are a result of big data analytics. If you are a Spotify user, then you must have come across the top recommendation sections, which is based on your like, past history and other things. Utilizing a recommendation engine that leverages data filtering tools that collect data and then filter it using algorithm. This is how Spotify works. By collecting and analyzing proper data and incorporating it into business plans which will further help them in decision making. This is how big data analytics helps big business organizations. 72% of e-commerce companies rely on data produced from big data analytics and this data is increasing day by day. Any YouTube channel can use data analytics to analyze user interest and develop his next project based on that. What is the importance of the topic? Why do we need to study big data analytics is the biggest question. It is observed that every organization adopts this technique for a better understanding of data and its use. Cloud-based analytics can store a large amount of data with minimal cost. For example, tools like Zoho Analytics, Microsoft Power BI and many more. Thus, big data analytics can result as cost efficient. The way of analyzing it is very swift, which will help to analyze all the sources. This will contribute to quick decision making in any organization. The result of such analysis will help to develop new products. 
as due to these products analysis of the companies will know about their customer likings and behavior due to all these efficient strategies big data analytics is very crucial let's move forward and understand what are the types in big data analytics types of big data analytics first let's try and understand descriptive analysis it includes processing past and present data set which will lead to help in trend analysis in predictive analysis it makes future predictions based on past or historical data sets which will help in decision making The diagnostic analysis is an advanced analysis system in which introspections are made based on why that has mm -hmm. happened and further decisions are taken based on the available data sets. Prescriptive mm -hmm. analytics is the process of using data to determine an optimal course of action. The next topic we are covering is the life cycle of data analytics. First is business case evaluation will help decision makers to understand the source of business. In this case, the learner or the team will learn about the business domain which presents the motivation and goals for carrying out the analysis. In this point, the problems get identified and assumptions are made based on the available data sets. In the identification of data, once the business case is identified, now it's time to find the appropriate data sets to work with. In this stage, analysis is done to see what other companies have done for a similar data sets. In data filtration, once the source of data is identified, now it's time to gather data from such resources. This kind of data is mostly unstructured. Then it is subjected to filtration such as removal of corrupt data or irrelevant data, which is of no scope further. Now the data is filtered, but there might be a possibility that some of the entries of such data is incompatible. To rectify this issue, a separate phase is created called as extraction phase. In this phase, the data which don't match the underlying scope of the analysis are extracted and transformed. In data aggregations, data sets are validated and combined with common feed. For instance, we can take data set of a student. One data set can be named as student academic section and the other can be named as student personal details. Then both can be joined together via common feed. We can take it as roll number. Depending on the nature of big data problem, analysis is carried out. Data analysis can be classified as confirmatory analysis and exploratory analysis. In confirmatory analysis, the cause of the phenomenon is analyzed before. The assumption is called hypothesis. The data is analyzed to approve or disapprove the hypothesis. Such kind of analysis will provide definitive answer to some specific questions and confirms whether an assumption was true or not. In exploratory analysis, the data is explored to obtain information that why a phenomenon has occurred. This type of analysis answer why a phenomenon occurred. This kind of analysis doesn't provide definitive information. Meanwhile, it can provide discovery of certain patterns. Visualization or data visualization is said to influence the interpretation of the results. Moreover, it will allow the user to discover answer to certain questions that are yet to be formulated. The analysis is done. The results are visualized. Now it's time for the business user to make decisions using the result. The result can be used for optimization to define business processes. It can be used as an input for the system to enhance performance. This is all about life cycle of data analytics. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. There are multiple tools available on the market which can help companies in big data analytics. 
Let us go through some of these tools. MongoDB, Hadoop, Tableau, Cassandra. These are the main tools which are used in big data analytics. Let's go for MongoDB. MongoDB is an open source tool that supports data storage. It is a NoSQL document oriented database. MongoDB is used by Facebook and Google for data storage. MongoDB is best suited for big data where resulting data and further manipulation for the desired output. Some of the powerful resources are CRUD operations, aggregation framework, text research and the map reduce features. Apache Hadoop is the most famous tool. It is an open source software utility to store and process gigabytes and terabytes of dataset. It uses the MapReduce programming module to solve problems of analyzing massive data. MapReduce is a framework that helps programs do the parallel computation on data. The map task takes input data and converts it into a dataset that can be computed in key value pairs. The output of the map task is consumed by reducing task to aggregate output and provide the desired result. Tableau is a software company that offers collaborative data visualization software for organizing working with business information analytics. Organizations use Tableau to visualize data and reveal pattern for analysis in business intelligence. Apache Cassandra is highly scalable, high-performed distributed database designed to handle large amount of data across many commodities like servers, providing high availability with no single point of failure. It is a type of NoSQL database. Now we have covered the important tools used by Big Data Analytics. Let us go and cover distinct advantage of Big Data Technology. Advantages of Big Data Analytics Innovation of new ideas leading to product development, which means developing new products provides a means to target new markets, increase market share, sell more and increase revenue streams. Meanwhile, redesigning existing products enables costs to be cut, margins to be decreased and ultimately more profits to be made. Risk management insights about customers' likings and behavior and market trends will help decision maker to take their position. On top of that, it will help to get rid of financial risk. It will also assist to detect potential cyber risk. One benefit from big data and business analytics can help improve decision making by identifying patterns, identifying problems and providing data to back up the solution is beneficial whether the solution is solving the problem, improving the situation or it has an insignificant effect. Here customer engagement specifically how your customers view and interact with your brand is a key factor. Big data analytics provides the business intelligence you need to bring about positive changes like improving existing products or increasing revenue per customer. Next, improving data quality will improve operational efficiency and valued feedback from customer which will help businesses to handle vast amounts of data. It will also help in enabling data driven decision. But how do these advantages related to the real world? Let us cover some real life use cases empowered by big data analytics. Use Cases of Big Data Analytics Amazon is a well-known name to all of us. It is among the leading e-commerce platforms. Apart from offering online shopping, Amazon serves us with different services like Amazon Pay, Amazon Web Services and many more. 
for a company like amazon the amount of data collected on a regular basis is very big to manage such vast amount of data companies leverage big data technology for any company like netflix one of the most valuable asset is the customer base because it is the customer who turns the company into a brand and if a company fails to meet the expectations of the customer that probably leads to its decline big data is a technology that helps in the management of large amount of data big data is like a heart for american express decision making their main goal is to detect fraudulent transaction as soon as possible for reducing loss and in this big data plays a very important role they use big data for anticipating and analyzing customers behavior by looking at recorded transactions and incorporating more than 100 variables the company assigns modern predictive models instead of customary businesses next is very important that is google google uses big data to understand what we want from it based on several parameters such as search history locations trends and many more after that it goes through an algorithm where complex estimations are done and afterwards google easily shows the arranged or positioned index list as far as significance and authority intended to coordinate the users this is all about use cases of big data analytics let's now start this lesson by defining what data visualization is data visualization is the technique to present the data in a pictorial or graphical format it enables stakeholders and decision makers to analyze data visually The data in graphical format allows them to identify new trends and patterns easily. Well, you might think, why data visualization is important? Let's explain with an example. You are a sales manager in a leading global organization. The organization plans to study the sales details of each product across all regions and countries. This is to identify the product which has the highest sales in a particular region and up the production. This research will enable the organization to increase the manufacturing of that product in the particular region. The data involved for this research might be huge and complex. The research on this large numeric data is difficult and time-consuming when it is performed manually. When this numeric data is plotted on a graph or converted to charts, it's easy to identify the patterns and predict the result accurately. The main benefits of data visualization are as follows. It simplifies the complex quantitative information. It helps analyze and explore big data easily. It identifies the areas that need attention or improvement. It identifies the relationship between data points and variables. It explores new patterns and reveals hidden patterns in the data. There are 3 major considerations for data visualization. They are clarity, accuracy and efficiency first ensure the data set is complete and relevant this enables the data scientist to use the new patterns yield from the data in the relevant places second ensure using appropriate graphical representation to convey the right message third use efficient visualization technique which highlights all the data points there are some basic factors that one would need to be aware of before visualizing the data visual effect coordination system data types and scale informative interpretation visual effect includes the usage of appropriate shapes colors and size to represent the analyzed data the coordinate system helps to organize the data points within the provided coordinates the data types and scale choose the type of data such as numeric or categorical The informative interpretation helps create visuals in an effective and easily interpretable manner using labels, title, legends and pointers. So far you have learned what data visualization is and how it helps interpret results with large and complex data. 
With the help of the Python programming language, you can perform this data visualization. You'll learn more about how to visualize data using the Python programming language in the subsequent screens. Many new Python data visualization libraries are introduced recently, such as Matplotlib, Visby, Boca, Seaborn, Pygol, Folium, and Networks. The Matplotlib has emerged as the main data visualization library. Let's now learn about this Matplotlib in detail. Matplotlib is a Python two-dimensional plotting library for data visualization and creating interactive graphics or plots. Using Python's Matplotlib, the data visualization of large and complex data becomes easy. There are several advantages of using Matplotlib to visualize data. They are as follows. It's a multi-platform data visualization tool built on the NumPy and SciPy framework. Therefore, it's fast and efficient. It possesses the ability to work well with many operating systems and graphic backends. It possesses high-quality graphics and plots to print and view for a range of graphs, such as histograms, bar charts, pie charts, scatter plots, and heat maps. With Jupyter Notebook integration, the developers have been freed to spend their time implementing features rather than struggling with cross-platform compatibility. It has large community support and cross-platform support as it is an open source tool. It has full control over graph or plot styles such as line properties, fonts, and axis properties. Let's now try to understand a plot. A plot is a graphical representation of data which shows relationship between two variables or the distribution of data. Look at the example shown on the screen. This is a two-dimensional line plot of the random numbers on the y-axis and the range on the x-axis. The background of the plot is called grid. The text first plot denotes the title of the plot and text line one denotes the legend. You can create a plot using four simple steps. Import the required libraries, define or import the required data set, Set the plot parameters. Display the created plot. Let's consider the same example plot used earlier. Follow the steps below to obtain this plot. The first step is to import the required libraries. Here we have imported NumPy and PyPlot and style from Matplotlib. NumPy is used to generate the random numbers and PyPlot, which is built in Python library, is used to plot numbers, and style class is used for setting the grid style. Matplotlib inline is required to display the plot within Jupyter Notebook. The second step is to define or import the required data set. Here we have defined the data set random number using NumPy random method. Note that the range is 10. We have used the print method to view the created random numbers. The third step is to set the plot parameters. In this step, we set the style of the plot, labels of the coordinates, title of the plot, the legend, and the line width. In this example, we have used ggplot as the plot style. The plot method is used to plot the graph against the random numbers. In the plot method, the word g denotes the plot line color as green, label denotes the legend label, and it's named as line one. Also, the line width is set to 2. Note that we have labeled the x-axis as range and the y-axis as labels, and set the title as first plot. The last step is to display the created plot. Use the legend method to plot the graph based on the set conditions and the show method to display the created plot. Let's now learn how to create a two-dimensional plot. Consider the following example. A Nutri Worldwide firm wants to know how many people visit its website at a particular time. This analysis helps it control and monitor the website traffic. This example involves two variables, namely users and time. Therefore, this is a two-dimensional or 2D plot. Take a look at the program that creates a 2D plot. 
Object Web Customers is a list on the number of users and time hours indicates the time. From this, we understand that there are 123 customers on the website at 7 a.m., 645 customers on the website at 8 a.m., and so on. The ggplot is used to set the grid style and the plot method is used to plot the website customers against time. Don't forget to map plot library in line to display or view the plot on the Jupyter Notebook. The website traffic curve is plotted and the graph is shown on the screen. It's also possible to change the line style of the plot. To change the line style of the plot, use define the line style as dashed in the plot method. Observe the output graph changes to a dashed line. Also note that the color is defined as blue. Using matplotlibrary, it's also possible to set the desired axis to interpret the required result. Use the axis method to set the axis. In this example shown on the screen, the x-axis is set to range from 6.5 to 17.5, and the y-axis is set to range from 50 to 2000. Let's now understand how to set the transparency level of the line and to annotate a plot. Alpha is an attribute which controls the transparency of the line. Lower the alpha value, more transparent the line. Here, the alpha value is defined as 0 0.4. The annotate method is used to annotate the graph. The syntax for annotate method is shown on the screen. The keyword max is the attribute that denotes the annotation text HA indicates the horizontal alignment. VA indicates the vertical alignment. XY text indicates the text position, and XY indicates the arrow position. The keyword arrow props indicates the properties of the arrow. In this example, the arrow property is defined as the green color. The output graph is shown on the screen. So far, you've learned how to set line width, title, x-axis, and y-axis label, title of the plot, legend, line color, and annotate the graph for a single plot. The plot we created for website traffic in the previous screens is for only one day. Let's now learn how to create multiple plots, say for three days, using the same example. The data set number of user for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is defined with respect to its time distribution. Use different color and line width for each day to distinguish the plot. In this example, we have used red for Monday, green for Tuesday, and blue for Wednesday. The output graph is shown on the screen. A subplot is used to display multiple plots in the same window. With a subplot, you can arrange plots in a regular grid. All you need to do is specify the number of rows, columns, and plot. The syntax for a subplot is shown on the screen. It divides the current window into an M by N grid and creates an axis for a subplot in the position specified by P. For example, subplot 2, 1, 2 creates two subplots which are stacked vertically on a grid. If you want to plot four graphs in one window, then the syntax used should be subplot 2, 1, 4. Layout and spacing adjustment are two important factors to be considered while creating subplots. Use PLT subplots adjust method with the parameters H space and W space to adjust the distances between the subplot and move them around on the grid. In this demo, you can see how to create two subplots that will display side by side in a single frame. Two subplots stacked one on top of the other or vertically split in a single frame. And four subplots displayed in a single frame. First, import matplotlib, pyplot, and style. Type percentage matplotlib in line to view the plot in Jupyter Notebook. Define the parameters such as temperature, wind, humidity, precipitation data, and time data. You can see the data being typed here. Next, to create two subplots to be displayed side by side in a given frame for 1, 2, 1 and 1, 2, 2, specify the figure size, subplot space, title, 
the color for time and temperature data, which is blue here, and line style and width. Similarly, specify the color for wind, which is red, its line style, and width. You can see the temperature and wind subplot charts displayed side by side in a given frame here. To create subplots for 211 and 212, specify the parameters. This will create two subplots stacked one on top of the other or vertically split in a given frame. Let's use humidity and precipitation data to plot the graphs. Specify the title, color, line style, and line width for both the graphs. You can see the two subplots stacked one on top of the other with two different colors indicating precipitation and humidity. Here, the two graphs are separate. Finally, let's draw four subplots for 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, and 2, 2, 4 that will display in a given frame. Specify the title, subplot data, color, line style, and line width for all four subplots. you can see the four subplots displayed in a single frame. In this demo, you learned how to create subplots displayed side by side, vertically split subplots, and four subplots displayed in a single frame using matplotlib. You can create different types of plots using matplotlibrary, histogram, scatterplot, heat map, high chart, error bar, histograms, Histograms are graphical representations of a probability distribution. In fact, a histogram is a kind of bar chart. Using matplotlibrary and its bar chart function, you can create histogram charts. 
a histogram chart has several advantages. Some of them are as follows. It displays the number of values within a specified interval. It's suitable for large data sets as they can be grouped within the intervals. Scatter plots. A scatter plot is used to graphically display the relationship between variables. A basic plot can be created using the plot method. However, if you need more control of a plot, it's recommended that you use the scatter method provided by MatPlotLibrary. It has several advantages. It shows the correlation between variables. It's suitable for large data sets. It's easy to find clusters. It's possible to represent each piece of data as a point on the plot. In this demo, you'll learn how to generate a histogram and scatter plot using MatPlotLib. Let's import a dataset called Boston Dataset which we will use to create the histogram and scatter plot from the Scikit-Learn library. Let's import matplotlib pyplot. Type percentage matplotlib in line to view the plot in Jupyter Notebook. Let's use the data in Boston Real Estate Dataset to create the histogram and scatter plot. Load this data. You can view this data by using the print command. Now define the x axis for the data which is Boston real estate data. Likewise, define the y-axis for the data, which is Boston real estate data, with the target extension. Specify the plot style, figure style, number of bins, and labels of the x-axis and y-axis. Use the show method to display the histogram created by you. Specify the style, size, datasets, and labels of the scatter plot that you want to create. Use the show method to display the scatter plot created by you. Heat maps. A heat map is a better way to visualize two dimensional data. Using heat maps, you can gain deeper and quicker insight into data than those afforded by other types of plots. It has several advantages. It draws attention to the risky prone area. It uses the entire data set to draw bigger and more meaningful insights. It's used for cluster analysis and can deal with large data sets. In this demonstration, you'll learn how to generate a heat map for a data set using matplotlib. Let's import the required libraries, matplotlib, pyplot, and seaborn. Type percentage matplotlib inline to view the plot in Jupyter Notebook. 
Let's load the flights dataset from the built-in datasets of Seaborn Library. Use head to view the top five records of the dataset. We have to arrange the columns to generate the heat map. Let's use the pivot method to arrange the columns, month, year, and passengers. Let's view the flight dataset that's now ready to generate the heat map. Let's use the heat map method and pass flight data as an argument. This will generate the heat map, which you can see here. In this demo, you learned how to create and display a heat map. Pie charts. Pie charts are typically used to show percentage or proportional data. Note that usually the percentage represented by each category is provided next to the corresponding slice of the pie. Matplot Library provides the pie method to make pie charts. It has several advantages. It summarizes a large data set in visual form. It displays the relative proportions of multiple classes of data. The size of the circle is made proportional to the total quantity. In this demonstration, you'll learn how to create a pie chart and display it. First, import matplotlib pieplot. Type percentage matplotlib in line to view the plot in Jupyter Notebook. Type the job data within parentheses using single quotes separated by commas. Specify the labels as IT, Finance, Marketing, Admin, HR, and Operations. Specify the slice IT to explode. Use the show method to display the pie chart. You can see the pie chart with the slices, labels, and IT, the largest slice. Error bars. An error bar is used to show the graphical representation of the variability of data. It's used mainly to point out errors. It builds confidence about the data analysis by unleashing the statistical differences between the two groups of data. It has several advantages. It shows the variability in data and indicates the errors. It depicts the precision in the data analysis. It demonstrates how well a function and a model are used in the data analysis. It defines the underlying data. Seaborn is a Python visualization library based on Matplot Library. It provides a high-level interface for drawing attractive statistical graphics. It was originally developed at Stanford University and is widely used for plotting and visualizing data. There are several advantages. It possesses built-in themes for better visualizations. It has tools built in statistical functions which reveal hidden patterns in the dataset. It has functions to visualize matrices of data, which become very important when visualizing large data sets. Now, why Power BI? So generally, uh, you know, visualization tools, reporting tools are required in order to create and prepare and analyze meaningful data. It could be a data for an organization. It could be a social media platform data. It could be a data from IoT devices, but something which needs to be analyzed and some intelligent inferences and data mining has to be done on top of it. Now imagine there is today we are in a world where terabytes of data and information is getting generated on an instantaneous basis on minute by minute basis. So it becomes very essential to churn out something meaningful, something intelligent out of it. 
in the market there are a lot of other tools where which are available like Kilix, uh, Alteryx, Tableau and Power BI. So Power BI is a Microsoft product which is one of the most popular products and it comes as a free to download product Microsoft Power BI desktop which is available and I'll show you a couple of ways how you can install it on your machine. But why Power BI is um, uh, popular is because it provides a lot of out of the box features, drag and drop features, which we will talk about in our subsequent sessions and uh, you know classes. But today's session is primarily focused on giving you guys an introduction on what is the purpose of Power BI and what all problems it solves uh, in the in the real world. So Power BI allows you to view, analyze and visualize huge quantities of data and the data could be in any format, Excel, CSV, text or it could be a, a direct connection to a database like SQL, MySQL, uh, Azure, uh, Oracle, anyone, IBM DB2. So it supports n number of uh, uh, you know data types or data sets and it's very powerful in terms of data connectivity. So it uses powerful compression algorithms to import and cache the data within the .pbix file. So it's as convenient as a simple software. If suppose you import a data and then you prepare a report and then you can easily share the reports uh, with your peers or someone who is co-developing with you either through Power BI cloud services or even you can share the pbix file in an email or through any other means and you can share the data set with the concern and they can then work on the report independently. So there are different ways there is no uh, kind of a limitation for you know uh, working on Power BI there are multiple ways and it is very fast it is the most fast uh, tool to work with Excel because definitely Excel is also a Microsoft technology so it works very fast on uh, Excel based data and gives you numbers and reporting at a very high speed. So now once you have imported the data Power BI allows you to model the data allows you to work intelligently on the data it allows you to model the data in a way that if you are importing data from multiple Excel sheets importing data from multiple tables you can easily create a relationship between those tables or data sets in Power BI and then create visually appealing reports meaningful reports as I've been emphasizing and make sense out of that data. No data in silos is of any use. Data in silo means a single worksheet or a single data set will not churn out any meaningful information until unless you basically join it, club it, merge it, union it, append it with some other data sets because a single data set will never be able to hold that much amount of information which is generally required for a you know important report. So it has easy drag and drop functionality with features that allow you to copy all formatting across similar visualization. So just like in Microsoft Excel we use format painter to copy the format of one cell to another it, similar features very very similar to Excel products or Microsoft products they have provided that if you have applied a, a, a particular theme on a report you can easily replicate that on an, a, any other report the font, uh, the header size, the background color you don't need to do it again and again so there's lot of reusable features which are also available okay now as I said Excel is a Microsoft product Power BI is a Microsoft product so they have intercompatibility you can publish data from Excel to Power BI now with the latest developments and enhancements as of today Excel has also uh, plugged in a new feature called Power Pivot which I'll uh, show you uh, later down the line but that also allows you to do a quick analysis not you can't create of course complex reports or uh, uh, fancy reports like Power BI but Power Pivot allows you to create you know quick measures quick functions quick calculations on your data quickly only in Excel so it's an Excel plugin but whereas 
you know you can power bi is also compatible with excel so when you create a report in power bi it gives you inbuilt feature to export your power bi report into excel format directly you don't need to do any programming for it also uh, you can easily publish when you publish your power bi reports it allows you to give some inbuilt intelligence of analyzing your reports in excel and it gives you all those of all those features of exporting your power bi reports into excel which is not available in any other tool or otherwise those tools have to create plugins create add-ins and probably they might charge for it uh, but power bi comes with lot of out of the box features which are very very helpful for analyzing data in excel and vice versa azure cloud now azure itself again is a microsoft cloud uh, uh, tech stack so using power bi with azure allows you to analyze and share large volumes of data so azure basically azure database uh, or azure cloud servers are meant to hold huge amount of data and power bi allows you to have seamless connection you can easily connect to azure data lake uh, you can reduce the time it takes to get insights and increase collaboration between business analysts data engineers and data scientists so azure data lake becomes the central focal point where all your uh, analysts engineers uh, can keep working on on the centralized piece of data and churn out their reports data scientists primarily job is to keep the data in a structured way optimized way optimize the input output operations disk operations and memory utilization so that the reports also get churned out in a faster manner so every uh, you know every person has their own role in order to give a quick refreshable report a quick rendered report any report which is taking huge amount of time to get rendered will not eventually be used by the business users because then it does not solve the purpose the report should be fast report should have uh, you know uh, appropriate filters slices and dices you should be able to uh, you know uh, create the reports or dynamically or you should be able to analyze visualize the data dynamically so all those visualization features are available in power bi and it works seamlessly either it is small data or huge data uh, it allows that you to work on those kind of data in a seamless fashion right so this is just a very uh, quick uh, example of uh, how a typical dashboard looks like dashboard is nothing but you know you have clubbed a couple of multiple reports on a single page and you know if you change a filter uh, a single filter on the page all the reports will honor that filter and the numbers will change accordingly so if you see the in this example there is a filter or a drop down of product id product name employee name or supervisor or a date range so whatever date range or filter you will apply all the reports on this dashboard will get changed based on the filter you have selected so power bi allows you to get insights from data and turn insights into action to take data driven business decision and that is the ultimate goal of any visualization tool that is the purpose for which visualize session tools are bought uh, and purchased by the organizations and data is fed into them now power bi fetches data from factory sensors social media sources to get access to real time analytics so that you are always ready to make timely business decisions so so basically uh, there is a, a, a feature of live connection or cut off data connection so either you can work on data which is residing on a machine and you can just work on the cut off data like for example it's there's a data which is available for sales 2017 2018 and you're just working on a historical data it's a cut off data or it could be possible that you want to be connected live uh, to a, a real time iot based censored based data or social media data like twitter facebook feeds or you know you are connected to live google worksheets that is also possible you just need to publish your google sheet for a public domain embed the ur in, into power bi and then whoever updates that google sheet automatically the power bi report will also start honoring and consuming the new data which is added in the 
uh, Google Sheet. So all those kind of real time streaming analytics is also possible and that is one big feature uh, and very important feature of uh, Power BI which is widely used and has a very huge uh, you know market acceptance and market utilization. Now what is Power BI? Power BI is a business analytics service provided by Microsoft that lets you visualize your data and share insights right. So earlier you know, uh, 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 Microsoft used to have a technology called SSAS. Now they have replaced actually SSAS and SSRS with Power BI. So basically, you can use Power BI on the data which is there in your Excel or any other data source. And the Power BI service or Power BI desktop uh, basically creates a connection to those data sets and uh, import it, cache it and give you a handle to it in order to work with it. So you can create these fancy meaningful visualizations like for example there is a geographical map. If you are importing data for a country or a continent or a region, Power BI will automatically detect that it's a geographical information and give you a map with latitude, longitude information and you just need to plot uh, your, uh, your numbers on the map. Either you can use bubbles or, or either you can use triangles or whatever data uh, structure you want to use. But all the mapping will be available geographically. Then you can create pie charts which is shown in this visualization. You can create tree maps. You can create cards where you know you can highlight the most important numbers like sales, total sales of your company uh, across all the regions or the growth chart or the month on month. Uh, you know sales of your organization or number of total number of products or units sold so whatever is important and to be highlighted for the management to take any meaningful decision or any insights you want to share power bi visualization tool the power bi visualization uh, 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 chart allows you to drag and drop and create wonderful reports okay so what are the features of power bi so Power BI desktop is something a standalone tool which you need to install on your machine. It allows you to build reports by accessing data easily. You do not need advanced report designing or query skills to build a report. Though yes, it is beneficial that if you know uh, some SQL programming, analytical programming or you are aware of advanced features of any analytical tool that might help you but that's not a showstopper uh, you can easily build reports in quick turnaround time without ha needing any technical background you just need to have some analytical uh, mindset and you can create uh, savvy visualization and you know analytical reports stream analytics as i mentioned you can create a live connection uh, with any kind of uh, data. It could be IoT, it could be media, social media, it could be Google Docs, it could be uh, you know any other kind of uh, you know live connection. It could be a live database connection itself. So any insertions or updations or deletions happening will automatically re reflect in your report. Yes, multiple data sources and that has to be the uh, primary criteria for any tool to be popular. If any visualization tool is limited to certain data sets, then you know it will not be highly acceptable in the market. And custom visualizations, right? So as I showed you certain uh, examples in the past uh, in the previous presentation, uh, that feature is very important because someone might want to look the KPIs, look at the KPIs from a different perspective. Some management might want to look at the KPIs from a different perspective. So you need to you need to have uh, that capability to create different visualization from the same data set. Now let's take a look at how to install Power BI desktop on your machine. So basically what you need to do is <coughs> You need to go to this URL powerbi.microsoft.com enus desktop. Okay. 
and you need to just enter this now you can download it for free so just click over here and it will open microsoft store so basically now what microsoft have done in the latest operating systems is that when you are trying to download you can actually directly go to the microsoft store and search for power bi so let's wait for a couple of seconds right here so power bi desktop in microsoft store for me it's already installed so it's asking me to open it i'll open it in a while but for you to, for anyone who is not installed he will see the button of install over here and it will automatically install in your uh, machine and then you can easily go and open power bi desktop now if i click open over here now this is the uh, ui the, of the power bi desktop i'm not going to go right now in creating reports right away we will talk about that in a subsequent session with sample data sets and we will cover the features of power bi desktop one by one but this is what it is this is the whole tool of power bi which is having the visualization pane all the different visualizations are you know can be created from this pane then this is the pane which allows you to select the data data fields then there is a report view data view and relationship view the data model view where multiple relationships you can create you can view the data uh, in the grid of the tables which you will create and the report so you can create multiple reports uh, on multiple pages you can keep adding pages either you can create multiple reports on a single page and it will become a dashboard or you can create separate independent reports on the single page and these are the menu options which we will talk about how you can change color scheming you can do data modeling you can create new reports and you can also transform data which is the biggest feature extract transform and load the data apply different logic changing data types massaging the information creating new joins uh, appending the data you know adding new columns etc etc uh, we that is what you can do in transform data so this itself is a whole different world it's a diff, uh, dedicated topic so we will talk about that in our subsequent sessions so what's in it for us today we will be learning how to connect to data different data types data files like excel pdf then what are the different data importing modes and then i will also show you practically different sets how to import them in power bi and use it for your visualization purpose now what are the steps to connect to data so now we will go directly into power bi and try to import one by one few most commonly and popularly used data sets which are most commonly used uh, in a day-to-day -day activity rest of course there are uh, power bi supports n number of data sources uh, but we will uh, do something practical on the most popular ones so let's let's open our power bi now this is my power bi and first i want to show you that how can i import data directly from a web page and import the data now it is asking for a url in order to import data so what i have done is i have created a google excel sheet with simple data with rows and columns and what i have done is i have sh uh, shared this sh uh, sheet as published to web okay so you just need to say publish to the web the link as web page and say done it's it's automatically published and say link so copy the link which you have published on the web copy this link and then go back to your tableau paste that link over here and click ok now power bi will try to 
establish a connection with this Google Doc sheet because it's published on the web. You need to wait for a while while it is reading. Okay, now it has read one of the HTML tables. So I'll select this one. Now you can see it has it is showing me a preview of the table which is there on my Google Sheet, right? It has 11 rows. So it has all showed all the 11 rows. So now I can go and transform this data because I can see my headers are there starting from the second row. So there's an opportunity for me to transform the data. So I'll go and transform it so that it looks clean. Okay. So first is I need to remove the first row, which is the null row, remove the top rows. Okay. And then I need to use the first row now as a header. So you just click this option, use first row as headers. That's it. So now if you see my row ID, order ID, order date, ship date, all my data is now ready. So I can say close and apply. Click apply changes. Now this is an example of web data import. You can go and preview your data. Right now, uh, the biggest advantage of this data connection is that it's a live data. So for example, I insert another row. Let me change the order ID. Some, some, I've sub changed some basic stuff and I, it's auto saved, control S. Now I'll go to my tableau and I'll refresh. Now you can see as I refreshed my Power Query Editor, I clicked refresh all and I got my new row which is there in the live data. I got that fetched from my Okay, I got that row, the row, num row ID number 12. So I have, to, I have to say close and apply. Now you can see the new row, the row number 12 is now available in my new data set, in the data set because it's a live connection. It's a live connection with the web based Google Sheet. Okay, so this is one important way in which you can import data. Now, let's try to import data from a text file. Now, I've already prepared a text file called subcategories.txt. Now, let me just open it in a notepad. Now, it's a very plain simple file tab separated file in which you have product subcategory id subcategory name and product category key so basically to which product category this particular sub product belongs to right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go back to my get data option and i'm going to select text slash csv option and i'm going to select option mod product subcategories dot txt Okay, so now Power BI has identified that it's a tab delimited file. It has recognized the headers, etc. Right, and I can now directly load this file. Okay, so now once the data is imported in Power BI, it is like irrelevant to me. It's a composite data in, import I am doing. Right, so in my presentation, when I am talking about Importing data, there are different importing modes, right? Import our imp data import can happen through different ways. Okay. One is direct query mode in which I create a live uh, connection to the database, which I'll also show you uh, using MySQL and MS uh, SQL server. 
and also you can do a composite mode in which you can have data imported from Excel plus you can have direct query modes so you can have multiple uh, modes to connect and create a composite data model and that's what we are doing right now in our practical so what we are doing over here is one we have imported data from the web second we have imported data from a text table now after doing text now our next task is to import from csv let's try another one so now i have imported product subcategory now i'll import a csv file so again i'll choose the option text slash csv and now in this csv file let me open this csv file and show you what in it is it so this is a list of all my products product key product subcategory key products uh, stock keeping unit etc a simple csv file and i'm going to import that okay so now it is identified the delimiter is comma rather than a tab and it has already recognized the headers correctly so i load it okay so now my products are there product subcategories are there for product categories now what i have done is i have created a excel mode now so now excel i am using to import my product category so now i have to click on the option of import data from excel and i'll say product categories select the sheet load and now so my products product categories product subcategories though with different uh, uh, data storage types but still now the data is imported into power bi it is a composite data model now another very important data type which you can import is the pdf also right so what i have done is i have created a pdf called customers my customers data is lying in a pdf so what i have done is i have created a pdf which has data for some columns are there like you know customer key prefix first name last name birth date marital status gender email address annual income total children etc etc so this is the data set which i have created in pdf so what i'm going to do is i'm going to select pdf now and import customers.pdf and see it has recognized my table on page one which i'm going to load okay you can rename this as pdf table so this basically these are the different type of data types we have imported pdf excel text csv and web page now let's take a look at another interesting data set which we want to import is the my sql server data set so what i have done is i have already installed my sql server on my local instance and there's already a schema of sql live tutorial over there and i have certain tables already prepared over there like department employee etc so my goal is now to import this data or create a live connection with this data set now in order to import my sql database connection in power bi you need to first download a connector mysql power bi connector so you need to go to this link and then click on download and install the mysql connector based on the operating system you have you click on download and install it after you have done this go back to power bi and then give the ip address of the database in my case it's there in this local machine and the schema which i want to import is sql live tutorial so i'll give the name click connect 
okay now it's connected so now it is asking me which particular tables you want to create a connection with i am choosing department and employee and i'm just loading them okay so now this is the exact data which is there in the employee and department in mysql okay so this is one example of how to create connectivity between power bi and mysql now i want to do the same thing using sql server microsoft sql server so i have also installed microsoft sql server on my machine and i have used the sql express so this is the name of my server so which i'll copy the server name and go to get data select sql server and for now database is optional i can say direct query click okay okay now it is showing me what all tables i can import so in my sql server tutorial in my sql server i have i have these three tables customers employee attrition olympic events so i can use probably the customers one which is now you can see this is the data the customers data which is lying in my sql server okay so i can preview it and load it so now you can you can preview the data in uh, power bi that is this is the data so i can rename is customers from ms sql and this is from my sql and okay so now this is not the only uh, data sets you can import now if you take a look at the options which power bi gave of what different type and variations of data it can uh, it has compatibility to import from okay so we can just take a look at the categorization on the left hand side first there are file based like excel text xml json is also possible you can evenly directly import an entire folder and uh, within the folder whatever uh data types of files are there it will detect it pdf parky or even sharepoint folder which is itself a microsoft uh technology then different kind of databases sql server and mysql we just saw but it's not only limited to this you can connect to microsoft access ssas oracle database ibm db2 postgres uh, sybase teradata and then sap uh, Uh, databases amazon redshift impala vertica snowflake and n number of databases which are there in the market today uh, amazon etc then it also allows you to connect with its own power platforms power bi platforms data marts power bi data flows dataverse etc azure there are different kind of uh, storage uh, mechanisms in azure and azure itself is a microsoft technology Uh, so it has a compatibility with a lot of azure uh, based data storages like azure sql database blob storage uh, azure data bricks right azure hd insight spark so if you have those kind of services running on your azure cloud services you can even import them over here now online services like you know you have erps running Uh, or some data which is shared on the internet if you want to import it uh, that is also possible through certain products 
uh, Dynamics 365, Microsoft Exchange Online, Salesforce, Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics, GitHub, uh, LinkedIn Sales, if you want to do some analysis of some social networking, uh, you know, feeds, that also you can import. Then other miscellaneous are also there, web-based, Hive, R script, Python script, if there's something to import, get data from, uh, Google Sheets, like we saw one example in our video right now. So there are multiple options available. Now, once you have imported the data, which is relevant to you, uh, in our subsequent sessions, we will see how to create relationships but just giving you a glimpse that whatever data you are importing, Power BI auto detect certain relationships and it will create for you, but then you can go and manually also change. So this is the composite data model, which is getting created in the backend while you are importing the data. You can easily go and manage these relationships, either keep them as is, you can delete and create new ones manually. So there is no limitation in that. So this is what we have witnessed. We have imported data from different file types, data types, and then, you know, we have tried to, once it is imported into uh, Power BI, then there is no limitation of how you use it. You can create visualizations across different data sets and then create your standard reports. So this is the example of importing data from web importing data from a database, from a PDF, and then once you have data, you can shape and combine data. You can basically do what whatever transformation you want to do. You want to uh, make joins, merge the data. So for example, if we go back to our Power BI, and if I go back to my transform data section, now as I have now different data sets available with me, I have I can do any kind of, uh, you know, operation, transformation on the data, right? Uh, so like I showed you, I uh, upgraded the header row because one of the imported data was not showing the header correctly uh, or this column, like this exact one column is extra, I can remove the column, right? All those transformations, whatever I do in the backend gets captured in the applied steps section right this is the customer data you can create uh, you can merge it you can append it uh, you know up, uh, uh, with other data set right let's for example i want to create a merge data set of my categories and subcategories so i can say merge uh, select those two data sets and say merge queries as new and I can select product categories and product subcategories. Select product category key on both the side and then they do a left auto join. So whatever product categories are there, I'll get the subcategories associated with it and I'll create a new table which will have. Now I have the table which has the category and the subcategory and subcategory in one table itself. So I can rename it now to as category subcategory table. It's a, it's a merge. Basically it's a join between category and subcategory and now I have a common table, right? And I can close and apply. So imagine I have created a new table which is imported, created from one data set is, which is Excel based and another data set which is text based. See this category subcategory table so now I can use it the way I want in my visualization reports so that's what the presentation says right that once you have uh, the imported data you can shape you can combine you can adjust you can do whatever transformation you want to do and create your visualization okay so what topics we are going to cover today we are going to talk about different types of data modeling and the most important part and aspect of data modeling is the cardinality. 
the cardinality which you basically decide after reviewing the nature of data and after you imported it what kind of cardinality you have to basically highlight right and there are different type of cardinalities which you might have heard earlier also if you are from pl sql background uh, like one is to one one is to many etc we will we will talk about that now what are the different types of data modeling now dimensional data modeling is one of the most popular and most uh, you know widely used uh, modeling in dimensional data modeling you have master data uh, like for example customer data date store data product data so these are like you know uh, less frequently changing data sets so there is an organization right and you have set of customers their email id phone numbers etc that will change less frequently as compared to the sales transactions because transactions are happening every day every minute so sales is a more fast changing data set in dimensional modeling which is in the terminology of data uh, is also called as a fact and customer store product which are like more of static data and no, uh, le less changeable data is sometimes called a dimension so this is a typical dimensional data model which is typically used uh, sometimes right and then there is another model which is relational model this is a typical model which we have been using in database design like you know primary key foreign key relationships so for example you have a customer who has purchased a product so probably he might have the customer might have the details of the product which he has purchased and you will make a join between customer and product table and even uh, you can make a join between product or product type or customer or product type so customer table will also have a key to the product type so this is less uh, conducive for reporting but it is more of a transactional uh, relational model but of course this is also feasible but from the power bi perspective when we talk about reporting and visualization this is the most extensively used di dimensional data model and this is what we are going to see in our example now so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you certain data sets first we will prepare and uh, create certain of our uh, data sets and then we will import in our sample power bi file and then slowly slowly we will create the relationships now one important thing which you need to understand that in power bi if you go to power bi there is an option that that power bi auto detect new relationships after data is loaded and import relations from the data source on first load so for example if you are importing the data from a database where you have already defined the primary keys and the foreign key relationships so uh, that is the first option which power bi will auto detect and secondly if suppose you are importing two different kind of data sets one is excel one is csv and if power bi detects a common column key columns it will auto detect a relationship which you can go and later change modify manage in your relationship uh, menu manage relationship menu in power bi which i'm going to show you okay so if i open a power bi and this is where the option lies go to file go to options and setting options data load and these are the two options which are by default check you can uncheck it and auto and manually prepare relationships there is no limitation to that but if you uh, keep it checked then power bi will do its job to detect the relationships okay now coming to the next important factor cardinality now before i start playing around with my data and start showing you certain relationships it's very important to understand these four types of cardinalities one is many to one right so basically many to one means that many orders contain data of one customer so per order one customer is there so from customer to order or product or delivery address it's a one to many relationship and from the other side 
from order to customer perspective it's a many to one relationship okay second other uh, cardinality is one is to one one is to one relationship is only applicable when you are saying it's, it's an extension of the current table so for example in one table you have employee details and you are extending the details of the employee in another table like employee address employee id so that is like one is to one there is no multiple records of a single employee in the address table only one employee id exists right now one is to many as i said is the reverse side of many is to one so in customer table only one customer record exists per customer and one customer can place many orders for multiple products and can also have multiple delivery addresses so that way this is a typical one is to many relationship we will be seeing this example also in our sample data set and last is the many to many relationship now many to many is a very typical example so which i'm going to show you practic practically and in our case we will see that like for example you have placed an order for a particular product uh, you know but there are multiple fulfillments which has happened so suppose you made order for 10 products but at the back end when the company is fulfilling it is first fulfilling the first two products then the rest three so basically you the fulfillment is happening in batches so one order id might have a multiple fulfillments for the same order id so there will be a multi many to many relationship which i'll show you practically so now with this background let's start importing our data now the first important thing which we need to import is the master data so first i'll import all my master dimensions which are uh, which i'm going to you know use in my example so first is the customers table customers data So this is the customer details, the like customer key, prefix, first name, last name, birth date, marital status and gender. Some redundant columns are also present, but we'll remove it. So my customer data is loaded. Now today's session is all about this section of modeling. So we will keep our focus over here. Okay. Now some columns, probably some blank columns are there. I can select them and say delete from model. Yes. Okay. So now this is my customer's data with the relevant columns and the key per customer, customer key. Now there's no relationship in this model right now, right? Because only single table is there and the associate data is only imported. Now let me also import my another important master table is the products. Select the product data, product key, product subcategory, product SKU, product name, model name, product description, color, size. So just see all the relevant information only specific to the product is available. So I'll import it. Okay, now see there's no relationship between product and customers directly because until unless a customer makes an order, places an order for a particular product, there is no join, right? So now between these two tables, the most important now another table which will now make sense is the sales order table, sales table. Now I am assuming that Power BI have auto detected the relationship. Now you can see that because I've already uh, ticked that checkbox. Now let's see what Power BI, what relations Power BI has auto detected. Let's first say, check the relation between customer and sales. I'll double click this uh, join. Now what it has done is it has created a join of many to one between sales and customer. So what does that mean is that one customer has uh, can uh, place many orders, right? And that is that it has detected by the quality 
of the data and the data sampling which Power BI has done. You can also reverse this relationship. Here I can select customers and I can select sales. Now it has become one to many. So that you can also do manually. So that is what I said. Whatever Power BI is detected, it is up to the discretion of Power BI internal uh, configuration and algorithm, but you can go and change it. So this is now you can make this is by default active. So we want to keep it active. One customer, many sales orders. Cross filter direction means that only from customers to sales is the filter applicable, not reverse. I'll come to this with my another example, but first let's change the relationship. So one is to many means from one customer and many sales orders. Similarly, let's see what has happened at the product side of the relationship. Similarly, Power BI many sales orders for one product. You can for simplicity sake, you can say products, sales, product key is the join. Now just focus one more thing. Please uh, also see the, co the column on which the join is, is the grade column, grade out column. Product key is also here and product key is also there and it is what we wanted. So one is too many relationship from product to sales table and active. Now looks fine. This is something which is looking logical. And probably now we can proceed further to create a report. Now let me explain the cross filtering with an example. Now for example, I want to check in a report that what is the count of products which, uh, which a particular customer has ordered. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll select the product count of product name. Now if you see the end for each customer in front of each customer name, the count is coming as 293, 293. It is getting repetitive because, because there is a one way filter direction, the filter between customers and sales and sales and products, right? So this join is single sided. It means that from customer to product, you can't find a relationship because it's a single side cross filter, right? What does this, if I change it to both, it means that it is equal to a join between product and sales and every product detail now is appended to the sales table. So if I want to make you visualize this, you need to go here. I'll first open my sales table. We can also open it here. Let's make click it is okay. Now if I click okay, you can see the single arrow is changed to double arrow. It means it's a, it's a both side filter. So when you say a both side filter, it means that implicitly within Power BI, you can imagine that all the product columns now will get appended because of both ways filter you have applied and if you go to your report now see the change of the numbers now 40 20 so the total count of products across all my customers come out to be 293 now the report looks uh, correct if i change the relationship from back to single between product and sales then you can't make a join between customers and product basically you can't derive the product count from the product table. See this. If you have to live with it, then you would have to go to the sales table, get the product key and get the va value of count of product key, but that is not correct. Okay. So if you want a report in which you want the count of product name, and even if you want a count of distinct product name, so this will not come correctly. You would have to go and change the direction of the filter, which is from single to both. So this is a typical example there where you want to use a two directional filter. Now let's proceed further and import other data set in order to give you show you another example. Now I want to show you an example of 
वन इज टू वन सो आई हैव अनदर टेबल विच इज कॉल्ड कस्टमर डिटेल्स सो द की इन दिस टेबल इज अगेन कस्टमर की बट ओनली ई मेल एड्रेस एनुअल इनकम टोटल चिल्ड्रन एजुकेशन लेवल एटसेट्रा अदर डिटेल्स ऑफ द कस्टमर इज देयर so i'm loading the customer details now you see it has auto detected a one is to one relationship but what is the meaning of one is to one means one customer key only has one entry in customer details there is no multiple entry so if you click this button it's a one is to one and the cross filter can be both or single doesn't matter because one customer will have only one value you can make this is active okay and if you go to the customer report table you can now easily associate a email address with the first name you will get one is to one record so now you can see that with one is to one relationship with the first name i have associated the email id and for each email id there is a associated first name with that so this is an example of one is to one relationship so in this example what we have explained is that for each customer there is an associated customer detail right uh, so you have the first name email address education level home owner occupation and total children count so in this report what we have done is uh if you click over here so the first name and the email address okay so there is a one is to one relationship and then and if you drag the customer key uh report takes time to render and even if you can so this is the reporting output you have the customer key first name associated email address and the count of product names uh, which the customer has ordered now this is an example of one is to one now i want to show you an example of many to many now for that i'll import my fulfillment data set okay now in my fulfillment data set there is a column for order number so basically what i'll do is i'll drag order number from here to here okay so now what has a uh, uh, power bi detected i'll do one thing i'll select sales over here fulfillment over here and order number to order number okay so it's a many to many relationship so it means that per order i have created multiple batches to fulfill that particular order now many to many relationship is a definitely a candidate for both ways cross filter detection uh a direction but you can you can check that but definitely uh power bi shows a warning that this relationship has cardinality to many to many and this should only be used if it is expected that neither column contains unique values okay so we know that fact that's why we are accepting this relationship as many to many because we know there are multiple order numbers over here in the sales table which are mapped to the multiple order numbers in the fulfillment table we'll click okay now you want to keep uh, the uh dick direction as both ways or one direction that is up to you the way you want to uh, map the report so i can double click over here and you can even click so now you can select from which way single filter you want from fulfillment to sales or sales to fulfillment 
I'll prefer sales to fulfillment and click OK. Okay, now we have our all our different kind of relationships over here, uh, which we have tried to shortlist one to many, many to one, one to one, which is uh, this example and uh, many to many. Now, if I show you further relationships, which you can keep on adding, like for example, I have uh, uh, the example of territories. Now, in which particular territory the sales was done, so I can map it over here. Okay, so now it's a typical one is to many relationship because territory is my master table uh, where I have a static list of continent, country, region, and it is mapped to the uh, territories which are for in which my orders have been placed. So it's a typical one is too many. So that way, you know, you can keep on adding data. Then you have uh, details of returns. Now this is another transactional table, which is about the orders which have been returned rather than being, you know, returned by the customers. So you have a product key and so automatically Power BI has detected a relationship between the product key and the product uh, table, right? And even if you can join the territory key in which territory the return has happened, right? So mostly the most common relationship which you will observe is the one is to many because as I told earlier, the most common relational model is the dimensional model, uh, the static data, the slow changing dimensions, the SCDs are the master tables and the most frequent changing are the fact tables. So if I talk about a typical dimensional model, the fulfillment table, sales table and the territory table, uh, sorry, uh, the fulfillment table, sales table and my returns table are the fact tables of my data model. Now, so far what we have done as per our last session is that we did data modeling on the different data sets which we had imported in Power BI like products, sales data, returns, fulfillment, customer details uh, and customer master data, calendar details, etc. So in the last session, we prepared a data model and established the relationships between these different data sets like one is to one, one is to many, many to one, one is to one, etc. And we saw the examples. Now, once our relational model is uh, prepared, our data model is prepared. Now, our next activity is to create certain additional columns, which we want to derive basis the data which we have imported. So for example, I'll start with my product data set. Now in my product data set, I want to introduce a column which basically categorizes that if any product which has a color, uh, you know, red, black or gray, I am going to tag it as a colored product rest. I'm going to say not a colored product, right? So all these are like example of byte type product SKUs. So for that, now in order to introduce a new column, you just need to do what? You need to select the table in the data grid, go to the table tools and say new column. Okay, so column will get appended to the rightmost part and you will start seeing a, a formula section typical to like you get in your Excel. Now I'm going to say that the name of my column is going to be bike type color. Okay. And I'm just creating a if condition, if product color is equal to black. Okay. Or or if it is equal to red, 
or if it is equal to gray then say yes it's a colored product else say no okay so now you can see basis the product color red and black they are saying bike type color yes blue is no multi is no etc etc so this is a classic example of an if and else condition based conditional column okay so you can create such columns now second column custom column which i want to create is i'm going to call as discount now basis the pricing of my products i want to associate certain discounts which i am ready to give to my customers basis the product category like what is the pricing of the category again i'm going to use make use of if else but in a nested way so if i am saying if my product price is less than 100 then i will give 0% of uh zero percentage of uh, discount so zero into product price just to keep it consistent now i'm saying else if less than 100 then zero else i'll check again that if the price is less than 500 then i'm ready ready to give one percent discount on the product price else I'll move further so like this I have created a formula so what I'm saying is if product price is less than 100 give 0% if it is less than 500 then give 1% less than 2000 then 1.5% less than 3000 then 2% and otherwise else less less than 3000 if it two percent else three percent right now after this column is created now you can check right so this see the product price for this particular product it is less than 100 so that's why there is no discount it is uh, between 100 to 200 then this has been given a one percent discount so like this all the discount column is now calculated now this column is available just like a regular column in my product table now after this i'll go to my sales table now in sales table i want to identify uh, uh, create a column called as cost there is no product cost column over here so that will be derived so let's create a column called as cost and it is derived by order quantity into now the cost of the product is in the product table and i know i have already created a relationship between product and sales table so i just need to select the product cost column now only keyword which i have to use in power bi is the related keyword so this will pick up the relation and now for this particular sale order the cost has already been derived so this order number this is the cost for which uh, the product has is the costing of the product for this particular order okay now i'm going to create another conditional column over here called as order status i 
I'm saying if any order whose order quantity is greater than two, then for my organization, it's an urgent order. Else it is a normal order. Oh, sorry. So this is my order status column and I have my order quantity urgent or normal. So any order which has order quantity one is normal. Any order which is having order quantity as greater than two is urgent. You can see this. So there's a this whole Power BI uh, tabs and sheets allow you to also review the data, what you're doing. So it's very convenient. Now, I have my sales data. Now, my, what I want to bring within the sales is my discount column. So here also I want to bring the discount which I have created. So I'll say discount. Discount will be order quantity into related product discount, right? So the discount calculated column which I had created under products, I'll bring over here. Now I am creating the order level discount. So if you see for this particular order, there's a 25, uh, uh, you know, for 25 rupee discount at the cost is 100,000 rupees. Okay. And what is the order price now? So I have taken the order cost, the discount. Now I have to create a column called as price, order price. So that will be again order quantity into related price, which is per product price, enter. Okay, so now I have the cost, the discount and the price, right, available with me. Now I want to calculate the total, uh, total revenue, total profit and loss, right? Per order, how much? So first I'll calculate per order how much revenue I'm generating. So now I have to generate a column called as revenue. Revenue is price. minus discount so 1700 minus 25 1700 minus 25 2071 minus 42 and if I want to calculate the profit per order then it is revenue minus cost. Okay, so now you can see, you know, typical custom columns, calculated columns, which we have created 
are all playing around with the number numeric values numeric data primarily and trying to give inferences into per order cost discount per order price revenue and profit so typical calculation columns which i have prepared in front of you now let's take a look at other different variations of custom columns uh, i'll create certain columns for text based custom columns calculated columns uh, using text based data so i am now moving towards my customer table in which i have customer key prefix first name last name birth date marital status and gender now i want to create a new column in which i want to derive the age of each customer as of today right so i'll use another function a date function called as date diff now date diff so i want the difference between the birth date of the customer and as of today in years okay so this customer as of today 68 year old one is 74 68 57 etc so this is one derivation of a calculated column of age let's take another example now this is a text based column where i want to derive the full name of the customer now here i'll say first lower case in lower case i'll concatenate the prefix then ampersand space ampersand first name ampersand space ampersand last name and closing brackets etc full name okay so this is an example of full name in low cases now another calculated column conditional column at the customer level i want to identify a flag which says who is my target customer basis the demographics shared over here target customer so i'll say if the marital status is equal to m and total children sorry and total children annual income so okay so let me change the logic a bit so marital status is m and age is less than 50 these customers are my target customers okay so i would say yes else no see this his marital status is married logan dias and age is less than 50 else everyone so if i try to filter so these are the my target customers 69 out of 1178 so this is just a conditional column but a logical condition an example which i am trying to 
हाईलाइट हो गए हैं ओके नाउ लेट्स लुक एट सर्टन कैलेंडर डेट ओरिएंटेड कॉलम्स कैलकुलेटेड कॉलम्स वेरी टिपिकल लाइक नाउ आई हैव अ सिंपल डेट कॉलम नाउ आई कीप एडिंग सर्टन कॉलम्स विच यू नो विच हेल्प यू विच विल हेल्प यू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ यू कैन नो डू सम कैलकुलेशन ऑन द डेट्स so like for example i want a date which is 12 days after the current date the date in the column so just simple 12 days after select the date and add 12 now if you see the date format you can go and change the format at the top and if whatever you feel like like this now see 12 days after 1st jan 2015 is 13 jan 2005 you can go and change the format and other details let me also show you if i go to my cost and other columns i can go and change the format this is like a currency cost is currency so i can go and uh, select the change the currency type and you can even show the dollar value or whatever currency type it is so for numbers you can do currency or text or dates you can select the format so this is available at the column tools level now in customers like we had our column of full name so now what all things are available format as text okay data type text so very minimal options are there with date you have options of the date format now next i want a column which defines the expiry date okay so 8 months prior to the expiry date with this which is uh, coming up in 8 months so i'll create a column called as 8 months expiry and then there is a e date function i'll use that i'll use my date in the data set comma i'll up say 8 so now this date column will append 8 months to my actual date and again i can go and change the format correct now another important column like i want to know the date name so i'll use a function called as format and i'll select my calendar date column and i'll say give me the dddd format of it so it will give me the day name the day the day name of on that particular date next years in between so i want the years in between the today's date and the date of my calendar so equal to date diff the calendar date comma today comma year end 7 years 2015 to 2022 then last date of the month so if i want the, what is the last date of this particular calendar month i will use a function eo month which is there available in the power bi so i will say last date of the month equal to eo month then just select the calendar csv date comma 0 in months 
and enter change the format then similarly start of the month So I'll use a function called start of month. So for, for all January dates, end of the month is 31st Jan and start of the month will remain 1st of Jan. Change the format. Next, I want to know what is the week number of that particular date. So now there is an inbuilt function called week number, week num, and just pass the date and you will get the week number, first week of the year, second week of the year, etc. Now another very good example is whether the week day is a weekday or a weekend, right? So what is it? It's a week type. Okay. So I'll change, I'll put a if condition and there is a function called weekday and I'll pass the calendar. If it is less than six, it means it's a weekday, else it's a weekend. So all Saturday and Sunday day names will come as weekends, and else everything else will come as weekday. So these are very different variations of different column types calculated columns which is a very important utility and uh, and uh, any proper bi project you will definitely be ending up creating n number of calculated columns to derive your numbers to prepare your reports but it's important to understand what all things we can do that yes there are n number of functions available in power bi uh, but uh, what i have tried to showcase over here is some important functions but basis your utility, basis your problem statement, you can uh, look up for a relevant function in the Power BI dictionary. Now with this introduction to calculated column, this is the base for us to now get into our next session. We will be, talk we will be talking about creating DAX measures and DAX functions. We will be using Power BI DAX functions, which is much more powerful than simple uh, calculated columns where you can do more uh, complex calculations uh, and, uh, you can calculate totals and then use them in the reports now as we have imported uh, the sheet we will make certain joins so the first step is to drag the orders table the order sheet on the relationship canvas here okay and you can see the data, sample data, the first 100 rows over here. Okay. Then now we need to create an inner join with people's table between order and people. Okay. So if you see, it has automatically detected the field names on which the inner join has to be created. So on the order side, you have region and on the right hand side which is the people data you have also a region okay so both these columns are common and that's how 
we have made a join between orders and people data. So if I close this box and go and check the people's data, open, So see the region and the person, these two columns from the people table have now been joined with the orders table, right? So it means that these are the orders in a particular region, which has been placed by in this region. Let me show you the sample superstore Excel file. Now, this is the structure of the file. You have a sample list of transactions, basically the orders which are placed by customers across multiple regions, South, West of USA, South region, West region. Then you have a list of order IDs which have been returned. So basically, the order ID in the returns sheet matches with those orders in the orders table. And then you have the people uh, sheet in which you have region and a person associated with that region, the salesperson associated with that region. Okay. So basically when we are combining, joining orders with people, we are joining that which orders belongs to which region and who's the salesperson associated with it. So what we have done over here is we have made a inner join means all the orders should belong to particular region and that region is in the people's sheet. And then in the second step, now we will make a left join between returns and orders, not inner join. We'll make a left join between returns and orders and we will make a join using the order ID. Okay, so just edit this, click on left and select order ID as the join column. Now, what does left join means? Left join means is that consider all the orders from the orders table and only consider the orders from the returns table which have data means which are returned otherwise show null for the order IDs which are not returned. So if you see this is the these are the two columns from the returns table and these are null because this is relevant to the order IDs which are not returned okay which has been accepted by the customer. But these are the orders for which you see data in the returned and order ID column. It means that these have been returned. Now with these joins in place, please save your book. And now we have our relations created in the, uh, in the tableau. Now we are ready to create certain reports and extract certain KPIs using this relationship model. Now we'll move to sheet one. Okay. And first we will place state and person on the rows sheet. Okay. Then I'll go to my numbers and put the profit or the so per state per person how much profit I am making as a company okay this is my goal to check now sort by highest to lowest so California is giving me the maximum profit of 76,681 then New York then Washington so this is the sorted order 
in which I have listed my profit in descending order. Now I can also check what are the number of orders placed and check the distinct count. So out of 120, out of the total orders of 127, okay, so this is the number of total number of orders which have been returned for California is 127. It's 16, 29. So the sorted order is as per the revenue, as per the profit. And this is the details of the orders which have been returned per state. So if you see for Connecticut, for a Kansas, there are zero returns. So you can also extract data Table to refresh is orders and identify new rows using order date. So as and when new data is being added, you can refresh it. Now say extract and now you can save this information profit by state and click save. So this is the extraction of this particular report which is possible in Tableau. So this is the first exercise which we have completed for reviewing and analyzing the profit per state highest to lowest and within that per state what are the number of orders which have been returned by all the customers, the distinct count of order IDs which have been returned. Now let's start our second exercise on creating calculated fields in Tableau. Now in this exercise, we will be doing certain activities like we will be creating a set to show the states which have more than 100 customers then we will be creating a calculated field to show an average sales per customer okay then we will create a calculated field to show the sales goals and then show emerging and developing stage so these are the four kpis which we have to derive now the first thing we have our sample superstore data already imported and the relationships created inner join with people and left join with returns now we have our sheet 2 in which we will create the uh, states a list of states which has more than 100 customers so what we have to do is we have to click right click on the customer name and click create set okay now we have to give the name as states with 100 plus customers and then go to the condition tab select by field and then apply condition as count of customer name greater than equal to 100 and click okay now we have this set created states with 100 plus customers now to determine average sales by customer we have to now create a calculated field so go to the analysis and click on create calculate field okay now name it as average 
sales per customer and now we will say average we will use a okay so we are saying that per customer we are using a level of definition function include which means that per customer what is my average sales right we have already used a function aggregated function called average so we are saying per customer give me the total and then give me the average per customer so we're going to click ok now create another calculated field you can also create from here and name is as name it as sales goal now in this we are going to type the formula if minimum states with 100 plus customers equal to true then sum of sales into 1.3 else average sales per customer into 100 so we, we are saying that if the customer belongs to the set of states with 100 plus customers then the sales target should be 1.3 times the actual sales as of today else it should be 100% of the average sales per customer now let's create another calculated field which we call as emerging or developing state if distinct count of customer name is greater than or equal to 100 then the state is tagged as developing state else it is called as emerging state okay so we have now three calculated fields average sales per customer emerging or developing state and sales goals now we will use this in our reporting so we will drag sales goal under the columns and then i'll drop my state so now this is the state wise sales goal depending whether the state has 100 plus customers or not then add your customer name make the measure as count distinct and make it as discrete okay so if you see this we have the count of customers per state and the the sales goal for that particular state and now i'll put my sum of sales the total sales which i want per which is there per state Now go to show me and select this particular chart bullet graph
Now to bring sales goals to column, right click on the sales axis and select swap reference line fields. Now from the your left hand panel, drag and drop emerging or developing state on the color panel. Okay, so emerging state is the orange one and the developing state is the blue one. And save the sheet as developing and the emerging states. So if you see this, it's an emerging state because its count is less than the customer count is less than 100. Its sales goal is 57384 but the actual sales is 19511 okay so now this is a developing state its count is greater than equal to 100 and its sales goal and its sales is exactly the same it matches so that's why you are seeing the bar and the blue bar is ending exactly where the a vertical bar is so what we are trying to depict is that whether the uh, state is going beyond its target sales goal or it's behind it and you can see that using this particular vertical bar like for example Michigan its sales goal is 71,952 but its actual sales is 76270 average sales so that's why it is be above its target and it's a developing state because it has more than 100 customers so you can even sort by the count of the uh, customers higher to lower so all your developing state will group from at the top and the emerging states will group at the bottom or you can sort by the sales goal so the orange bar is the sales goal or the blue bar so depending what sales goal is being derived for each state so currently on my screen, what you can see is the Tableau, the Netflix data sheets, the data sources, where you have the Netflix shows, movies, their associated duration, uh, what kind of uh, shows or movies are there, their release year, uh, the associated rating, description, and a key, which is the show ID. Now this is the unique identifier for each show uh, in this Netflix title sheet and with this show ID all other sheets are related like you know who are the directors of the show in which country the show was released what is the cast of each show all that information is in this sheet and to which particular category basically the listed in category is being uh, listed in this particular sheet. So what we are going to do is first, we are going to import this sheet into Tableau. Okay. And then create relationship between them using the Tableau relationship canvas. So first our, the primary transaction table, the sheet in which all the information related to movies is there or shows is there is in Netflix titles and then we will drag sheet like Netflix cast titles cast now Dablu has automatically identified the relationship between uh, the show ID of titles and show ID, ID of titles cast and it has made a join so if you double click this you can see this relationship cardinality and the related fields Similarly, I'll drag related titles category, countries, and directors. Now, by virtue of this, all the sheets have now been joined with Netflix titles. And with this relationship ready, we can start preparing our reports. 
Now let's create a basic report where we can just glance the data like you know whatever we were seeing in the Excel how it looks in Tableau. So you have all the types of movies then for example I drag the release here. Now first I do not want to uh, consider it as a dimension so I'll just release here you know, per category per type uh, there is a release here and then I'll drop the listed in so now these are the categories so per year the, de the details of the categories right and then you can drag the title and the associated rating so this is just a view of your data we can name it as shows listing report now let's try to create some report for some uh, measures some numbers etc so now let's check in which country how many movies or titles were released you know what is the count so first let's drag the country so as soon as we drag the country uh, field it has identified that it has the geographical names and identified the latitude and longitude details. So Tableau internally does that automatically and it has identified the spots across the globe of the relevant country. Now let's drag the listed in on the color section. Now what it is doing is it is showing in which country what different kind of uh, category wise movies are or shows are being released like in Sri Lanka documentaries have been released in India action and adventure United States action and adventure like this now let's put a count of the titles right so if you see 247 action and adventure movies or shows have been released in United States okay so this is one inference by this particular report you can identify so let's save this report as listed in by country okay now let's create another report we will call it as the per year statistical report in this first I'll put the release years in the column now count of Netflix titles so this is the count of Netflix titles per year so 2017 2016 14 and then count of Netflix titles in the countries this is the second bar chart okay now what I'll do is I'll combine it into one So one report we are moving in the bar creating the bar and one in the line and now I just have to so we will click on the count of Netflix titles by country right click mark it dual axis so now as soon as you click this both the uh, charts have been combined and right click over here and say synchronize axis. okay
okay so now if you can see see right in 2017 you had uh, 2303 netflix releases uh, across all categories and 1159 titles right 1063 titles in 2017 so this is a descending representation of the count of titles release per year across category and across titles So let's call this as per year stats now let's create another report number of shows per title okay So, or, or sorry, per rating. So, we will drag the rating column and we will count of titles and unique count of titles and unique count of show IDs. Okay. One is bar and one is line. okay so this is a report which shows rating wise titles and the show ids So in the tooltip, you can see the distinct count of titles and show ID per rating. Okay, so let's call it shows per rating. Now let's create another sheet, call it as shows by cast. So in this what we are going to do is first drag the cast column on the rows section you have name all of all the cast and then we drag the show id on the column section and put a count d and sort it okay uh, you can remove the null cast and this is your sorted order and on the label section, you can say show mark labels and you will see the count that Anupam Kher has done the maximum, then anu Shah Rukh Khan, Om Puri, Nasruddin Shah. So this is the details on the sorted order that who has done how many shows. Okay. Then next is shows by director, similar to shows by cast. Drag director into rows or differently if you want to prepare into columns and then count of show id okay sort it and you can actually filter out the null director value 
and this is the account put the label so you can see Jan's sweater has the maximum shows okay then create another report shows by category now similarly drag the listed in in the rows and show ID count remove the null category and sort labels show mark labels so international movies are the highest category dramas the next comedy international TV shows this way you have your category now let's create a dashboard in which we want to bring combine all these reports and take a common view so first let's drag listed in by country then shows by director also please let's set the size as automatic then let's drag shows by category and shows by cast now these four reports are on a single dashboard we will link them to each other so go to worksheet actions add action filter select dashboard one only select shows by category here and in target dashboard one except shows by category keep everything else and in the source sheet just select click select click ok ok now whatever category you will select over here that related category data will automatically be shown in other reports like see international movies across the globe across the countries directors of only international movies who has done the maximum Johnny Toe and uh, shows by cast right that who has done the maximum international movies or dramas or comedies see Paresh Ravel has the maximum number of comedies and then if you see the comedy movies uh, you know these are the count of comedy movies released across the countries and the who is the director Another a very interesting report which you can prepare is that for example you want to check in which country maximum duration of uh, your rep uh, maximum duration of movies have been released so First, let's create a convert to measure. Remove this. Okay. So if you see maximum duration of the movies or the entire Netflix content is maximum United States then in India these many minutes next is United Kingdom and you can also change the colors whatever you feel is as per your standards or as per the convention you can change the color combination. So there are multiple ways you can generate reports and uh, hope you have understood how you can leverage such a data to create your reports. Hello and welcome to Data Analytics Interview Questions. My name is Richard Kirshner with the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. 
Get Certified, Get Ahead. Today we're going to jump into some common questions you might see on NumPy arrays and pandas data frames in the Python, along with some Excel, Tableau, and SQL. Let's start with our first question. What is the difference between data mining and data profiling? It's real important to note that data mining is a process of finding relevant information which has not been found before. It is a way in which raw data is turned into valuable information. You can think of this as anything from the cells uh, stats and from their SQL server all the way to web scraping and Census Bureau information. Where the heck do you mine it from? Where do you get all this data and information? Then we look at data profiling it is usually done to assess a data set for its uniqueness, consistency, and logic. It cannot identify incorrect or inaccurate data values. So if somebody has a statistical analysis on one side and they're doing their, you might the wrong data to then program your uh, data setup. So you got to be aware of that when you're talking about data mining, you need to look at the integrity of what you're bringing in, where it's coming from. Data profiling is looking at it and saying, hey, how is this going to work? What's the logic? What's the consistency? Is it related to what I'm working with? Find the term data wrangling and data analytics. Data wrangling is a process of cleaning, structuring, and enriching the raw data into a desired usable format for better decision making. And you can see a nice chart here with our discover it. We structure the data how we want it. We clean it up, get rid of all those null values. We enrich it so we might take and uh, reformat some of the settings instead of having uh, five different terms for height of somebody. You know, in American English or whatever, we clean some of that up and we might do a calculation and bring some of them together and validate. I was just talking about that in the last one. You need to validate your data. Make sure you have a solid data source. And then of course it goes into the analysis. Very important to notice here in data wrangling, 80% of data analytics is usually in this whole part of wrangling the data, getting it to fit correctly. And don't confuse that with data cooking, which is actually when you're going into neural networks, cooking the data so it's all be between zero and one values. What are common problems that data analysts encounter during analysis? Handling duplicate and missing values. Collecting the meaningful right data the right time. Making data secure and dealing with compliance issues. Handling data purging and storage problems. Again, we're talking about data wrangling here. 80% of most jobs are in wrangling that data and getting it in the right format and making sure it's good data to use. Number four, what are the various steps involved in any analytics project? Understand the problem. We may spend 80% doing wrangling, but you better be ready to understand the problem because if you can't, you're going to spend all your time in the wrong direction. This is probably uh, the most important part of the process. Everything after it falls in and then you can come back to it. Two, data collection, data cleaning, number three, four, data exploration analysis, and five, interpret the results. Number five is a close second for being the most important. If you can't interpret what you bring to the table to your clients, you're in trouble. So when this question comes up, you probably want to focus on those two, noting that the rest of it does, 80% of the work is in two, three, and four, while one and five are the most important parts. Which technical tools have you used for analysis and presentation purposes? Being a data analyst, you are expected to have knowledge of the below tools for analysis and presentation purposes. There's a wide variety out there. Uh, SQL Server, MySQL, you have your Excel, your SPSS, which is the IBM platform, Tableau, Python. Uh, you have all these different tools in here. Now, certainly a lot of jobs are going to be narrowed in on just a few of these tools. Like you're not going to have a Microsoft SQL Server and MySQL Server, but you better understand how to do basic SQL polls. And it's also understanding Excel and how the different formats um, for column and how to get those set up. Number six, what are the best practices for data cleaning? This is really important to remember to go through this in detail. These always come up because 80% of uh, most data analysis is in cleaning the data. Make a data cleaning plan by understanding where the common errors take place and keep communications open. Identify and remove duplicates before working with the data. This will lead to an effective data analysis process. 
Focus on the accuracy of the data, maintain the value types of data, provide mandatory constraints, and set cross-field validation. Standardize the data at the point of entry so that it is less chaotic and you will be able to ensure that all the information is standardized, leading to fewer errors on entry. Number seven, how can you handle missing values in a data set? List-wise deletion. In list-wise deletion method, entire record is excluded from analysis if any single value is missing. Sometimes we're talking about records. Remember, this could be a single line in a database. So if you have uh, your SQL comes back and you have 15 different columns, every one of those that has a missing value, you might just drop it just to make it easy because you already have enough data to do the processing. Average imputation. Use the average value of the responses from the other participants to fill in the missing value. This is really useful, uh, and they'll ask you why these are useful, I guarantee it. Uh, if you have a whole group of data that's collected and it doesn't have that information in it, at that point you might average it in there. Regression substitution. You can use multiple regression analysis to estimate a missing value. That kind of goes with the average imputation input. Uh, regression model means you're just going to get, you're going to actually generate a, a prediction as to what you think that value should be for those people based on the ones you do have. Multiple imputation. So we talk about multiple inputs. Uh, it creates plausible values based on the correlations for the missing data and then average the simulated data sets by incorporating random errors in your predictions. What do you understand by the term normal distribution? And the second you hear the word normal distribution should be thinking a bell curve like we see here. Normal distribution is a type of continuous probability distribution that is symmetric about the mean and in the graph normal distribution will appear as a bell curve. The mean, median, and mode are equal. That's a quick way to know if you have normal distribution is you can compute mean, median, and mode. All of them are located at the center of the distribution. 68% of the data lies within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of the data falls within two standard deviations of the mean. 99.7% of the data lies within three standard deviations of the mean. What is time series analysis? Time series analysis is a statistical method that deals with ordered sequence of values of a variable of equally spaced time intervals. Time series data on a COVID-19 cases. And you can see we're looking at by days, so our space is of days, and each day goes by. If we take and graph it, you can see a time series graph always looks really nice. We have like two different, uh, in this case we have what, the United States going over there. I'd have to look at the other setup in there, but they picked a couple different countries. Uh, and it is, yes, it's time sensitive. You know, with the next result is based on what the last one was. COVID is an excellent example of this. Uh, anytime you do any word analytics where you're figuring out what someone's saying, what they said before makes a huge difference as to what they're going to say next. Another form of time series analysis. Ten, how is joining different from blending in Tableau? So now we're going to jump into the Tableau package. Data joining. Data joining can only be done when the data comes from the same source. Combining two tables from the same database or two or more worksheets from the same Excel file. All the combined tables or sheets contains common set of dimensions and measures. Data blending. Data blending is used when the data is from two or more different sources. Combining the Oracle table with the SQL server or two sheets from Excel or combining Excel sheet and Oracle table. In data blending, each data source contains its own set of dimensions and measures. How is overfitting different from underfitting? Always a good one. Uh, overfitting. Probably the biggest uh, danger in data analytics today is overfitting. Model trains from the data too well using the training set. The performance drops significantly over the test set happens when the model learns the noise and random fluctuations in the training data set in detail. And again, the performance drops way below what the test set has. The model neither trains the data well nor can generalize to new data. Performs poorly both on train and the test set. Happens when there is less data to build and an accurate model and also when we try to build a linear model with a nonlinear data. In Microsoft Excel, a numeric value can be treated as a text value if it proceeds with an apostrophe. Definitely not an exclamation. Uh, if you're used to programming in Python, you'll look for that hash code. 
and not an amber sign. And we can see here, uh, if you enter the value 10 into a fill, but you put the apostrophe in front of it, it will read that as a text, not as a number. What is the difference between count, count A, count blank, and count if in Excel? We can see here when we run in just count, D1 through D23, we get 19. And you'll notice that there is 19 numbers coming down here. And so it doesn't count the cost of each, which is a top bracket. It doesn't count the blank spaces either with the straight count. When you do a count A, you'll get the answer is 20. So now when you do count A, it counts all of them, even the title cost of each. When you do count blank, we'll get three. Why? There's three blank fields. And finally, the count if. If we do count if of E1 to E23 is greater than 10, there's 11 values in there. Basic counting of whatever's in your column, pretty solid on the table there. Explain how VLOOKUP works in Excel. VLOOKUP is used when you need to find things in a table or arrange by row. The syntax has four different parts to it. Uh, we have our lookup value. That's a value you want to look up. We have our table array. Uh, the range where the lookup value is located. Column index number, the column number and range that contains the return value. And the range lookup. Specify true if you want an approximate match or false if you want an exact match of the return value. So here we see VLOOKUP F3, A2 to C8, 2, 0 for prints. Now, they don't show the F3. F3 is the actual um, cell that prints is in. That's what we're looking at is F3. So there's your prints. He pulls in from F3. A2 to C8 is the, the data we're looking into. And then number 2 is a column in that data. So in this case, we're looking for uh, uh, age. And we count name is 1, age is 2. Keep in mind this is Excel versus a lot of your um, Python and programming languages where you start at zero. In Excel, we always look at the cells as one, two, three. So two represents the age. Zero is uh, false for having an exact matchup versus one. We don't actually need to worry about that too much in this. Zero or one would work with this example. And you can see with the Angela lookup, again, her name would be in the F column number 4. That's what the F4 stands for, is where they pulled Angela from. And then you have A1 to C8, and then we're looking at uh, number 3. So number 3 is height, name being 1, H2, and then height 3. And you'll see here it pulls in her height, 5.8. So we're going to run, jump over to uh, SQL. How do you subset or filter data in SQL? To subset or filter data in SQL, we use where and having clause. And you can see we have a nice table on the left where we have the title, the director, the year, the duration. We want to filter the table for movies that were directed by Brad Bird. Um, why? Just because we want to know who, what Brad Bird did. So we're going to do select star. You should know that the star refers to all. In this case, we're, what are we going to return? We're going to return all title, directory, year, and duration. That's what we mean by all from movies, movies being our table, where director equals Brad Bird. And you can see um, he comes back and he did the incredible on Ratatouille. To subset or filter data SQL, we can also use the uh, where and having clause. So we're going to take a closer look at the um, different ways we can filter it here. Filter the table for directors whose movies have an average duration greater than 115 minutes. So there's a lot of really cool things into this SQL query, and these SQL queries can get pretty crazy. Select director sum duration as total duration, average duration as average duration, from movies, group by director, having average duration greater than 115. Uh, so again, what are we going to return? We're going to return whatever we put in our select, which in this case is director. We're going to have total duration, and that's going to be the sum of the duration. We're going to have the average duration, average underscore duration, which is going to be the average duration on there. And then we, of course, go ahead and group by director. And we want to make sure we group them by uh, anyone that has an having an average duration greater than 115. These SQL queries are so important. 
I don't know how many times your the SQL comes up, and there's so many different other languages, not just MySQL and not Microsoft SQL, but in addition to that, where the SQL language comes in, uh, especially with Hadoop and other areas. So you really should know your basic SQL. Doesn't hurt to get that little um, cheat sheet and glance over it and double check some of the different features in SQL. What is the difference between where and having clause in SQL? Where. Where clause works on row data. In where clause, the filter occurs before any groupings are made. Aggregate functions cannot be used. Uh, so the syntax is select your columns from table where what the condition is. Having clause works on aggregated data. Having is used to filter values from a group. Aggregate functions can be used. And the syntax is select column names from table where the condition is, grouped by having a condition ordered by column names. What is the correct syntax for reshape function in NumPy? So we're going to jump to the NumPy array program. And what you come up with is you have, uh, in this case, it would be numpy.reshape. A lot of times you do an import numpy as np, reshape, and then your array, and the new shape. And you can see here as, we, uh, as the actual um, example comes in, the reshape is A, and we're going to reshape it in two comma five uh, setups. And you can see the printout in there that prints in two rows with five values in each one. What are the different ways to create a data frame in Pandas? Well, we can do it by initializing a list. So you can port your pandas as PD, very common. Data equals Tom 30, Jerry 20, Angela 35. We'll go ahead and create the data frame. And we'll say uh, PD.dataFrame is the data. Columns equals name and age. So you can designate your columns. You can also designate index in there. You should always remember that the index, uh, in this case, maybe you want the index instead of 1, 2 to be... Um, the date they signed up, or who knows, you know, whatever. And you can see right there, it just generates a nice pandas data frame with Tom, Jerry, and Angela. Another way you can initialize a uh, data frame is from dictionary. You can see here we have a dictionary where the date equals name, Tom, Jerry, Angela, Mary. Age is 2021, 1918. And if we do a DF PD data frame on the data, you'll get a nice, the same kind of setup. You get your name, age, Tom, Jerry, Angela, and Mary. Write the Python code to create an employee's data frame from the emp.csv file and display the head and summary of it. To create a data frame in Python, you need to import the pandas library and use the read csv function to load the csv file. And here you can see we have import pandas as pd, employees, or the data frame employees, equals pd.readcsv, and then you have your path to that CSV file. There's a number of settings in the read CSV where you can tell it how many rows are the top index. Uh, you can set the columns in there. You can have uh, skip rows. There's all kinds of things. You, you can also go in there and double check with your read CSV, but the most basic one is just to read a basic CSV. How will you select the department and age columns from an employee's data frame? So we have import pandas as PD. You can see we have created our data. Uh, we will go ahead and create our employees PD data frame on the left. And then on the right to select department and age from the data frame, uh, we just do employees and you put the brackets around it. Now, if you're just doing one column, you could do just department. But if you're doing multiple columns, you've got to have those in a second set of brackets. So it's got to be a reference with a list within the reference. What is the criteria to say whether a developed data model is good or not? A good model should be intuitive, insightful, and self-explanatory. Follow the old saying, KISS, keep it simple. The model developed should be able to easily consumed by the clients for actionable and profitable results. So if they can't read it, what good is it? A good model should easily adapt to changes according to business requirements. We live in quite a dynamic world nowadays, so that's pretty self-evident. And if the data gets updated, the model should be able to scale accordingly to the new data. So you have a nice data pipeline going where when something, when you get new data coming in, you don't have to go and rewrite the whole code. What is the significance of exploratory data analysis? 
Exploratory data analysis is an important step in any data analysis process. Exploratory data analysis, EDA, helps to understand the data better. It helps you obtain confidence in your data to a point where you're ready to engage a machine learning algorithm. It allows you to refine your selection of feature variables that will be used later for model building. You can discover hidden trends and insights from the data. How do you treat outliers in a data set? An outlier is a data point that is distant from other similar points. They may be due to variability in the measurement or may indicate experimental errors. Uh, one, you can drop the outlier records. Pretty straightforward. You can cap your outliers data so it doesn't go past a certain value. You can assign it a new value. You can also try a new transformation to see if those outliers come in if you transform it slightly differently. Explain descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. Descriptive provides insights into the past to answer what has happened. Uses data aggregation and data mining techniques. Examples, an ice cream company can analyze how much ice cream was sold, which flavors were sold, and whether more or less ice cream was sold than before. Predictive understands the future to the answer. What could happen? Uses statistical models and forecasting techniques. Example, predicts the sale of ice creams during the summer, spring, and rainy days. Uh, so this is always interesting because you have your descriptive, which comes in, and your businesses are always looking to know what happened. Hey, did we have good sales last uh, quarter? What are we expecting next quarter in the sales? And we have a huge jump when we do uh, prescriptive. Suggest various courses of action to answer what should you do. Uses optimization and simulation algorithms to advise possible outcomes. Example, lower prices to increase sell of ice creams produce more or less quantities of certain flavor of ice cream. And we can certainly, uh, today's world with the COVID virus, because we had that in our earlier graph, you could see that as a descriptive. What's happened? How many people have been infected? How many people have died in an area? Predictive. Where do we predict that to go? Um, do we see it going to get worse? Is it going to get better? What do we predict that we're going to need in hospital beds? And prescriptive. What can we change in our uh, setup to have a better outcome? Uh, maybe if we did more social distancing, if we tracked the virus. How do these different things directly affect the end, and can we create a better ending by changing some underlying uh, criteria? What are the different types of sampling techniques used by data analysts? Sampling is a statistical method to select a subset of data from an entire data set population to estimate the characteristics of the whole population. One, we can do a simple random sampling. So we can just pick out 500 random people in the United States to sample them. They call it a population. In regular data, we also call that a population. Just because that's where it came from was mainly from doing census. Systematic sampling, cluster sampling, stratified sampling, and judgment or purposive sampling. Then we have our systematic sampling. That's where you're doing like uh, uh, using 1, 5, 10, 15, 20. You use a very systematic approach for pulling samples uh, from the setup. Cluster sampling. Uh, that's where we look at it and we say, hey, some of these things just naturally group together. If you were talking about population, which is the, really a nice way of looking at this, cluster sampling would be maybe by uh, zip code. We're going to do everybody's zip code and just naturally cluster it that way. Stratified sampling would be more uh, looking for shared things a group has, like income. Uh, so if you're studying something on poverty, you might look at their naturally group people uh, based on income to begin with and then study those individuals in the income to find out what kind of traits they have. And then judgmental. Uh, that is where the uh, researcher very carefully selects each member of their own group. Uh, so it's very much um, based on their personal knowledge. Jumping on to 26, what are the different types of hypothesis testing? Hypothesis testing is a procedure used by statisticians and scientists to accept or reject statistical hypothesis. We start with the hypothesis testing. We have null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. On the null hypothesis, 
It states that there is no relation between the predictor and the outcome variables in the population. It is denoted by H0. Example, there is no association between patients, BMI, and diabetes. Alternative hypothesis, it states there is some relation between the predictor and outcome variables in the population. It is denoted by H1. Example, there could be an association between patients, BMI, and diabetes. And that's the body mass index, if you didn't catch the BMI and you're not medical. Describe univariate, bivariate, and multivariate analysis. A univariate analysis, it is the simplest form of data analysis where the data being analyzed contains only one variable. An example is studying the heights of players in the NBA. Because it's so simple, it can be described using central tendencies, dispersion, quartiles, bar charts, histograms, pie charts, frequency distribution tables. The bivariate analysis, it involves analysis of two variables to find causes, relationships, and correlations between the variables. Example, analyzing sale of ice creams based on the temperature outside. Bivariate analysis can be explained using correlation coefficients, linear regression, logistic regression, scatter plot, and box plots. And multivariate analysis. It involves analysis of three or more variables to understand the relationship of each variable with the other variables. Example, analyzing revenue based on expenditure. So if we have our TV ads, we have our newspaper ads, our social media ads, and our revenue, we can now compare all those together. The multivariate analysis can be performed using multiple regression, factor analysis, classification and regression trees, cluster analysis, principal component analysis, clustering bar chart, dual axis chart. What function would you use to get the current date and time in Excel? In Excel you can use the today and now function to get the current date and time. And you can see down here with the two examples where just equals today or equals now. Using the sum ifs function in Excel, find the total quantity sold by sales representatives whose names start with A and the cost of each item they have sold is greater than 10. And you can see here on the left we have our actual table. And then we want to go ahead and sum ifs. So we want the uh, E2 through E20, B2 through B20 greater than 10. And this basically is just saying, hey, we're going to take everything in the uh, E column and we're going to sum it up, but only those objects where the D column is greater than 10. That's what that means there. Is the below query correct? If not, how will you rectify it? Select customer ID, year, order date, as order year, from order where order year is greater than or equal to 2016. And hopefully you caught it right there. Uh, it's in the devil's in the details. We can't not use the alias name while filtering data using the where clause. So the correct format is all the same except for where it says where the year order date is greater than or equal to 16 versus using the order year which we assign under the select setup. How are union, intersect, and accept used in SQL? The union operator is used to combine the results of two or more select statements. And you can see here we have select star from region 1, and we're going to make a union with select star from region 2, and it basically takes both these SQL tables and combines them to form a full new table on there. So that's your union as we bring everything together. When we look at the intersect operator, it returns the common records that are the result of the two or more select statements. So you can see here we select star from region 1, intersect, select star from region 2, and we come up with only those records that are shared, that have the same data in them. And hopefully you jumped uh, ahead to the accept. The accept operator returns the uncommon records that are the result of two or more select statements. So these are the re two records, or the records that are not shared between the two databases. Using the product price table, write an SQL query to find the record with the fourth highest market price. 
So here we have a little bit of a brain teaser. Uh, they're always fun. And the first thing we want to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to, if you look at the uh, uh, script on the left, we really want the fourth one down. So we're going to select the top four from product price. But we're going to order it by market price descending. SP order by market price ascending. So what we do is we take the top four of the market price ascending. And that's going to give us the four greatest values. And then we're going to reverse that order and do descending. And we're going to take the top one of that, which is going to give us the lowest value, which will be the fourth greatest one in the list. From the product price table, find the total and average market price for each currency where the average market price is greater than 100 and currency is in the INR or the AUD. So um, INR or AUD, India Rupal or uh, Australia Dollar. You can see over here the SQL query. If you had trouble putting this together, uh, you might actually do some of it in reverse. And you can see right here where the average market price is greater than 50. Remember we use having, not where, at the end because it's part of the group. So group by currency because we want those two currencies. And we want the currency India Rupal, the INR or the AUD. And um, as you keep going backwards, we're actually going to be selecting the currency, the sum of the market price as total price, and the average market price as average price. So there's our select. It's going to come from the product price, which is just our table over there. And then we have where our currency is in. Uh, and like I said, you can put it together however you want, but hopefully you got to the end there. So this question will test your knowledge in Tableau, exploring the different features of Tableau, and creating a suitable graph to solve a business problem. And of course, Tableau is very visual in its use, so it's very hard to test it without actually just getting your hands on. And if you can't visualize some of this and how to do it, then you should go back and refresh yourself. Using the sample Superstore dataset, create a view to analyze the sales, profits, and quantity sold across different subcategories of items present under each category. So the first step is to go ahead and load the sample Superstore dataset. So make sure you know how to load the sample, the Superstore dataset. That's underneath either the connect button in the upper left um, or the um, Tableau icon up there and be able to pull in the data set. And then once you've done that, you just drag the category and subcategory on rows and salaries onto columns. It will result in a horizontal bar chart. So in this one, we're just going to drag profit onto color and quantity onto label. Sort the sales axes in descending order of sum and sales within each subcategory. And if you're at home doing this, you'll see that chairs under furniture category had the highest sales and profit, while tables had the lowest profit. For office supplies, subcategory binders made the highest profit, even though storage had the highest sales. Under technology category, copiers made the highest profit, though it was the least amount of sales. Let's work to create a dual axis chart in Tableau to present sales and profits across different years using sample Superstore dataset. Load the orders sheet from the sample Superstore dataset. Drag the order data field from the dimensions onto columns and convert it into continuous month. Drag cells onto rows and profits to the right corner of the view until you see a light green rectangle. One of those things, if you haven't done this hands-on, you don't know what you're doing, you're, you're going to run into a bind because so you're going to be just kind of dropping it and wondering what happened. Synchronize the right axes by right-clicking on the profit axes. And then let's finalize it by going under the marks card, change some cells to bar and some profit to line, and adjust the size. And then we have a nice display that we can either print out or save and send off to the uh, shareholders. Let's go ahead and do one more Tableau. Uh, design a view in Tableau to show state-wise sales and profits using the sample Superstore dataset. And here you go ahead and drag the country field onto the view section and expand it to see the states. Drag the states field onto size and profit onto color. Increase the size of the bubbles, add a border and a halo color. 
States like Washington, California, and New York have the highest sales and profits, while Texas, Pennsylvania, and Ohio have a good amount of sales, but the least amount of profits. We'll go ahead and skip back to Python numpy. Suppose there is an array number equals np, or numpy if you're using numpy, depending on how you set it up, dot array, and we just have 1 to 9 broken up into three groups. Extract the value 8 using 2D indexing. So you can see on the left we have our import numpy as np, number equals our np array. If we print the number, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Since the value 8 is present in the second row and first column, we use the same index position and pass it to the array. And you just have number 2, comma 1, and you get 8. And remember, we're in Python, so you start at 0, not 1 like you do in Excel. It always gets me if I'm working between Excel and Python, where I just kind of flip, and usually it's the Excel that messes up because I do a lot more programming. Suppose there is an array that has values 0, 1, all the way up to 9. How will you display the following values from the array? 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Uh, so first of all, we go ahead and create the array, uh, np dot a range of 10, which goes from 0 to 9, because there's 10 numbers in it, but we don't include the 10. We print it out. The first thing you want to do is, what's going on here with 1, 3, 5, 7, 9? Well, if we divide by 2, there's going to be a remainder equal to 1. And then from Python, remember that if you use the percentage sign, you get the uh, remainder on there. So the remainder is 1. And then you have the your numpy array. And then we just want to do um, a logical statement of all values that have a remainder of 1. And that generates our nice 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. There are two arrays, A and B. Stack the arrays A and B horizontally. Boy, these horizontal vertical questions will get you every time. And in NumPy, we go ahead and we've created uh, two different arrays over here, A and B. Uh, the first one is your concatenate, np.concatenate A and B on axes equal 1. That is the same as H stack. And uh, in the back end, they're still identical. They run the same. That's all each stack is a concatenate and axes equals 1. How can you add a column to a pandas data frame? Suppose there's an imp data frame that has information about few employees. Let's add address column to that data frame. And you can see in the left we have our basic data frame. Uh, you should know your data frames very well. Uh, basically, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet. As you come over here, it's really simple. You just do um, df of address equals the address once you've assigned values to the address. Using the below given data, create a pivot table to find the total cells made by each cells represented for each item. Display the cells as a percentage of the grand total. So we're back in uh, Tableau. Select the entire table range, click on Insert tab, and choose Pivot Table. Select the table range and the worksheet where you want to place the pivot table. It will return a pivot table where you can analyze your data. Uh, drag the cell total on the values and cells rep and item onto row labels. It will give the sum of the cells made by each representative for each item they have sold. And finally, right-click on Sum of Cell Total and expand Show Values as to select Percentage of Grand Total. Uh, real important just to understand what a pivot table is. We're just pivoting it from uh, rows and columns and switching this direction on there. And finally, uh, we have our final pivot table. And you can see the values, rows, and Sum of Total Cell. So we're going to go ahead and take a product table. This is off of an SQL. So we're going to do some SQL here. And we're going to use the product and sales order detail table. Find the products that have total units sold greater than 1.5 million. And here's our sales order detail table. So we have a product table and a sales order detail table, two separate tables in the database. And what we're going to do is put together the SQL query. We want to select PP name, sum, sod, unit price as sales. And then we have our pp.productid from production product as pp interjoin 
sales.sales order detail as sod on pp product id equals sod dot product id group by pp dot name comma pp dot product id having a sum of sod dot unit price greater than uh, the 150 million there that's a mouthful and again these sql queries they start looking really crazy until you just break them apart and do them step by step and what we're looking for is the uh, inner join and how did you do the group by? That's really one of they know. How do you do this inner join? This comes up so much in SQL. Uh, how do you pull in the ID from one chart and the information from another chart and the sum totals on that chart? How do you write a stored procedure in SQL? Let's create a stored procedure to find the sum, the squares of the first n natural numbers. So here we have our formula, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And you can see from the command prompt uh, or the setup you have, depending on what your login is, the command is create procedure square sum 1. Declare our variable at n of integer as begin. And then we're going to declare the sum of integer. Set sum equals n times n plus 1 plus 2 times n plus 1 um, over 6. And then, of course, we can go ahead and print those out. Print first cast um, ampersand n or our variable as a variable character 20 natural numbers print the sum of the square is cast the at sum as a variable character 40 end and then we do the output display the sum of the square for first four natural numbers we have execute square sum one and then we're going to put in four and you can see here where it brings up the first four natural numbers sum of square is 30. Write a store procedure to find the total even number between two user given numbers. A couple of things to note here. First, we go ahead and create our procedure. You have your two different variables, the n1, n2. And we go ahead and begin. We're going to declare our variable count as an integer. We're going to set count equal to zero. And then we have while n is less than n2, we're going to begin. And if n1 Remainder 2 equals 0, so we're going to divide it by 2, even number. Begin, we're going to set the count equal to count plus 1. We're going to print even number plus cast in as a variable character 10 for printing. Count is plus cast variable count as variable character 10 end. Else print odd number plus cast variable number 1 as variable character 10. And then we go ahead and set the um, increment our variable 1 up 1. So it'll go from n1 all the way to n2. And it'll print the total number of even numbers. And you can see here we went ahead and executed it. We're going to count the even numbers between 30 and 45. And you can just see it goes all the way down to 8. What is the difference between tree maps and heat maps in Tableau? Now, if you've worked in Python and other programming, you should automatically know what a heat map is. Uh, but a tree map are used to display data in nested rectangles. You use dimensions to define the structure of the tree map and measure to define the size or color of individual rectangles. Tree maps are a relatively simple data visualization that can provide insight in a visually attractive format. And again, you can see the squares over here. This is our tree map over here with the each block also has its information inside of its different blocks. A heat map helps to visualize measures against the dimensions with the help of colors and size to compare one or more dimensions and up to two measures. The layout is similar to a text table with variations in values encoded as colors. In heat map, you can quickly see a wide array of information. And in this one, uh, you can see they use the colors to denote one thing and the size of the little square to denote something else. A lot of times you can even graph this into a three-dimensional graph with other data uh, so it pops out. But again, a heat map is the color and the size. Using the sample superstore data set, display the top five and bottom five customers based on their profit. So you start by dragging the customer name field onto rows and profit on columns. Right-click on the customer name column to create a set. Give a name to the set and select Top Tab to choose top five customers by some profit. Similarly, create a set for the bottom five customers by some profit. Select both the sets, right-click to create a combined set. 
give a name to the set and choose all members in both sets. And then you can drag top and bottom customer sets onto the filters and profit field onto color to get the desired results. As we get down to the end of our list, we're going to try to keep you uh, on your toes. We're going to skip back to Numpy. How to print four random integers between 1 and 15 using Numpy. To generate random numbers using Numpy, we use the random uh, random integer function. And you can see here we did the import Numpy as np random arrangement equals np dot random dot random integer 1 through 15 of 4. From the below data frame, going to jump again on you, now we're into pandas. How will you find the unique values for each column and subset the data for age less than 35 and height greater than 6? To find the unique values and the number of unique elements, use the unique and the in unique function. You can see here we just did uh, df height, so we're selecting just the height column and we want to look for the unique. That returns an array where in unique if we do that on the height or the age, we'll return just the number of unique values. And then we can do a subset the data for ages less than 35 and height greater than 6. So if we look over here, we have a new DF. Uh, remember, this is going to be taking slices of our original data frame. It doesn't actually change the data frame. So our new DF equals the data frame, or DF, the data frame where age is less than 35, and the height is greater than 6. And in case you're not using uh, Tableau, which has a lot of its own uh, different mapping programs in there, make sure you understand how to use the basics of Matplot Library. Plot a sign graph using NumPy and Matplot Library in Python. And the way we did this is we went ahead and generated an X. We know our Y equals NP dot sign of X. If you print out X, you'll see a whole value here. Our Matplot Library PyPlot as PLT. If you are working in Jupyter Notebook, make sure you understand the matplot library inline, that little percentage sign matplot library inline. That prints it on the page in the Jupyter Notebook. The newer version of Jupyter Notebook or uh, Jupyter Labs automatically does that for you. But I usually put it in there just in case I end up on an older version. If you print Y, you can see here we have our different Y values and our different X values. You simply put in plt.plot xy and do a plot show. And before we go, let's get one more in. We're going to do a pandas. Uh, using the below pandas data frame, find the company with the highest average cells, derive the summary statistics for the cells column, and transpose these statistics. That's a mouthful. And just like any of these computer problems, break it apart. Uh, so first of all, we're looking for the highest average cells. So group the company column and use the mean function to find the average cells. And you can see here by company equals df dot group by company. Once we've done that using the describe function we can now go ahead and look at the summary of statistics on here. Use the describe function to find the summary. Uh, so by company, those are groups, we're just going to describe them. And you could actually bundle those together if you wanted and just do them all in one line. Uh, so here we go by company dot describe you can see we have a nice breakout. Always good to remember uh, whether you're using any of the packages, whether it's Tableau or uh, Pandas in Python or even R or some other package, being able to quick look and describe your data is very important. And then we can go ahead and just do a basic apply a transpose function over the describe method to transpose the statistics. All we've done here is flip the index with the column names, but if you're Following the numbers, a lot of times it's easier to follow across one line, or maybe you want to uh, average out the count, or it's all kinds of different reasons to do that. We have reached the end of this session on Full Course Data Analytics course. Should you need any assistance on PPT, Project Code, or any other resources used in this session, please let us know in the comment section below, and our team of experts will be more than happy to help you as soon as possible. Until next time, thank you and keep learning. Stay tuned for more from Simply Learn. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.